Okay, hello everyone and welcome, welcome. Uh, I can see a lot of people in the chat, so uh, hope everything is well today. Uh, welcome to Hugo's Desk. Today we have a very special stream because we're going to be here for 11 hours. Uh, this is the first, of course. And I hope everyone can hear me. Just let me know on the chat if you can hear me fine, if the sound is good, you know, just as usual, just checking in. But uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring in my my host, my, my co-host, and uh, we'll start there. So I'm going to just like to bring them in just a second. Um, okay. So, um, okay, cool. So... Hi, Ellie. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh, hi. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Happy World VFX Day. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we have a lot of love on the chat right now. Everyone says loud and clear, so that's good. That's a good sign. Uh, thank you so much for all for you to be here. And uh, yeah, I mean, I guess... I guess Haley, this is a this is a first for for us. I've never done an eleven hour show, but uh, this is going to be. We have a lot of really cool stuff to play, and also live shows. Yeah. We have so much stuff, don't we? So we have so much. I'm so excited for you all to see. Yes, eleven hours. Uh, I haven't done this either. <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, we're hoping everything's going to run really smoothly. But if it doesn't, just bear with us. But we've got so much to share. So thank you to Hugo for, for putting all of this together because I couldn't have done it myself. <laughs> so um, thank you all for joining as well. And please do keep the chat busy and we will reply to you if you have any questions. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We're going to try our best to answer questions. But remember, the chat is going a bit fast. So, you know, like... We'll 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 give it a go. So if if your if your question is not answered, just post it again. <laughs> post the question again. It's not a problem at all. Uh, but yeah, cool. So I guess we should just start the show, right? Isn't it, Ailey? Should yeah, we just let's do, do that. For it. Okay, cool. So uh, well, first off, we have the wonderful Ian Files from Before and Afters, and also uh, Jonas is also joining Hello. as well. Hey. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Okay, cool. So you're here. yeah, you're here. That's right. So we're gonna leave you to it, and uh, introduce yourselves as well. And uh, yeah, and I guess I guess that's it. Sorry that I don't have a smoother okay. transition for this, but um, but uh, <laughs> you know, I'm not I'm not a TV show yet. I'm not a TV station yet. <laughs> I will be soon. We'll have, we'll have our own TV <laughs> show soon, Hugo. <laughs> like I'm gonna I'm gonna show people I'm gonna show people my command center. This is where we are right now. This is you're in my spacecraft right now. We're floating through the air like like Star Trek. Um, <laughs> okay, cool. So Ian, I'll let you do your thing. I'll see you later. Thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Haley. Um, have a great eleven hours. <laughs> <laughs> Hi everybody out there! Welcome to World VFX Day. So glad you can join us. Thanks for um, dropping in. If it's the morning time in the UK or the evening in Australia, or if it's like some crazy midnight early morning time in North America or wherever you are in the world, I'm Ian Fails uh, from Before's and Afters Magazine. And today, for about thirty minutes, I'm going to have a really interesting chat. I think with Jonas Ussing from. Space Office VFX in Denmark. Hi, Jonas. How's things? Hi, Ian. Hi. Things are great. How are you? Good. Really great to see you. Um, I I want to introduce you, but really I want to get straight to this crazy video that you've made. I think we just need to jump right in. If anybody hasn't seen this amazing video series that Jonas is already two videos into, it's called no CGI means just uh, just means invisible CGI. If you haven't watched it yet, it's over at a YouTube link that I will dump on the chat in just a minute. But Jonas, getting straight into it, why did you start making this series? Tell us about that. Well, that's a great question. I mean, it's a it's an issue that has been going on for years, and it it just keeps getting worse. I'm not quite sure really what the motivation is. If it's just to spread actual knowledge. Or if it's like pride, like really people think there's no CGI in these films, like we work harder and people don't know and everybody's saying bad CGI. Or if it's something that legitimately hurts the business. If visual effects companies are not acknowledged for their work and to a, to an increasing degree cannot show breakdowns uh, from the work we do, does this affect our business? Does this... Um, put us in, in, a, in a worse position regarding uh, landing new jobs, landing prices for new jobs, if we are undervalued, even though we actually carry so many of these films. Yeah. I, I mean, your video came at a time when 
the strikes were happening still. Um, there was this sort of weird feeling amongst the visual effects industry, which is, remains, you know, it's been a tough year definitely for VFX. Luckily, the strikes seem over and are over. Um, but as part from that, you know, a, a challenging financial time in VFX, what I had observed, and this also came from my time talking to people like Hugo, um, there are other people on the internet, I want to shout out to Todd Vasari straight away as well, who seem to have observed that VFX gets this kind of weird treatment sometimes from filmmakers, actors, and the film marketing teams. Now, it's not across the board, but there's just so many examples as highlighted in your videos where these filmmakers or actors tend to say, oh, we shot it all for real mm. and it's all practical. And then, you know, of course, that's not the truth. And it's just, it's just this, it's been an ongoing thing for a number of years now. And look, probably been like that for decades in some ways. But this year in particular, there's been so many examples of it, right? I'm mm. sure that's what motivated you as, in a big way to make the videos. Yes, absolutely. And um, I think what we're seeing is so consistent now. Like the pattern that T Vaziri also touches on in his, in his new article about Gran Turismo, the pattern is the same, right? They'll say uh, in interviews that there was no CGI and emphasize how they did it practically, completely hiding the uh, visual effects process. And the breakdowns will come out, come out later and it will have no um, effect on the public debate mm. about it. It is so consistent that even actors who know that they know nothing about the post-production will say no CGI. I think it's in their contracts, just like it's in um, several uh, visual effects companies' contracts with the film studios that they cannot show breakdowns. I mean, no visual effects company that I know of has shown any breakdown from Top Gun Maverick that has 2,400 visual effects shots. The only breakdowns that are from, from Top Gun Maverick is from the Oscar showcase, where you have all mm. the Oscar nominees. And I suppose the studio wants to do that because they want to win an Oscar. So they have to do that. But but clearly it must be in some form of contract um, that these studios are not allowed to show their breakdowns. And I also think it's in actors' contracts that they have to emphasize the practical filmmaking. And I don't think any of these actors are given any knowledge about the post-production at all. They don't know. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm not here. I, I, of course, totally agree with you, but I am often talking to Hugo and people like Todd to give a slightly counter argument. And, and it's not so much a counter argument, but it, it's almost, I can see how we got here. There is this sometimes perception that CG shots are bad and ruin the movie. Now, now, it's we could get into that sort of separate thing about why visual effect shots or CG shots can be bad. You know, there's there's time pressures, budget pressures, shot design, all those things. But what I was noticing, and you've already sort of mentioned it, is just the leaning on the actor or filmmaker saying, oh, we shot it all practically, mm. almost as if if you had to do a digital visual effect shot, it's some kind of failure. Yeah. Which, of course, is not the case. You know, these visual effects supervisors and companies are often, as everyone watching knows, involved right from the beginning, right? You know, often <laughs> often the first hire on these films. And mm. so it's not like they're coming in to fix problems. You know, they're just part of the shot design process. And what I'm really getting at is it seems so bizarre to me that sometimes it's all about being real and practical as if if you did it any other way would be a mistake. I, I find yes. that a very bizarre trend. Yeah, it is. It is. Some um, Besides the no CGI uh, articles, sometimes they'll, they'll find out that some CGI was used and then they'll sort of weave it into this, oh, well, it was only a minimum of CGI or the diggers will say, well, we only used it for, you know, rig removal. So we didn't cheat as if, as if it would have been cheating to just create, you know, actual CGI in your shot. Um, I really want to talk about matte paintings in the next uh, video, how, you know, visual effects filmmaking have always been about making the, um, the cheapest film possible and cheat mm. as much as you can. There's nothing new about CGI here. Yes. Uh, tell me a bit about, I think, you know, your first video has reached about 500,000 hits or views yeah. like 
for you personally, I know you were very passionate about the project and we talked before you'd made it. And, you know, as I say, there's a couple of key people, you know, doing doing this as in observing these things that are happening. And Hugo is a big one. Um, and hopefully we on VFX Notes also shout it out too. But tell me personally, when you started seeing the numbers rise for your YouTube video, what was that like? Uh, that was bizarre. I, I did have a feeling that it would go well in the business, in the visual effects business. But the goal was to get it outside the business. But to, to get it outside the business, I would need everybody in the visual effects business to see it first. Because I want people outside the visual effects business to see it. Because nobody in the visual effects business are really being educated by these videos. You can just go, yes, that's right. But everybody knows mm. what's in these videos. I need people outside the visual effects business to see them. But nobody outside the visual effects business would be interested in sharing them first, I think. So first of all, you need everybody in the effects business to see it. And then outside that, it, it took off a lot faster. I mean, well, the effects day says there's, what, 100,000 worldwide in our business? Yep. So, uh, you know, with half a million views, I, I suspect I suspect we're reaching outside that now, <laughs> which is good. Oh, I think so. I think I think there's a there's a there's also a lot of people who are supporters, of course, and they know when someone says there's no CGI in this film, they, they know it's wrong. Mm. Um, but but that's actually an interesting point, because one of the reasons I think you did this and the things that we're often calling out is not just that film studios and filmmakers and actors and the marketing team seem to be saying this, but publications and in influencers and bloggers seem to grasp onto these quotes from a big director or an actor yeah. and turn them into posts, which are very popular posts, you know, to say that there's no CGI in the film. I think your videos were, of course, a reaction to that as well. Yes. Definitely. I mean, and it, it doesn't matter what kind of film it is. Indiana Jones 4 and 5 were both advertised as, you know, movies that would return to practical stunts. And, you know, that wasn't really the case, but the, you know, the articles are still there. Yeah. And yeah, it's become this, um, like a holistic uh, film blogger thing. It, it's like um, uh, to, to be quality aware is to say you don't like CGI. Uh, you know, um, it's become this stamp of approval. If you're a good film mm. blogger, you'll say CGI is bad. I like practical yes. filmmaking. <laughs> um, let's pause for a minute. I um, I want to make sure this session's very interactive, and I think there's already a couple of questions on the chat. So right. I might even go to one here from Justin Pimenta, who I happen to know is in Queensland, Australia, and he's asking: Have any studios asked for the no CGI videos? to be taken off YouTube? No. Nope. Nice controversial question there, Justin. No, no, uh, they have not. And um, one thing that I'm very adamant of is that I only use, uh, I have no whistleblowing. I did not work on any of these films. And mm. even though a lot of people have uh, been sliding into my uh, personal messages uh, saying details about films, I'm not using any of that. I'm only publishing or, or collecting information that is already public, which is uh, why it's fantastic that Top Gun Maverick had the uh, the Oscar breakdown because otherwise I would have nothing to show for Top Gun Maverick. And I think mm. Top Gun Maverick was the reason the first video took off because it's a recent film. It has an absolute ton of CGI and they really promote it and people bought the whole no, no CGI thing about that. So it has like a tabloid effect. I could, I could only do that because I had the visual effects breakdowns from the Oscars. So there's nothing in these videos that is not already publicly available. I'm just collecting it. Yeah. So yeah. Even even if they were I, angry with me, I don't think they could. Yeah. I mean, I look from my perspective. Obviously, I hit up against that problem as well in just covering the industry. Um, Top Gun Maverick came out in whenever it was last year, <laughs> the middle of the year, and no visual effects articles were allowed by the studio. Now. For the reasons that you've just said, but it is also that the studio is pushing the production design, the direction, the fact that, you know, they say they went up and shot in jets, which they totally did for Top Gun Maverick. Mm -hmm. it, it does tend to happen with a bunch of films where I know that the messaging that they want to put out there is that it wasn't, you know, all CG or, or, or 
you know, basically that's what they're aiming for. But it, it, it has that weird effect of like almost lying about how much visual effects work is in there. And that's the thing I think is a bit frustrating. I was very lucky to publish a Top Gun Maverick VFX story in depth with um, Ryan Tudhope, the VFX supervisor, but not until the award season happened. Yeah, I know. And I look, quoted I, you in the video. <laughs> but but I, think, I think that's where I was going, is that what does tend to happen, and people will know this as well already in the industry, is that um, when award season comes up, sometimes that means there's more scope to talk about the work. Mm. Barbie, perhaps at the moment, is an example, but there are other films, and they were just released the um, twenty film VFX Oscar shortlist today. There are other films in there which also haven't had much visual effects coverage, like the latest Mission Impossible, um, and a few others. And I think mm. what we'll start seeing is more of this coverage. But I actually do think, Jonas, it is like your videos and Todd Vasari's article and Hugo's. Um, rants luckily hugo is actually uh demoing and um premiering a video about this later on today it's actually from some of your work works that i think there might be a bit more pressure for the film studios to showcase this work i'm hoping i could be wrong about that obviously that's what you would like to see it would be a great result right yeah absolutely just come up and say we did this we did that um yes we, we used all these film techniques yeah I think that's my mission, actually, when I t think about covering films, is like, why why hide it? Why not just say what you did? And then everyone, like, it, it, it seems bizarre to lie because, you know, we're not stupid and we work in the industry and we know how this stuff is done. That's also my point I was trying to make earlier, which often this hiding of the visual effects or CG work is really kind of meant to be for the mainstream industry you know or mainstream audience sorry mm, mm. um so so the fact that your video is getting half a million hits hopefully as we say it's getting out there absolutely yeah um you just released number two of the video tell everyone what you know that focus was on compared to the first video that that was really um the first one was sort of an introduction just a lot of examples like Here's, here's a lot of people saying no CGI, and here's the actual CGI. The theme for this one is very much the, the fact that it, it has gotten invisible on set. So, mm. many, um, so many other people than visual effects people are obstructed in their work from the visual effects process, from actors um, having to do uh, separate mocap things or react to uh, Jardra, which is not there, etc. Camera people can't film something that's not there. Um, you'll see in a lot of um, visual effects breakdown from set extensions that sometimes the, the horizon is in a completely wrong position. This is a pet peeve of mine because if you follow perspective lines of horizontal um, objects, there's only one place the horizon can be. And sometimes you'll see it placed in a completely different place. And I think that's because you film it on blue screen, the DOP cannot frame the horizon. So they don't think about where the horizon is. And when the visual effects shots come back, they want the horizon framed to create a nice image, mm. but it doesn't fit with the perspective lines anymore. So this is because they're obstructed by the visual effects process. They can't see the final image on the monitor. And the editor, very much the editor, cannot edit um, when the characters that are supposed to be moving are not in the frame, when they just have clean background plates. So visual effects uh, have been, I think, trying very hard for the last 10, 15 years to make life easier for everybody else on set. The James Bond, uh, No Time to Die, Matera car chase is a perfect example of something that look, that it looks like a lot of people could just make the film completely disregarding visual effects. Mm. And there are so many uh, CGI and uh, dig digital visual effects um, in that scene, uh, in every shot, from completely digital ground to cars. and and But the editor can film it completely without visual effects in it. And completely forgetting that there will be visual effects. The editor can put it all together. And when he has a locked edit, it can uh, go to the visual effects departments and all the shots can be taken care of. I think that's an absolute crucial part of the process. So the editor doesn't have blank spaces that will say, or, or blank clean plates, assuming, you know, trying to guess, will three or four seconds be enough for this clip? I don't know. Having to wait for post this to come back. 
so because visual effects have gotten so invisible for everybody else, they'll assume there's less of it being done. Mm, mm. Yes, I think we haven't really mentioned, I mean, I mentioned the whole, the reason why studios seem coy about CG is that you could argue that we'd got to a point with some of these blockbuster films, you know, the Marvel films, DC films, that the sequences were so crazy and over the top that it was kind of obvious that they were using computer graphics and visual effects. By the way, always often really well. Like it's not, I personally think it was amazing work by the artists, but compare that to a No Time to Die, which yeah. has just as many visual effects shots, but as you're saying, obviously it's invisible work. Yes. And I think that's the problem. We treat perhaps those films as the same when we don't want to talk about them. Well, here's the problem. Originally, there was a side of these Marvel films where the visual effects were the selling point, right? So it's sort yep. of twisted and turned a little bit, um, which is interesting. Yeah, absolutely. And you also had Universal uh, promoting a tweet, um, or they tweeted some of the practical effects from the first um, The Thing film. Mm. And Universal Pictures tweeted, CGI could never, dot, dot, dot. Completely disregarding the fact that Universal yeah. themselves remade that film with CGI. But if you look <laughs> at the top 20 uh, Universal box office hits of all time, it's all just um, Jurassic World something and Fast something. And it's just one long CGI list. And to, to for a studio that depends on, on visual effects and CGI to such a huge degree to go out there and, and promote not using CGI or uh, really um, patronizing CGI is weird <laughs> yeah it totally is <clears throat> just to pause again i just want to remind people that we're totally watching the chat and we're absolutely ready to answer any questions you have so if you do have a question for Jonas or me or any of the speakers today please pop it in the chat and um, we'll endeavor to get it answered um i think we welcome anything curly or any comments you have about the industry or Jonas's videos or the things that it um rise uh, has brought up for you as a visual effects artist. That's what today is all about. Um, Jonas, I can't help but ask you about Denmark visual effects, seeing as this is World VFX Day. I mean, yeah. I'm in Australia, you're in Denmark. Tell people who might not know much about the Danish visual effects industry what it's like. Um, I think we have a great uh, industry. I think we have uh, a lot of talented people. And compared to how small Denmark is, I think we have a, a um, great chunk of the um, international visual effects work being done. We have some great schools. We have um, the animation workshop, which started out as a 2D animation school, I think, which is now a full um, uh, digital visual effects school that turns out some really, really, really good students. I've been an examiner there watching uh, really, really <laughs> young people's showreels. And I was like, how in the actual hell did you get so good so fast? Um, and we have some um, we have uh, we have some prominent uh, visual effects companies here that um, depend very much on uh, on American uh, productions. We have Ghost Visual Effects, which started out as a Danish company, has been a Danish company for ten to fifteen years. Mm. Um, getting into the Hollywood market more and more, they started doing actual Star Wars films and Mandalorian shows uh, five years ago or so. They've now been bought by an international, um, they've been turned into a multinational company now. So they have departments um, all over the world and they work on all of these uh, new films, Fast X and Napoleon, I think. To what degree they're being affected by the strikes, I, I can't say, but certainly they depend a lot of an, on American productions. So the strikes um, do affect Denmark a lot. We have another uh, great visual effects company that relied a lot on uh, Netflix shows. They just had to shut down their visual effects department. Um, Nordisk Film, the greatest, uh, the biggest Danish film production studio. And I think the oldest film studio in the world had a visual effects department. Uh, great, great, great visual effects department. And they've been doing some great work and they just shut down. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to put a link to your own company's website in the chat right now um, so that people can go and check out Space Office. Thank um, you. And we'll come back to it just in a second. But someone asked a really interesting question here, yeah. um, Connor Woodward. Uh, what's next for your series, parts three and four? 
Do you want to give a quick uh, preview of what you're going to talk about? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to spoil it. It's going to be about lazy filmmaking. Mm -hmm. oh, that's, that's it? it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Um, and what about you? What's what's up ahead for Space Office in the next couple of months? Well, we're hoping that the uh, the whole industry will um, will open up up a lot more now that the strikes are over. We have also had a lot of downtime in Denmark because the streaming services before the strikes in America, the streaming services stopped producing in Denmark, uh, which means that that a lot of companies that depended on Danish Netflix productions, etc., stopped producing. Um, so we have like a, tri a triple strike uh, hitting us. Um, and I hope things are going to get back up and running soon. Yeah, so do I. Th there's some great questions people have been asking about unions. And I think today we're going to try and talk about unions in different sessions. And we should continue chatting about that on the um, basically this YouTube chat as well. Obviously, Jonas and I are not professional, you know, like we're not union members or or i don't necessarily have a total grasp of the situation but we could probably talk about it for three hours um because in visual effects that's a conversation that happens a lot and i i want that conversation to continue um but let's let's keep doing that during the day as we wrap up here i just want to remind people to go and check out uh both of Jonas's videos uh and the full name of them in case you're not aware is no cgi just means invisible cgi um search for that on youtube um they're amazing videos you're doing incredible work along with some others as i keep saying hugo and todd vasari and many others and um basically Jonas, i want to say thank you for doing this session and for basically making those amazing videos they're incredible <laughs> thank you thank you Ian. Yeah, awesome. Well, I think we'll fly back now to Haley and Hugo. Um, I think we just disappear from the stream. Is that right, Hugo? Yeah, ba basically, yes. <laughs> okay, well, we'll Thank pop off. Much. Thanks, everybody, so much. Thanks, Haley. Bye. And thanks, Hugo. Thanks, Bye. Jonas. Thank you so much, Jonas. Thank you. Much. <laughs> Bye. Okay. And we're on to the next. We've got yes. Alwyn Hunt up next from the Rookies. Yep. We'll uh, be right back.
Hi everyone, it's uh, it's Alwyn Hunt here, and I'm super excited to be part of this really special event. Actually, that that Haley and the team have put together. Um, when I was first approached about doing or supporting this, you know, Haley sort of came up to 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 us when I was in a View Conference. And Hi everyone, it's Ooh, uh, it's Alwyn sorry. Hunt here, and I'm super. That's an amateur. That's very amateur. But um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, was Haley approached us when we were at View Conference, and I, you know, immediately, you know, said, "Hey, you know what? The rookies are on board with supporting this because it's long overdue." So I'm super excited to to be part of it, and I think you've done Haley an amazing job of pulling everyone together, and I can just see this gaining a lot of momentum, and um, hopefully, we get more and more people from and studios and industry pros supporting supporting today because it's 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 really important. And for me today, you know, I'm going to talk a lot about community. And I think it's, it's, you know, the rookies platform, when you look at it is community. There's a lot of other things that happen around uh, the rookies platform, but um, at, at the very core, we are very passionate with our community. And I think, you know, without community, we really are nothing. I want to say a big, big, do a big shout out to a lot of people that are in the chat, Connor. Uh, who's been asking some questions? Saint, who was uh, in in Italy with us over there, and and Simon as well. It's great to see see all you cats back in and supporting this. Connor's been a, a big supporter of the rookies, and he does a weekly update for us on LinkedIn called uh, you know the uh, the rookies weekly update, which is super super uh, informative. And again, he covers a lot of the the issues within the VFX world and. Um, supports students portfolios and and you know covers a lot of information which is great so thanks for being on connor uh and um yeah so for today i just really wanted to do i've got a bit of a slide presentation i know people are probably going to go oh god not a slide slide presentation but um i just wanted to touch on a couple of things before i jump into that you know which was uh um the last speaker johannes was talking about the and uh in we're talking about the the animation festival uh, the animation uh i guess industry in denmark and he, he mentioned animation workshop and and ghost vfx you know these are these are big schools that are doing amazing work we see animation workshop that feature in our global school rankings every year which i'm going to talk a little bit about and we also ghost vfx which are have been a, an amazing studio sponsor of of the rookie awards and and when i say sponsor they offer career opportunities for young people trying to get into visual effects so uh, again supporting that you know that that demographic which is uh, extremely important so let me just share my screen and then we can just uh, have a quick look at this and i'm just going to bring this one up i'll close that down okay cool Wait for that to to share. Um, so, all right, got that full screen, just so we can go straight into that. Too many screens. I'm sure you have that problem too, Hugo. All right. Okay, so looking at, I just wanted to cover a little bit and talk more, you know, like I said, about community. Um, on the Rookies platform, we have, you know, myself and Andrew McDonald, we've been, we're industry veterans. We've been in the industry, well, we were in the industry for a good part of 20 years. So the, when you look at the platform itself, it's really supported by industry. And, you know, we get amazing support from industry professionals and studios and, and everyone else in between. So, um, yeah, 14 years, the, the Rookies platform has been around. So it's been, been around for a long time. And, and actually Saint, who's on the, on the call was one of the first supporters of, of our platform when we first started out 14 years ago back in London. And really the need was to, to help bridge that gap between students coming out of training and, and getting into visual effects and, and actually, you know, what that looked like. Yes, there is, uh, bringing them up to speed, but there's that community that I think, Today I saw the, the you know really sad news about CG Society you know closing down and I was like wow that's another online community that's gone um, and and I, I think you know it, it's it's super important for young people that are trying to get into these industries to have platforms like the Rookies and to be able to find out information 
um, and be able to connect with industry professionals and for, for students that are at the same stage that they're on. So when we look at the, the rookies platform itself, there's kind of, there's, there's, you know, about five pillars to it. So we have the community area and this is only for non-professionals and students getting into visual effects. This is, uh, you know, you're, you're, we've got different user types in there. So you can be a debut and the debut is somebody that's, you know, coming out of high school and wanting to get into visual effects or games, but has absolutely no idea where to go. So this is a, a, a great place for them to start, to start figuring out those schools where they, you know, can actually start learning this, their craft. Uh, it's a great place for them to start connecting with other debuts, other high school students or other uh, people that are just discovering these types of industries. So it's all sort of color coded. So it makes it really easy for you to be able to connect with those people uh, that are at the same level as you. And then we've got the portfolio area and we talk, you know, our portfolio is all about building confidence. You know, a lot of students out there that are so intimidated with getting their work out there, but as you know, as an industry professional and people that are on the call, we know that the sooner that you can start building an online presence and getting your work out there, you know, you're going to get opportunities and, and recruiters are going to be able to retract your work. Even if you're not ready, they love seeing the progression of, um, of your portfolio from one year to the next. So the, 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 the idea of starting a portfolio as soon as possible is, is, is really, really important. Um, and it's a safe place. So you're not competing against industry professionals on there. You're competing with other people that are at the same level of you as you. So that, that in itself gives you a, a benchmark to, to, um, to, you know, to reach, you know, being able to see other students that are at the same level as you. <clears throat> the, yeah, that's the portfolio. And then inside of that, we have these, uh, these sort of badges and these badges are really, they are industry recognized. So anybody that, gets these badges, uh, posts, posts them on their LinkedIn profile and start really thinking about how to, to build out their, their online, um, their online, uh, portfolio, even in that sort of more professional manner on through LinkedIn and places like that. Um, so each year we have the rookie awards that, uh, attracts, you know, over five and a half thousand entrants every year. And, and every single person that enters into that contest gets a digital certificate. And that, again, is the starting point for you to be able to start promoting yourself online and building that confidence, saying, hey, look what I got. I got a B ranking in the, in the Rookie Awards. And it speaks volumes. Um, and just, like I said, industry recognized those, those types of credentials. At Discover Platform, this is where we also invite students to give breakdowns. This is everything is focused on, on that early learner. Um, the, this will be the first time for a lot of people that they're actually creating these types of breakdowns. And, and for a lot of people, they're super excited to be invited onto our platform. And what I love about it is that it's written in such a way that other students relate to it. It's not being written by industry professionals with, you know, really complicated terms or proprietary software or whatever it may be. It's written from students that are facing the same problems that you're facing in the classroom. So there's really a lot of a wealth of uh, information in there to, for people to be able to, to digest. Um, and if we look at the, the next few pillars, we have our contest platform. Um, our Rookie Awards is our marquee event that we host every year. It runs from March right through to July. Uh, and, and you've got that window to be able to upload your portfolio work. And again, it's, it's not always, it's, for me, it's not about the winning. It's not, that's not the process. It's, it's about actually participating. You know, I was on a panel last week, um, with, with, with a group of people and we were talking about networking and, and, and networking is really complicated. You know, I know Simon's on here. He's got Access VFX, an amazing platform for, uh, for, for networking and connecting with mentors. There's there's a lot of there's a lot of nuances to what networking is, uh, and and going to events and and being part of communities is all part of how to network. Um, so you know even when I look at contests, that is a, a platform for networking on. And what I love about contests are that you you know you're you're respecting a timeline, so you're you're working towards that final final submission. So it's actually even. Uh, you know, introducing these sort of industry concepts, even by participating in contests, you know, you're connecting with other entrants and, you know, complimenting them and giving feedback. And um, I was talking to a guy a couple of weeks ago that entered into one to one of our contests, the Riverway Effects Challenge one. 
Uh, he was based in Ethiopia and he, you know, doesn't get any opportunities to, to really work in visual effects in that country. But because he had entered into this contest, contest and done a really amazing entry, he got noticed by people, uh, externally. Um, and now he's actually ended up working for, for Rebel Way, which is the, the school that actually supported the, the, the contest in the first place. So just, there's these amazing stories that happen on this platform, um, whether it's through career opportunities or, uh, or just actually, you know, meeting people that, that you're going to be going through the ranks with as a, as a professional. Um, it's, it's super important to be connecting. Uh, we've got our global school rankings there. This is for us. We're really proud of our global school rankings. Schools cannot be, you know, cannot pay to be on our global school rankings. All that data that we collect from the Rookie Awards. So like I said, we had over five and a half thousand entries this year with every single person getting a judgment from an industry panel made up of 130 professionals. So all that information we take and then we're able to then decipher where the best students are coming out of. And that's how we release our global school rankings every year. There's a, there's a whole algorithm that goes in behind that big weighted scoring system. But for us, it's a kind of a true reflection in any given year of where a school was at. And that's what we want to re reward that school on is the quality of the students work and, you know, their employability. And are, are they, have, are they meeting the skills needed to, to be entering into the, to the, uh, in, into the industry? So we're really proud of that. Uh, we have all our different categories, um, each year. And so again, this is a great resource for people that are trying to find their way in this complex sort of, uh, industry to, to find some clear and decisive information. And then we have our school directory and our school directory. Again, this is rewarding schools that are doing an amazing jobs. So we, uh, we, we have, have this, uh, information page or a sort of a, a micro marketing page for schools to be able to promote their, their courses. If they're featured in the, in the rankings, um, really, you know, celebrating students portfolios that are part of the rookies platform, showcasing their, their work, being proud of that, being proud of a school that has, is doing a great job for their students and, and rewarding the students. So that's a, another a, a great area for 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 people that are looking um, for schools to come into. Uh, recently, we just added a new feature, which I think again is as amazing as is this fine talent. So when you onboard onto the rookies platform and you've you know maybe you're in that final stage of uh, of, of graduating and you've got a portfolio of work and you you're really starting to look for work. This is where you can come and recruiters can come in here and, and actually filter down based on your skill level, based on your geography, based on, um, you know, what, what areas of interest you're focused on. So they can come in and, and make direct contact with you. You know, we're not charging recruiters to be on here. We're not charging students to be on it. We just, we're just trying to join the dots. This is what the rookies platform is, is all about building the community and trying to, you know, create these opportunities for young people that are getting into VFX and 3D anima animation and so forth. Um, and the last one there is, you know, we've got our, a, a discord server, uh, inside here. You know, it's a really vibrant community of people that are, uh, of industry professionals as well as, as our members. Um, we're giving feedback to, to students that are looking for help on their portfolio. Uh, we're, we're, um, you know, running our contest discussions through there and, and a whole bunch of other sort of channels where you're able to, to be, uh, invested in and involved in. Um, yeah. So we, we do live sessions. This morning I did a live session, a feedback session for one of our contests and giving entrance, uh, feedback around that. So, um, again, there's, there's multiple ways that you can connect with our community. Um, but, um, if you're not involved with it, then, and you're, you're looking to get into these types of industry, then I highly recommend jumping on. And I just wanted to talk because it's coming around, my goodness, 14th year next year. And I can't believe that, um, it's, it's, yeah, we're going into it again. So like I said, rookie awards kicks off on March the 14th and, oh, sorry, March the 7th and goes for sort of a three month period. Amazing, you know, we've got some amazing uh, companies that are offering those career opportunities and they can be anything from internships through to portfolio reviews and everything else in between. So um, jump on the site, have a look out for the Rookie Awards 2024 uh, and, and check out all the different categories that we've got in there. So if I, I can actually just break that down a little bit. So yeah, for if you're an individual and wanting to get involved in the Rookie Awards, 
Then we have the Rookie of the Year category. Uh, and then we have Film of the Year and Game of the Year and stuff like that. So, you know, these are the main categories inside uh, Rookie of the Year. And um, this is, again, if you're you kind of, you might be a first year student and go, hey, you know what, I'm not, I'm really not at that level to be competing. Um, that's where I say, actually, you're wrong. You know, like it's even just being involved in as a first year that maybe has one great project. There's that you've got nothing to lose, but you might get your work seen by, you know, our judge, you will get your work seen by our judging panel, but you might also get your work seen by recruiters or, uh, or companies that are, that are looking for, for junior talent. So they, like I said before, they love to see progression of, of students' work. Um, so, We've got uh, a new category there, which is virtual fashion. So that, that's, you know, we, we try and adapt our categories based on sort of new industries that are uh, em embracing 3D. And I guess part of my role as well is is, is being able to uh, identify new industries that are embracing 3D. So I know we talked a little bit in the previous with Ian and, and Giannis about the writer's strike and the implications of, of what that had on the industry. I think, you know, when I talk about it, I always take a step back and go, hey, you know what? You're developing an amazing skill set of, of software and that you can, you know, you'll be able to transcend across multiple industries. So never just think, hey, it's only VFX for me. And, and then if I don't make it, I'm done. Because actually there's a lot of other industries that are looking for your skills as well. And, and sometimes there are better opportunities and better work environments. So, um, definitely take a step back, take a breath when you're in, in your, you know, in your studies and, and thinking that it's all doom and gloom and there's no one hiring because actually there's, you know, there's opportunity everywhere, but you've just got to sometimes take a, a take a breath and take a step back. Um, I just want to check, see how we're going for time. Yeah. Um, am I back on Hugo? I think you did perfectly well. That was 20 minutes on the dot. Um, and we have had lots of questions come through. We probably got time to squeeze one in and then maybe if, if you're still um, hanging around, Alwyn, I know it's very late in Australia now, but um, if you've got time to answer a couple in the chat, perhaps. Um, I'll just end with this one. A um, couple of comments about costs, but um, one that stuck out was, is the rookies just for younger people or do you have any stories about people joining in later in life? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Like we support anybody that's basically on that journey. So you can be a mature age student, um, you know, looking to move move careers. We absolutely support. It's for it's just it's really for anybody that's a non-professional. And the sort of the, the line in the sand is if you've graduated and you've been in, in, in employment for longer than 12 months and you've kind of cracked the industry, then that's when we're sort of like, hey, you know what? You've done well. You know, we you know, we invite you, can, we can possibly invite you back as a judge or being, you know, giving some feedback or whatever it is. But you could be somebody that's been studying a completely different industry and is now getting into 3D or visual effects or whatever it may be. Um, you're, you're totally welcome on our site. You know, you're, you're still new to this. You're still discovering your way through it. So absolutely. I love that. Thank you so much. Great presentation. Thank you for joining us from Australia. Yay! Yay! <laughs> you can go to bed now. <laughs> Only 7.30 p.m. Oh, is it? Oh, oh yeah. let's do another hour. Yeah. Let's talk for another hour. <laughs> Amazing. Well, you've got lots of questions to answer in the live chat. So. <laughs> awesome. I'll jump on. Thanks, guys. Thanks for having Thank me. You so Thank much. you guys for hosting. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Bye.
Hello, everybody. How are you doing? Happy yeah. World VFX Day. Big, big day. Um, I'm Simon, um, founder and director of Access VFX, the global industry movement striving to create a more diverse and inclusive visual effects, animation and games industry. And welcome to our third session. A uh, big shout out to Ian Jonas and Alwyn, who have preceded us. Great job. Um, looking forward to the rest of the talks. Um, but yes, welcome to The Power of Networking, where you'll get to hear from this lovely lot, with these three exceptional people actively involved in our global mentoring program, namely Emma Kolosinska, Access VFX e-mentoring lead and executive VFX producer, Luxa Tierna. We have Alicia Huxtable, Access VFX mentee and line producer at DNEG. And Matthias Backman, Axis VFX mentor and compositing supervisor at Lava Labs in Dusseldorf. So I'm going to do a little bit of an intro to what Axis VFX is, because I don't like to assume that uh, everybody here knows what we do. Um, and then I'm going to hand over to the team to talk about their experiences. And at the end, there'll be a big call to action, how you can all get involved, either as a mentee or as a mentor. So Axis VFX was set up in the first place back in 2017, believe it or not. We've been going around for about six, six and a half, seven years now. And it was originally to celebrate National Inclusion Week in the UK to raise awareness of careers in visual effects and animation with a focus on accessibility and inclusion. And back then, back in the day, those heady days, we were made up of just 11 volunteers from organisations, from our like OG members, as I like to call them. And they were, we should shout them out, The Mill, CineSight, make yourself known on the chat if you uh, if you want to you know, throw up some emojis, MPC Advertising, Frame Store, ILM, Blue Zoo Animation Studio, Jellyfish Pictures, the UK Screen Alliance, Escape Studios, Next Gen Skills Academy, and DNEG. Today, the Access VFX membership is made up of almost 70 global studios, educators, and industry bodies, all working together towards the same shared goal to make visual effects animation and games more diverse and inclusive by taking action rather than just talking about it. Our movement is now truly global with active chapters across the UK, USA, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and as of this year, 11 European countries, including France, Germany, Spain, Netherlands, Sweden, Denmark, Belgium, Italy, the Czech Republic, Bulgaria, and Austria. So this gives us and you uh, access to this global pool of industry mentors. Now, all of our events and initiatives have been geared towards our core ethos of getting stuff done. There's a uh, more a ruder version of that, if you can do, uh, check the internet out, which means that there's no, if there's no tangible action, then we're not interested. This is why the e-mentoring program, we often call the jewel in the crown of our work at Access VFX, because we're in the business of connecting people, diverse voices, bringing new and fresh perspectives to real jobs, real opportunities, and real mentorship via our core values. And there are four, I'm going to share them with you, so prepare yourself. Education, which is working with education providers, schools, colleges, delivering training workshops. Inspiration, which is our events, our speaking engagements, our global outreach work. Recruitment, which is promoting best practice routes into industry such as apprenticeships and internships and other programs and of course why we're here today mentoring our global program hosted by the amazing Prospella team um, we apply these drivers to what we call the access vfx journey which is to inspire encourage and support as we said earlier a more diverse workforce through the following steps now of course we've mentioned inspiration which is our outreach we do see it be it role modeling via our LGBTQI plus network at QVFX, our race equity community at XVFX, our podcast, our website content. And this leads to and cultivates what we call aspiration. So we got inspiration, then aspiration. So nurtured by our amazing mentors. And then we, if we get that right, it leads to application, right? So supporting applications to college, university, the entry level opportunities, apprenticeships, internships, and then the journey doesn't end there. If you get that job, you get that placement, then it's ongoing career prog progression support through mentoring and community based network opportunities. Now, I'm going to hand over to Alicia in a minute, but if you on this call, if you're listening, if you have any touch point at any level with our industry, you have a responsibility here to support each other. Now, at the end of the session, as I've said, 
we're going to offer a call to action where you can join our mission to build a more inclusive industry, create more opportunity and truly change lives by signing up as an Access BFX mentor or mentee. Emma's going to share more detail on the program shortly, but I'm going to take this opportunity to thank our global generous sponsors at Foundry. So big up Foundry, without whom the platform probably wouldn't exist. And recently Netflix Europe, who supported us financially this year to open up our European chapter, as we've said already. So that's about five minutes. I did that. I timed it within an inch of its life. Uh, but without further ado, it's my absolute pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Alicia, to the conversation. So hello, Alicia. Hello. How's it going? It's going well. Thank you for having me. No, thank you for doing this. Now, uh, Alicia's one of our many, many mentees, but Alicia's got a really amazing story, which I hope will inspire you all on this call. But I want to kick things off, Alicia, by asking you, you know, how did you get <laughs> into the industry and, and where you are now? Um, so I got into industry and where I am now by uh, studying at Escape Studios. Um, those who are on the call may potentially know the, the university. I did a bachelor's in 2D compositing, which was a really amazing experience, which was actually where I first came into contact with Access VFX, actually. Okay. Um, I met Escape Studios through a careers fair um, which really, they really intrigued me on in the first jump just by a video of a visual effects breakdown, which I think is some really great content to enjoy in pastime. So watched one of those and was encapsulated just from the jump. And gratefully, I was introduced to Access VFX. Amazing. So yeah, I mean, Escape, as we said earlier, one of our first members, right? And uh, I have, have it on good authority that there's a bit of a culture at Escape Studios where all students are encouraged or almost make it mandatory to get an Access VFX mentor. Is that true or is that urban legend? I believe it's true as of now, but when I was there, that wasn't necessarily the case. Okay. Actually, um, you came in, Simon, to do one of the talks. No um, way. Yeah, I've never told you this either. So I mean... <laughs> that really, yeah, that really um, intrigued me. I ended up signing up for a mentorship to look for a mentor, but honestly, I found so much more. Um, with Access VFX, I found a wealth of knowledge with just through the amalgamation of people and the experiences that they've had. Mm -hmm. um, I also found so many key gems. Although I didn't specifically find my mentor in Access VFX, I was introduced to so many different people. I used the Q&A platform, so I asked a question. I cannot recall what question it was to this day, but I remember it was something that I was curious about. I believe it was something to do with trying to merge the lines between production because I studied compositing okay. so I asked a question regarding that I was led to one person and then was introduced to another person and then I was introduced to the woman in VFX discord where I did find my mentor um, and yeah we have active discussions about access VFX and how personally if access VFX wasn't introduced to my life my career tra trajectory and where I would be today would honestly be so different I'm very grateful for the knowledge that it's given me amazing amazing so yeah that's a really interesting uh, narrative actually because you, it's that kind of it's almost networking yeah when you have that initial interaction then that leads to another which leads to another and I was fascinated by your story how you did sign up to the access VFX mentoring program which led to you discovering the the Women in VFX Discord channel. Could you tell yeah. us more about that and how that worked for you to, and led to you getting your role at DNEG? Oh yeah, 100%. So both Access VFX and the Women in Discord um, operate in very similar ways. Um, the Discord channel, um, it provided me uh, substantial groups of communities. So it depends on the subject that you really wanna focus on. It can be the specific discipline within the visual effects industry such as um, layout artists or production workers or anything of the sorts. Or it can be something as small as such as well-being issues, such as maternity at work or mm -hmm. childcare at work as well within the visual effects industries. They have been doing some work towards that lately, which has been quite phenomenal, especially considering the, the dynamic that women do have within the industry. Um, and yeah, Shayna, my mentor who I met yes. through the women. Say, shout her out. Yes, definitely so. Um, she's been a really great help. I found mentorship has helped me grow not only within my career, but as a person. It's Mentorship is not just guidance towards how to get a job, but it's also guidance on how to keep growing within your job and not 
allow one job to restrict you into one certain thing. And also to help confront imposter syndrome, which I believe a lot of us come to play in this type of role. Yeah, definitely suffer from All of us have. <laughs> yeah, 100%. <laughs> So I've got one more question before I hand over to Emma, Alicia, and I'm sure we'll come back to you as well as we uh, depend on how much time we have uh, this morning. But um, how do you still use your mentoring relationship? So you talked about, I mentioned it earlier, you know, you get to that role yes. and then it's further supported by mentorship. You know, it doesn't end just because you get the job. So how do you use yeah. your mentor now, now that you're firmly established in your role as line producer? So for me, I use my mentorship in order to help me grow. My mentor is someone that, someone that has achieved certain things that I admire and I feel see a likeness towards my own specific career trajectory and life so knowing that I have the guidance of someone that's achieved things similar worth that I would like to achieve really helps me out so for example if I have like a new goal I'm a very um goal orientated person I have my monthly checklist my yearly new year's resolutions and if I have a goal where I'm struggling to create a path in order to get there. Shayna is definitely one of the main people I come into contact with. And I think that's what's really important about mentorship, even speaking to certain people as well. That's the type of guidance that you need um, that helps you really just progress in your career. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, thank you, Alicia. Honestly, it's such an incredible story. I'm gonna pass over seamlessly from one producer, production titan, to another production titan, uh, titan our amazing e-mentoring lead for Access VFX, Emma. So Emma, do you wanna take it from here? Yeah, hello everyone. Happy uh, World View Effects Day. I think it's absolutely incredible um, after the year that we've everybody's been having in the industry that we're uh, shining a light on the t exceptional talent across the entire world, which is, you know, m mentoring is perfect for that. So I've been lucky to be involved with Access VFX for the last five years. Uh, and we, our ment mentoring platform currently has over two and a half thousand members from all over the world. They're ranging from ages 12 up to 45 years old. Now, um, we all interact over a platform, um, a Slack type flat platform online, um, which is powered by an incredible company called Prospella, who do lots of work with us. They look after the legal requirements of each different country that we're working with so that you are able to converse safely online on an internet platform without meeting a mentee in person. Um, and they also set up um, certain rules and restrictions. So they're a really huge shout out to Dexter and his team at Prospella. Thank you for all your help. Really appreciate it. Um, all the mentors who are working with us through Access VFX are professionals. So they're either in a freelance capacity or they are working in one of the many big companies around the world. So if a mentee was to sign up, they could be working with someone who's working on Star Wars. They could be working with someone who's working on more invisible VFX that you don't see every day, but they're working with a talented professional. Um, our mentors are able to share resources on our Slack platform. So you're not actually plugged into one individual. If a mentor doesn't know, they're able to ask everybody else on on the platform which is really beautiful and we all share information with each other if we see job specs if we see handy tutorials we all share them with each other which is then passed on to our mentees which is really really lovely um, it only takes about 10 minutes to sign up to become a mentor through Access VFX. Um, we'll pop a QR code up at the end, or you can have a look on our website, which is accessvfx.org. Um, you On there, you'll pop in your personal email, um, personal in case you're freelance and you're moving around a lot. Um, and then there's a little questionnaire. And at the end, you either choose to be a mentor or if you haven't got time, uh, or you don't feel like you've got the time to be a full mentor, um, we've also got a really brilliant Q&A feature on our platform. On that, you just, um, a mentee anywhere in the world would pose a question and they get re responses from professionals all over the world. And that could be on career advice, that could be on um, 2D advice, 3D advice, gaming. So that's also a really handy tool. Um, so yeah, you'd sign up, fire our website and then choose Q&A or mentorship at the end of that. Um, 
I currently have 12 mentees around the world, um, all in different stages of their career, some still in college, some very much working, most now working, which is really, really lovely. And I've helped them from things with CVs, interview process, um, technical knowledge, which I'll ask um, my studio if I'm stuck. Uh, and then I continue to, I'd say they're not mentees anymore, they're friends. I continue to help my friends as they progress through their career um, with questions like, things have come up at work that are worrying them they'll ping me a message and I'll see where I can help there or imposter syndrome every day for all of us so actually as a mentor it's actually quite nice to be open and honest and say I worry about that too and have an open dialogue just to let people know that the world out there isn't perfect and we're all finding it hard in our own little ways so I think that human touch um, really does help um, all of the mentees um, yeah, I think that's it. We're um, I'm gonna, I did write notes because I'm a producer, and that's what we all do. Uh, yeah, that that's it. It's really it's really easy, and I can honestly say, out of my whole job, and I'm not saying this to um to earn points, but it is the most rewarding part of my job because I finally feel like I'm giving something back. Because it might take five minutes out of my day, but the help it's given that other person, I think, could be so much more. So I'd really recommend it. If you're thinking about it, give it a go. And I'm going to introduce Matthias, who is one of our wonderful mentors. Hello. Thanks to hear that. Nice to hear <laughs> that. Yeah, cool to be here. So you've been with us for quite a while now. Yeah, I haven't looked up when I'm joined. Uh, it was back in 2019, 2020, before shit hit the fan, really. <laughs> um, and then uh, that was back um, uh, overseas in Montreal and now um, uh, coming back I always ask hey when will uh, Access VFX start in Europe and now it's time so I have my first mentees here in Europe as well even here in Cologne in my hometown so that's really nice that's really nice and how do you find being a mentor uh, it's cool. I mean, it was always one of my goal to um, show other people how to do everything. I mean, sometime, uh, sometimes I'm uh, know it all. So uh, even when I was a junior, <laughs> I always was like, hey, I know it better. That time it was not better. <laughs> but now it's uh, more that I think I can help these people better and all the juniors that I have. It's not only in Access VFX, but also in my own uh, old university and all this stuff and even in my company as well. Nice. And does it take up much of your time? Uh, not really. Uh, as you said, it's uh, perhaps uh, half an hour that you uh, look into Prospella or on the weekend when you log in and you're like, hey, there's a cool question that you want to answer. <laughs> Uh, then just do it. Uh, I mean, that's a good thing about everything is online. Uh, not to say you can sit on the toilet and answer questions, but <laughs> yes, it is like that. I hope you're not just saying. No, no, no. no. <laughs> and what kind of um, what kind of stuff are you answering? What what are you, what are you helping your mentees with? Yeah, uh, the good thing is, my, I mean, uh, Alicia showed her side, so it's on my side the opposite. It's like. First of all, the basic stuff, yeah, like uh, really re reviews. Um, I mean, Hugo does that as well. And uh, it's the most important stuff you do when you meet people. Hey, uh, what is my real, uh, does what my real look like? Um, but that's not the only part. I mean, uh, that's uh, basic stuff. Uh, networking is one mm, very important thing. Um, how to be a LinkedIn ninja, how to reach out to recruiters without being directly too uh, intimate or something like this. Uh, what's else there? Like uh, the Discord, Alicia told us about the Women in VFX Discord. There are even more where you can directly connect to others. And uh, yeah, the main thing is to meet people in person for me. So I'm also uh, organizing the Hangout here in Düsseldorf and in Cologne, uh, and perhaps you can meet uh, people as well. And then it's, as you said, uh, specific uh, questions about your craft, like new stuff in my way. Most importantly, uh, it's the mental stuff. 
uh, imposter syndrome is now the third time around here, uh, and all the other things like burnout, uh, like what's happening if my show is really shitty. I mean, that happens. Um, what is about overtime? Do I have to do 14 hours or can I say no? That's also a thing. I mean, a company can be happy that they have you for 40 hours. Why should they have you for 60 hours, 60 hours and you're burning out? And telling your own story that you say, hey, in my way, it was like I worked for 10 hours and then they, I told them I can't do any more and it was okay. This is very important for the juniors to, near, to know and to hear because they are on the lower side. Same with uh, salary negotiations. I mean, we know the first time we got money, we were like, oh, I take everything I want. Uh, but in the end, you most often start at the low end and then you have to work up and to tell them, hey, this is the lowest point you can go. Perhaps take it a little bit higher because you're really awesome. I saw you're re real. Hey, that can help. Oh, great. Brilliant. Yeah. And then, I mean, after that, as you told, uh, it's uh, more the mentoring while they are working. Hopefully they get their job. I mean, uh, a few of my mentees uh, already, they worked and uh, a few uh, start now. Um, and then what can they say now? Uh, how can they step up, uh, perhaps starting with scripting? Um, what about something like like uh, going to home office or remote if they are not? Because a lot of companies say, hey, juniors have to be in the office. And once more, when shit shows happen, tell them your story and tell them, hey, that was a bad part, that was a good part, and tell them, hey, appreciate everything you have. And if there is something wrong, tell people. Communication is so much key. And sometimes people, people forget that because they are like, oh, could I, can I say that to my uh, supervisor or not? Thank you, Matthias. It's amazing. I'm going to share my screen quickly because I know we want to make a few uh, some time for questions if anybody has some. But yeah. while uh, we do that, Hayley, I'll, uh, I'm just going to share the screen now to share the QR code and the link if people want to get involved. I trust everybody can see that. Yes, well done. Hey, the tech works. <laughs> the pressure. Um, I think I'm back on. Uh, we only really have time for one question, but if you can all hang around to answer any others in the live chat, that would be most appreciated. Um, just wanted to ask, um, is this initiative truly global? Can anyone get involved? Um, I had a question saying, if, is this available in India, for instance? Yeah, at the moment, because we don't have an active chapter in India, we don't have an active mentoring program in India, India but you can use the Q&A &E, Q uh, feature. We tried to get launched in Africa as well, but due to some of, because we have to do a lot of the safeguarding kind of legal work, that's where we rely on sponsorship. But if you are in India, you can still engage on the platform. You can still sign up and use the Q&A feature. And actually, in many ways, it's a bit more beneficial because you get access to all one and a half thousand mentors who can ask, answer your question. So it's still a really meaningful channel to engage with. But yeah, one day, if anybody's out there who wants to lead an Indian chapter, <laughs> we're all ears. We're working towards it, to be fair, and in Singapore. So 2024 should be an interesting year for the continued growth of Access VFX. Amazing. It's such a fantastic opportunity for everyone in the industry to get, get involved. So kudos to all of you. <laughs> no, thank you, Hayley. Thanks for the opportunity. And uh, thank you, Hugo, as well, doing a great job today. Thank you so much. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Have a nice day. Enjoy the day, guys.
Hi, everybody. Welcome to this new World VFX Day session. I'm Ian Fales from Befores and Afters, and I'm joined by Paul Franklin. Hi, Paul. How are you? Hello, Ian. It's, uh, I'm great. Lovely to be here. Uh, lovely to speak to you on the other side of the world. <laughs> yes, I'm in Sydney. Paul's in London. If you don't know Paul Franklin, he's obviously a longtime VFX supervisor, creative director at Dean Egg, but now also a director in his own right, which must be an interesting change for you, Paul. Yeah, it's uh, you suddenly realise that all the problems you may have had as a visual effects supervisor, uh, the director has more problems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that's interesting to hear. Um, we're going to talk about something which I think is a really nice kind of spin on World VFX Day. We're going to talk about iconic VFX moments in history. And, and I think in some ways, Paul, these are more moments that possibly inspired your own career. Yes. Um, for, again, if people don't know, Paul's an Oscar winner for um, Interstellar and Inception and a nominee for The Dark Knight. So you've had a lot of history with visual effects, but yes. we're going to sort of almost not debate, but walk through some of these iconic, you know, top moments in recent VFX history. Um, we're not going to start at the beginning in the late 1800s, I think, Paul. No. <laughs> but we could another time. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. No, I mean, I, I guess, you know, that's a sort of oblique reference to the fact that visual effects have been part of cinema, right, since the beginning of cinema. Mm. Uh, you know, trick photography, stop motion, uh, using matte paintings and models have always been part of visual effects. I I guess I'm lucky enough that I started my career in visual effects when uh, digital was just beginning its ascendancy uh, and you know, taking the lead position over the optical techniques that we'd used for, for many 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 decades when i say we i mean the film industry i wasn't a filmmaker in the in, even in the 1980s i was an art student um and uh, so i'm i'm I, I have a real interest in the way that visual effects has developed over the years and i guess really though for the modern industry everything changes with star wars and close encounters yeah. of the third kind in the 1970s because that's a point at which all those optical techniques I was talking about that you see in all these amazing films from the 50s and 60s and 70s, they are now being combined with the emergence of computer technology, which is being used to control the movements of the cameras. It's not being used to make the images yet. There's a little bit of computer graphics in Star Wars, but not a lot. Um, the original Star Wars, uh, episode four, A New Hope, as I believe it is now called. And um, <laughs> I'm old enough to still call it Star Wars. The... Um, uh, but this new computer control, motion control that was developed for that film made a, an enormous difference in the terms of the quality and the sophistication of the effects that could be made. And so suddenly visual effects, those two films elevate visual effects from something that was kind of part of slightly hokey, what, what would be, were considered to be B-movie films because the visual effects never looked that convincing. It took it right to the top of the A-list and mm. uh, changed cinema. Um, you know, there's all other things that factored into that, but that jump in quality and the ability of filmmakers mm -hmm. to tell these incredible stories now with this effects work changed altogether. Obviously, there was a sort of a precursor to that was 2001 back in the 1960s, mm -hmm. which is an amazing film and is a real landmark in visual effects. But the dynamism of Star Wars wasn't possible with the technology of uh, 2001, and that makes all the difference. And then, you know, there, there are other things that happen along the way, but that is a kind of real extraordinary moment where everything changes yeah but but I, and i know the answer to this but to tell people who might not realize what that computer controlled camera movement and platform movement motion control yes what did that let george lucas actually do what did it mean for the shots on screen the spaceships well, and that, the compositing as well if you think of the attack on the death star in an iconic sequence you know, it meant that he could shoot, design and shoot that sequence as if he was shooting a World War II fighter plane movie where you might use real air-to-air -air photography of planes doing incredible stunts. And now you could get the models to do the same sort of thing. So you think about Luke Skywalker shooting along the Death Star Trench being chased by Darth Vader. None of that was possible before this technology came along. At the same time, there was a refinement in the compositing process, the way that you put images together, add all the different layers together. Mm. And the folks who did Star Wars, they used a, a format, resurrected an old filmmaking format called VistaVision, which is a, a, a medium format uh, photography uh, format, which gives you much more resolution than standard 35 millimeter film. And this meant that as they added layers and layers to the images, 
and they printed down eventually to the 35 mil anamorphic print, they maintained the quality of the image. So the image cut very beautifully back to back with the uh, camera original first generation stuff, you know, the live action stuff inside the spacecraft. So you didn't get that weird separation in quality, which I think was a, you know, a hallmark of a lot of visual effects work before that. And um, these things, as I say, combined together, raised the level of the effects work to a point where you just believe it. You know, you just fell into that film when you went to watch it. I, mean, I went to see it when I was 11 years old. And it's mm. a you know pivotal moment because I've never seen anything like it, uh, which was so exciting. And you felt like you were inside that world, that universe. And we've only really just built on that since then. Yeah. I mean, it obviously heralded the arrival of ILM. Mm. And then throughout the rest of the Star Wars trilogy, there were just incredible leaps and bounds made mostly in optical, practical, puppet, um, but yeah. also motion control technology. And what I really love is that, you know, ILM was this leader, but the other companies grew up and out of ILM, Apogee mm -hmm. and Boss. Yes. And there was this amazing optical dogs. I'd like when they talk about optical dogs kind of period of visual effects, wasn't there yes. for much of the late seventies and eighties. Yeah, absolutely. And th throughout the eighties, you have a refinement of that process and the uh, there's a famous shot in uh, return of the jedi which is what is that 1982 i think or is it 83 i can't quite remember might be 83 82 83 i think i was about 17 when it came out and um there's a shot where you see a vast armada of spacecraft tie fighters and what have you uh flying at the screen and there's so many layers in it and that wasn't possible at the time when they made star wars i'm not sure how many layers the maximum level of compositing had in star wars but it's nothing like that but that mm. was a that's a refinement of technique and so that's improving on the optical techniques that have been created for star wars and close encounters and uh taking them to their limit and throughout the 80s you have essentially a, as i say a refinement of that process there are amazing things in uh, for instance back to the future there was a very clever um split screen process called vista glide which uses the VistaVision format and allows you to basically window in to the image and then move the frame around. So you can have those great shots where, you know, Biff meets his younger self or Marty meets his younger self and the camera seems to be moving effortlessly and they're seamlessly spliced together. And uh, that is, you know, it's an amazing effect. It really holds up today because it's done at such mm. high resolution. Um, but by the end of the 80s, you're beginning to see actual digital graphics making more and more of an inroad into the visual effects process. And I guess the other kind of two pivotal moments or at least big sort of flags which went up to us in the industry, or those those of us who were interested in visual effects, I wasn't in the industry, <laughs> um, were Tron in 1982. Yes. And then also the second Star Trek movie, The Wrath of Khan, which yes. features this, uh, I, I love it, the Genesis bomb sequence, which is just filmed off a television screen. And they even have to frame it with a, you know, a bit of console either side of it because they, they can't make it into a cinemascope ratio. Mm -hmm. But the the creativity and the invention that went into those films, again, those, those sequences still hold up because of the creativity is driving them. And so they transcend the technology. At the same time, they're doing things that just weren't possible with the uh, available technology, optical technology at the time. So when you see that amazing shot in Tron where the camera drops down over the light cycle grid and the light cycles zoom past you, it's both, uh, on one hand, it feels um, unreal. It has a sort of uh, very graphic cartoony look, but the camera is moving with such precision and the perspective is so accurate that it feels real. It feels like you're in a real space. It's like an early version of virtual reality where you go into a very simple blocky universe, but it's moving with all the correct parallax as you move around it. So you buy it. And, um, you know, those so those two films laid down a marker saying, well, you can do these things. You know, neither film was a, well, the, the Tron film was not a huge financial success. So no. for a while, people were wary about doing this. And, and even then we had that sort of backlash of like, oh, CGI isn't, uh, isn't proper <laughs> effects work. You know, there was a sort of reaction mm. against it. But by the end of the 80s, you get something like The Abyss, where the abyss mm. features the, the that fantastic moment, the pseudopod, the watery tentacle that comes out. And I think that's the first time that we really get a, uh, a, a photorealistic image being created in the film. 
Uh, you know, there's also Young Sherlock Holmes, which had The Glass Knight that appears as well. Yeah. And of course, both great. of those films are ILM. Um, yeah, well, Wrath absolutely. of Khan was kind of this um, mix of what Lucasfilm was doing digitally and then yes. eventually sort of became Pixar. Yeah. It was, but ILM uh, was obviously on that film. Wrath of Khan then, was Al Alvy Ray Smith's uh, little unit, which then uh, got hived off and eventually became uh, the heart of Pixar. Yes. So. And Young Sherlock Holmes was ILM. And of course, mm. Abyss was. Yes. And isn't it amazing that there was this sort of one, two, three hit from ILM of Abyss, Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park at the time? What's your memories of that period, which is about 1989 to 93? Well, uh, I think, you know, 1989, I was still an art student and I was sort of aware of these things going on. I'd heard about the Abyss and I think I, I, think I saw the Abyss on video because it didn't get a very wide release in the UK or it came and went very, very quickly. But I guess the films that really, the film that really kind of blew the doors off was uh, Terminator 2, uh, which came out a year or two later with um, with the liquid metal Terminator. And again, you're seeing something that can't be done any other way. You can't make that liquid guy, liquid metal guy with conventional techniques. And um, it's it's allowing the, the filmmaker to tell a story that just wasn't possible before that. Plus, mm. there's a lot of very, very clever digital compositing that's going on and you know, there's lots of great miniatures work and things that are happening in there. It's really uh, extraordinary that the film, again, holds up completely today. And it just seems so exciting that these new possibilities were being opened up by the folks over at ILM. And then, of course, Jurassic Park comes along. And this is the, uh, you know, the introduction of the, uh, the first time we see full motion uh, digital creatures. Now, there are not that many fully digital shots of the dinosaurs in Jurassic Park. No. A lot of it, a lot of what you're watching is Stan Winston's extraordinary full size T Rex or whatever on the set, and there's incredible, you know, practical effects that go in there. But Spielberg, you know, is a genius filmmaker and at the height of his powers and knows exactly when to choose the right technique. And so you you pull back and you see the shot of the of the T Rex stepping through the fence. That's a digital moment. Or when it's attacking the jeep, that's a digital moment. When it's putting its face against the car, you know, that's the practical. Uh, T-Rex and it's brilliantly uh, mixed together it's, it's actually something which still is important today is that I think if you become over-reliant on one technique uh, I think the uh, the audience can sometimes spot it yeah so it's, I, it's good to mix it up I've always of course loved Jurassic Park but it's so funny re-watching it sometimes I think oh I'm gonna not like how the, I know that this is a Stan Winston yeah. animatronic and then the CG but it doesn't seem to matter and no, that's a really curious thing. Well, you know, it it's not that curious. It's just really good filmmaking. And that's <laughs> yes. when people when people say to me, oh, you know, visual effects ruin films and things. And I say, no, you've just been watching a bad film. And yes. you know, that's just bad filmmaking because the great films, I mean, I love films from the 1940s that have uh, 1940s mm. visual effects in them. I love Citizen Kane, full of visual effects. You know, that's still yeah. considered to be a great film because it's a great film. <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> it's fantastic storytelling. But, but I do feel like one of maybe one of the first films you might have even done at Deneg is mm. Pitch Black, which yes. pod, which did have a lot of practical creatures and then digital work. Yes. It's very much that Jurassic Park mentality, right? Yeah. I mean, we started out with the intention to do a lot of animatronics in that film. Um, right. Obviously, Pitch Black had a much, much smaller budget than, um, than Jurassic Park. We had an amazing physical creature team, John Cox's Creature Workshop, who had won an Oscar for Babe uh, a year or so before that. Um, mm. But, you know, the budget was pretty tight and they wanted to do some extraordinary things with the creatures. So the proportion of digital increased as we carried on making the film. But there is a balance between the practical and, and the physical effects. And, of course, the um, the spacecraft that you see at the beginning, the, the Hunter Gratzner, named after the guys who built the model, who I <laughs> yeah. worked with and shared an Oscar with uh, years later, um they um uh th that's all physical models you know we didn't do a cg spacecraft i think there's one little cg spacecraft done by the folks at magic camera at the very end of the film but the rest of it's all practical so that's still very much that crossover moment and what the digital is allowing us to do with the creatures is allowing us to extend the reach of the filmmaker in what is you know essentially a, quite a low budget movie um you know the some of the digital work Kind of shows its age a little bit today it's 25 years old that film mm. um mm. that's when we started making it back in 1998 
But uh, again, you know, it comes down to just great choices by the director and it's great filmmaking. So people still watch that movie today. Yeah. And, and we've, We've talked a bit about, you know, obviously Star Wars is this landmark moment. And then as we get into digital visual effects, that was another technology landmark moment. I I actually always think of this, and this might be sound a bit UK centric, but I actually do think it was a really big thing, Paul. And you were there right in the middle of it, which was the Harry Potter phenomenon, yes. right? Yes. Especially how it brought brought so much work into the UK eventually. But tell me about that moment because it really pushed and pushed the visual effects industry there, didn't it? Yeah, I mean, there, there had been an earlier earlier attempt of, by the London visual effects community to really put itself on the map and say, look, right. we can do big films. Um, but really, it, Potter changes everything. And it's you know, there's that wonderful term, a perfect storm. Everything happens and falls into place at the right time. You've got a phenomenally popular uh, a series of books. Uh, everyone's very excited about it. You've got great filmmakers uh, attaching themselves to the project. David Heyman produced it. The uh, Chris Columbus, who directed the first two movies, obviously got a massive American studio like Warner Brothers behind it. And they're determined to keep the British flavour of it. And it's also important to know that J.K. Rowling stayed very much involved with the franchise and um, uh, you know protected the the quality and the values of the, in the thing. Um, mm. And then. The first film is still largely an American affair. You know, it's it's Rhythm and Hughes and Sony Image Works, um, and British companies are playing a smaller part in the in the process. When the second film comes along, um, the balance has shifted, and it's uh, initially it's Mill Film, the first incarnation of Mill Film, and they did some amazing work with the big spiders, and I think Framestore did the giant um, snake dragon thing that's down mm. in the, the basement of Hogwarts. You know, it's which nobody seems to have known about until they opened the door. Um, uh, and then <laughs> there awesome. onwards, really starting with the third film, that's where it really shifts into high gear. You know, mm. Alfonso Cuaron comes on board. The the whole series takes a different approach, a different look, which is a sort of, I think, kind of suits a sort of European sensibility. I know there's me being a little bit Eurocentric about it, but there's a sort of tradition of European filmmaking, which is perhaps a bit darker, a bit more gothic, uh, where, and that's where the franchise goes at that point. Um, that's also the first time that Deneg worked on the shows. We hadn't been on the, on the first two films, and we did a little sequence. We did the night bus, you know, the crazy triple decker mm. purple bus, which is great fun to do. Again, an amazing mixture of practical shooting, lots of plates on the streets. They had a real bus that could drive through the streets, uh, but also using digital effects to do the squash and squeeze and all the kind of crazy stuff on the inside of the bus. And then by, when we get to, from the fourth film onwards, we start taking a bigger role until by the time we get to Order of the Phoenix, uh, I think Dean Egg ended up being the lead vendor. And I was the Dean Egg visual effects supervisor um, working with um, uh, Tim Burke, who was the overall supervisor of the show. And, and you know, we did lots of scenes with Hogwarts, the Ministry of Magic. You know, there's also Moving Picture Company and Frame Store. And it's very much a increasingly a British affair. Mm. with ILM uh, coming into the Quidditch matches because basically they'd done such a great job on the second film that uh, Quidditch basically stayed with them for the rest of the franchise. Right. And it's great because I think you've got that kind of, there's a sort of um, a, you know friendly competition going on and we all know the other guys are going to do great stuff. So we're all pushing mm. each other to uh, to do better and better work and you know and vie for the lead position and who has the most spectacular sequence. <laughs> and I think if you if you look at, Order of the Phoenix, you know, the, the, you can you can go through it. So, well, yeah, okay, there's there's us doing something spectacular, and there's NPC answering us, and there's Frame Store doing some amazing creature work, and uh, I think ILM did the Thestrals on that film as well. Yeah, um, so, yeah, and it carries on, carries on, and so by the end of the franchise, uh, and again, this is a sort of transition into the digital world, is that um, Hogwarts was done as a miniature for most of the films, but for the last movie, we switched to a, a digital version of the castle which allowed us to do those extraordinary swooping shots flying right in through the windows and chasing the Death Eaters around during the the big final battle. Mm. Uh, so that's, uh, again, that's you know, sort of almost like a sort of changing of the guard. It, I just, it was such a landmark time in visual effects because there were so many films and then so mm. many people were employed in London. I just yes. wanted to bring that up. Yeah, so totally. I just it, wanted... it, really, it, helped, it really built the industry in London. Yeah. 
I want to mention to people watching, we've got about 11 minutes left on this chat and there's some questions we will get to, but I, I can't not ask Paul about his time working on Chris Nolan films, partly <laughs> because they were so successful films yeah. and also visual effects wise, very successful and popular. But also, Paul, there is a current climate around practical effects and even Chris mm. Nolan saying how much he loves that work. What was that experience like with you? Because I, I said right up the front of this stream that honestly, the visual effects person, supervisor, is usually the first hire on a Chris Nolan film or any of these big films now. And I think people would really love to know what your experience was like, given you know some of the commentary yeah. that's been going I mean, on. We're not, we're not quite the first hire. I mean, the, the production designer will come on before that because sure. uh, there's, uh, there's that relationship is central to the, the way the film develops. Uh, but yes, you, you, visual effects increasingly is an early hire, and certainly in the films I worked on uh, uh, with with Chris, um, visual effects is very much part of the conversation from the from the start of pre production, and uh, <clears throat> uh, and so you know that's very 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 important part of the process. I the yeah, there's I think what it is is you're seeing there's a there's a, there's a search for authenticity in film in the images that go into movies and we've seen a lot of films which are mm. essentially computer animated films with bits of live action in them uh you know the actors tend to be live action you can think of any big blockbuster superhero film or big sci-fi movie will often take that approach and um and there's been some you know absolutely incredible films made that way avatars probably the perfect example of that which is just an extraordinary cultural artifact the, and the way those films have just dominated the box office when they've been released and i'm sure the next one will do the same sort of thing and of course the phenomenon of all the marvel superhero films which uh but you know there's still super important to have actual actors so you have that uh, emotional connection but that search for authenticity i think is driving this um this sort of perceived backlash against computer graphics again it comes down to good filmmaking versus bad filmmaking if you're aware of the visual effects and and if they're getting in the way of you understanding the story and enjoying the film, then perhaps the right choices haven't been made. Uh, what I would say is that there's so many films out there that people watch these days, they're not just completely unaware that there's visual effects in mm. there because mm. the technique and sophistication has reached a level where it's just not noticeable. And I began noticed that really when we um, when we completed the work on Batman Begins. There's so much work in there that just dovetails seamlessly with the live action with the models with the physical effects uh with the live action performances uh that you know the audience didn't appear to be the critics didn't appear to be aware of when we were going to digital and i think what chris brought to the process for my initially was that you know he raised the bar for me in terms of the quality level that i was aiming at because you know the guy's got x-ray vision and can see every tiny flaw <laughs> in your work that you might have got away with with another filmmaker but not not so with chris mm. the level of scrutiny he applies to things is extraordinary but also he brings you into the process uh in that you're on set you're with the guys who are doing the physical part of the film you're not just sitting in some high-tech control room surrounded by screens you're physically there uh with everybody else <clears throat> And Chris wants to put as much reality in front of the camera as possible because that sets the basis of his film. And the visual effects work will build upon that. So we'll always be using that as a reference. Even if we're replacing it completely and doing an entirely digital image, it takes its lead from the live action. And that even applies to something like Interstellar. So sometimes when we were looking at the black hole, which is a completely computer-generated image, we may have put a giant 20K light up on the set and shone it into the camera to give mm. us that incredible optical burnout and the flares and everything and what have you. And then we'll start with that and use that as the basis to build the shot. So you're starting with a grounding in some sort of optical reality. Um, and then, of course, you know, we spent all that time trying to figure out the physics and make the physics authentic. So it's an actual simulation of the way the black hole looks. And that was also yeah. very important to the process as well. Um, and it's, it's not true at all to say that Chris... Um, despises visual effects that's the sort of kind of thing you hear it's that's it's just silly uh you can find plenty of examples of chris you know crediting the visual effects crews from all the films that he's made uh online and you know andrew jackson has been a very important part of making oppenheimer he's the dean of visual effects supervisor yeah. for all vfx soup who who did that show um and but it, you know i i i'm so grateful i had that experience of working with chris and working with his crew 
because I learned so much about how you create cinematic images and that experience of being on set seeing those enormous physical set pieces flying in the helicopter down the street through pittsburgh to chase the batsmobile batmobile that informs the way i look at even entirely digital shots you know i can look at something and say well that's not how a helicopter moves and i can tell you <laughs> because i've been in one <laughs> doing exactly the same thing or yeah. uh you know whatever you know so it's um it's yeah it's uh, it was a an immense privilege to have been part of those films Oh, that's great. All right. We've we've got hardly any time, but I want to ask a couple of quick questions. Someone asked about as a director now, mm -hmm. do you find yourself tweaking your vision or direction to facilitate the VFX work? Quick answer to that, Paul. No, not really. Uh, you always start with the story first and then you figure out what you need to do to support it. And it may be that you suddenly say, oh, I can make it bigger and better by doing this extra thing in visual effects. Uh, but I don't know. I wouldn't. I wouldn't ever say that I've uh, written something or directed something to take advantage of a a visual effects moment. It's it's driven primarily by the the story first and foremost. Right. Awesome. Um, someone wants to know how you see the role of the compositor changing in the coming years. Um, well, you know, obviously there's all this new AI stuff that's coming out and I've been looking at some of the AI tools, which can add incredible detail to things. At the moment, they only really work on still images. There are some motion tools, mm. but they're, they're, you know, they're not good enough to use in filmmaking yet, uh, whatever people, anybody says, but I do think it will change things. I think what it'll do is it'll extend the reach, uh, just as digital tools allowed us to do more in the same amount of time. This will do the same thing. Um, but the important thing is not to allow yourself to be led down arbitrary pathways by the by the software. I always say this about any digital software. You know, if you want to be a great digital visual effects artist, you need to figure out how to project your ideas through the software. So what comes out on the screen looks like your intention. And it isn't just some arbitrary choice, which was made by a software engineer of how Chrome or Fire or whatever should look, because the software will do a lot of things for you. And AI just amplifies that massively and it's very easy to get totally beguiled by these very slick images coming out of tools like mid journey and firefly and you say wow i'm an amazing artist look what i just created <laughs> because actually what you're doing is you're scraping together loads of other people's ideas and it's getting all munged up and it can be really interesting visually but it's it's also uh it's seductive because it has such a level of polish to it and you have to keep mm -hmm. asking yourself does this does this image earn its place in my story is it doing what I, or have I just been fooled into it by, uh, have I have I had my head turned by a pretty face? That's what you <laughs> need to, that's what you need to ask yourself as a film. Oh, that, that's a great answer. Probably the last question, um, uh, Justin in Queensland, who works at a university has asked, as educators, how do we connect the importance of those key moments that we discussed, which are literally 50 years old or longer, yeah with modern tools and techniques for new students. With new well, students. It's, again, it comes down to the storytelling. You know, if you were going to redo the Attack on the Death Star today, I think the, it might have more shots in it because they could you could afford to have more cuts and you wouldn't maybe hold the takes quite so long. And I, modern filmmaking is much more cutty than Star Wars, mm. uh, if you think mm. about that. But uh, I think the the actual intention of the filmmakers would still be largely the same um you might have a more you know the different effects might look different like the destruction of the death star would probably be something you know big spectacular cgi moment with all sorts of bits and bobs flying out at the camera um but i think it largely stay the same um the so the important thing is the intent of the filmmakers and the quality of the storytelling and the way that it pulls you in again there's a reason why we still watch episode four a new hope uh 50 years nearly 50 years after the fact it's the reason why we still watch 2001 there's a reason why i still watch films like the thief of baghdad and a matter of life and death on the red shoes because they are just great bits of visual storytelling and the fact that those films the ones i just mentioned are over 80 years old the original king kong is old is 90 years old you know there's a reason why we Amazing. still watch these they're just great bits of visual storytelling and uh, and that those lessons are just as important to somebody using modern digital tools turbocharged by AI as they were to somebody struggling with a two head optical printer back in 1933. Brilliant. Well, thanks, everyone, for your great questions. We couldn't get to all of them, but Paul has done such a great job of summing up a few of them all in one go, <laughs> especially relating to AI, which is the yes. topic um, of the moment.
Yeah. I really so think... enjoyed chatting about these key moments in VFX history, Paul, because I think some of them are mine as well, of course. Yeah, th thank uh, you. Ian. No, it's, it's always always a pleasure to uh, chat with you about visual effects. I could I could go on all day, as you can probably tell. <laughs> no, I loved it. That's <laughs> and... awesome. Thanks, Paul. We're going to throw back to Hugo now, but thank you, Paul, from DNEG. Really appreciate it. Take care. Bye-bye. Okay, we are back here. So I just wanted to come in here and just um, uh, thank everyone. Oh, sorry, I'm, I'm doubled up now. I can see that now. Um, just wanted to come in and uh, say that we are about to go into the next presentation, which will be ILP. So uh, let's just uh, move on to that presentation and I'll see you all very soon. And then after ILP's presentation, we also have uh, Jellyfish Pictures as well coming up and then some giveaways as well. So I'll see you all very soon. Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Tommy Hinks. I am lead research at Important Looking Pirates, a VFX studio based in Stockholm. Today, we're going to talk about our ocean tools that we have used on countless productions. First, I want to talk a little bit about the background. These techniques are fairly well known in our industry, but it's useful to understand at least a little bit of what's going on. So, these techniques that have been developed uh, about 20 years ago, they talk a lot about how to make the ocean surface, how to displace it, but they don't talk so much about the geometry. So that's something we will cover today. And also, it's interesting how you can integrate these tools into your pipeline. And we want to show you how we have done that in a way that we think works very well. But before we move on, we want to show you some shots that we made recently, and it's not only ocean shots, but there are some very nice ocean shots in there as well.
So in 2001, Jerry Tessendorf released uh, some very nice course notes following the movie Titanic, where he describes how to generate synthetic ocean spectra. He did this by digging deep into the oceanographic literature, where he found some very nice methods for doing this. A couple of years later, Christopher Horvath found even nicer methods and expanded on these methods by adding some extra parameters and uh, considering some extra things. Uh, the key mathematical idea is that if you generate the ocean spectra, you can then use something called a fast Fourier transform to convert those spectra into the spatial domain so that you can displace your geometry to get nice looking waves. As we see here in this picture, uh, we can, using these uh, methods by Tessendorf and Horvath, we can generate spectra. And here on the left side, we have, we have shifted the spectra to have the zero frequency in the middle, and then we have the low frequencies just around that, and towards the edges, we have the high frequencies. So we see that the highest amplitudes are in the low frequencies, which means that large waves, well, <laughs> large waves are larger <laughs> than small ripple-like waves. Uh, uh, yeah, and then if we transform this, we get a displacement map, which is basically how much to move each point on the geometry. So uh, when we, if we have a plane and we displace it using this map, we will get something that looks like an ocean surface. These displacement maps are tileable, given the periodic nature of the Fourier transforms. So even though we can tile them to sample them everywhere in space, we need to, it's common to use some tricks like cascading or noise masking so that we can avoid this repetition because as the camera zooms out, it will become very obvious and it's very annoying for the eye to see these patterns. Another thing we can do is we can treat the ocean as separate layers. Uh, this is actually very simple because we can just take different parts of the spectrum and, uh, and treat them separately. So on the top row here, you see that we have only the low frequencies, which is like the swell waves. And on the bottom row, we have the high frequencies, which are the smaller ripple-like waves. And if we combine them, we get everything together, but we might want to have different effects for the swell waves and for the ripple waves. But this is something that we will, I will return to this later, but it's very useful for the technical artists to be able to work with these two separately. Uh, so when the, the technical artists are often given reference material in the form of videos or images, and the director wants them to match this look and feel, so like certain characteristics of waves, certain winds, certain types of effects. Uh, and the artists are surprisingly fast at converging on the look, the creative directions given by the director because of this multi-layer approach. Um, also, we should note that our approach is very similar to the one that Houdini uses, uh, and we use it simply because it's the best one we've come across so far. Artists can also use masks and transforms, as I mentioned earlier, so that you can rotate or add noise to your surfaces, which also helps in the creative process. So even though noise doesn't follow the oceanographic rules, it's useful because, yeah, as, as in everywhere else in our industry, we don't want things to be too perfect. Now, uh, Tessendorf and Horvath, they cover how to generate the displacement maps, and they do this in some detail, but they don't really talk about how to generate the geometry that you need to displace. I mean, you need something to displace uh, when you have a displacement map. Very often, because oceans are very large, uh, the ocean will fill the entire visible part of the horizontal plane. So whatever the camera sees on the horizontal plane should be covered by ocean. So we can use frustum techniques to try to do this, but there are some challenges here because the ocean can go all the way to the horizon and we, we need uh, fine details close to the camera, but we can't have like centimeter sized triangles 
seven kilometers away from the camera. The meshes would be too big. So we need a, a smoothly varying level of detail, which I'm going to talk about how we solve that problem. We also need um, good triangle quality, because what happens if you use a naive approach is that you get sliver triangles at the horizon. Those are triangles where all the vertices are on a single line and you can't shade them. The normals are, are not good. And we also need some way to control the resolution because we also want to be able to generate preview meshes with lower resolution while modeling. And then we want to have very high resolution when we do the final renders. So one of the things that happens with displacement is that it changes visibility. So if you have a camera and you're looking at a plane, every point on that plane that you see maps to somewhere on the camera image plane. When you move stuff around, you're changing the visibility and very likely you're making it so that in order to cover everything on the plane, you'll have to bring in points from outside the frustum and displace them into the frustum or rather points will be displaced into the frustum and we have to find these points. The way we do this, we have a, an algorithm, an iterative algorithm that starts in the screen space in the image plane of the camera and then searches outwards until we have found all the points that map in the, that get displaced into the frustum. Uh, this is an iterative process, but it, it's pretty fast in practice because um, we can we we know when we're finished and we can run every iteration in parallel so it doesn't actually take that much time on the right hand side here we see that we generate a mesh that is as tight as possible around the frustum edges um, an important thing to note here as well is that we actually need to include points that are outside the frustum when we when we connect up the triangles for the mesh since we need we need the actual ocean surface to intersect the frustum planes. Otherwise, we would end up with very, very tiny gaps that would appear as noise around the edges of the screen. So we were talking about level of detail earlier and how we want smaller, uh, a denser tessellation close to the camera, smaller and uh, more numerous triangles, and then we want fewer and larger triangles out off to the horizon, right? Where we have large areas in world space, but that are very small in screen space. A naive approach is to cast rays from every pixel in the camera. But as I mentioned, this you end up with triangles that are very elongated, and they even become what we call sliver triangles. Uh, so we want to avoid that. And the way we do it is we, we check uh, we make a lookup table so that when we cast our rays into world space, we see, oh, did we make a bad triangle? In that case, we need to find a new position in screen space to sample from. So we can use uh, a cycle of projecting and back projecting until we can guarantee that the triangles are close to unilateral. And this is what we're showing in this zoomed in view here. It's a little bit hard to see but that the triangles are well behaved even though they're quite far away from the camera, which is at the apex of this triangle that you see here. This method is very nice because the artists don't have to worry about anything. They just point the camera and then they get their ocean plane. Triangles are nice. They don't have to worry about displacement around the screen edges. Their job is to um, focus on the characteristics of the waves. So are they moving fast enough? Is the wind, does the wind speed look okay? Or all those kinds of things. The, the geometry should just work. So integration, how do we get access to all these tools? So for modeling, which we do in Houdini, we, we hijack Houdini to propagate our ocean parameters in a subcontext. And everything is flowing through the graph, just like normal uh, Houdini uh, primitive attributes. So all our parameters are visible. You can interact with them. You can write Python code or VEX code. Uh, uh, so the artists are able to create their own custom tools based on like a small minimalistic core that we in R&D provide, uh, which is good because they don't have to 
come to us every time they need an update because then they might have to wait a couple of days so they can just do it themselves very quickly in production. We've also focused a lot on VIX integration. So we can access all the ocean properties inside of VIX. Um, this, as I will talk about on the next slide, it's very useful for setting up simulations. But it is also useful for previewing meshes in Houdini, where you get kind of a low resolution geometry, and then you can displace it using VEX, but you can also add uh, color channels, like if you want to see the normals, or you want to see the velocity, or other things like that. Uh, we have tried different approaches with uh, trying to write custom deformer nodes, but we found that it's impossible to anticipate everything that the technical artists are going to want to do. So instead, we just give them VEX. Now, simulation. So almost every interesting scene does consists of something other than just a procedural ocean. There's some object crashing into the water surface, making a big splash, or there's a maelstrom or a whirlpool or whatever. There's always something else going on, right? So we need to have a good way of merging the simulated water surface with the procedural water surface. So by doing that, we don't have to simulate the entire domain. We can keep the simulation tightly bound around the interesting parts. And this is where VEX comes in again, because you can set up the simulations, you can inject the velocities into flip simulations very, very easily without having to create any geometry. You can just go straight to the VEX and with your with the positions in space where you want to know the velocity, you can just sample it there. And you can also sample uh, something called cresting that we mentioned before, where which is a measure of how much the waves are self-intersecting when the vertices are being pushed together horizontally to get the sharp cuspy waves. Um, this is very nice because as waves break, uh, air and water mixes. And that's where you get bubbles and spray, and then we can, you can generate those interesting effects that kind of separate VFX water from like games water or other more simpler approaches. So for rendering, we have uh, we instantiate the geometry at render time. So we don't actually send huge meshes over the network to the render farm. Instead, we send a description of our ocean parameters. So this is just a, a JSON blob, a text file. Um, this saves a lot of disk space, and it also saves uh, a lot of network bandwidth. And the time, the render time to first pixel becomes much shorter because of this. We can choose if we want to instantiate the ocean mesh already deformed, or if we want to displace it as part of the shading. So inside the Arnold shaders, uh, you have access to, to, to all the ocean properties again, like the, uh, the cresting, the velocity, the displacement, everything you might want, even normals if you want to do bump mapping inside the shader. This is very nice to have this flexibility because in some cases you just want to deform the mesh and everything is kind of fine. In other cases you want to tweak it a bit inside the shader and you can do that too. If you tweak it too much inside the shader, you might end up in a situation where you you realize, oh, I need the actual final displacement somewhere else, like some, some object is floating on the surface. So you need to be careful. It's a trade-off. Future work. So uh, we would like to support more DCCs. So right now we're supporting uh, Houdini and Arnold, but the way our uh, tools are structured, we can, um, uh, we have the, the plugins are, are very thin and they're just talking to a core, just passing information in and out. So we think that it should be doable. And one, one idea is to have the oceans in Maya, where animators might benefit from being able to see the surfaces. Um, also, of course, USD Hydra, we could potentially support everything that supports USD. Also, we have found that in some cases, when we are merging uh, simulated meshes with the procedural meshes, that uh, if you don't, stitch them into a single mesh, you can get some rendering, artif ar rendering artifacts. So it would be nice to figure out a way that we can merge them into one mesh to avoid uh, some types of shading artifacts. 
that's all we have, folks. Thank you very much for watching. Uh, we have put a special ocean reel up on Vimeo, and please note that there's a password there. If you have any questions, please contact us on Instagram or through our webpage. Thank you, Haley, for organizing this fantastic event, and thank you to all the pirates for turning technology into beautiful images. Going to the industry when I was very young, I was really into stuff like Thunderbirds. I loved the practical models, the explosions, all of that kind of stuff. And then when I was growing up, I discovered video games and stuff like Tomb Raider. And I realized the excitement of being able to mix these two worlds the, the digital and the really cool practical effects from back in the day. So that started my creative journey. I love projects where I can really get into it, stuff where there's already, you know, material is great, you know, if I can pick up a comic that exists of it, if there's already toys and, and merchandise, you know, stuff like that should really get into the world. I'm a big collector of art books, so I've got loads of books, none of them have much text in, it's all beautiful pictures. I find they're great because then I can go to my shelves and say, ah, look, this is the perfect project for forests, maybe. I've got a great book on forests. So that's something I, I tend to use a lot. One of the films I really loved as a child uh, was Disney's Aladdin. The hand-drawn one, my, I remember my dad tracing on paper the characters and cutting them out where I coloured them in and I was able to play with them, pretend like they were alive. The first film I watched was actually Dune and I had nightmares for years from it. Oh, for weeks, I don't know how long. So it left a big impression. So that, that, that's, you know, something causing nightmares. Then, okay, let's go into the film industry. That was a eureka moment because I saw all the... I mean, it's so visually rich, that film, and maybe that's exactly what triggered it. And, and all the, you know, the fantasy, all the, 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 the desert, the whatever. It's just, uh, yeah, maybe that triggered it, yeah. I had the opportunity to join... Uh, a company to work on Aladdin, the actual filmed one. And I, I just could not turn that opportunity down. And it was working in creature effects. Uh, for the first time, I was doing all the, the setting up of the pipeline for this and getting into pushing myself in a technical manner so I could contribute to this company in that way, but also a very creative sort of path where I was trying to keep my work as exciting as it was when I was a kid because at some point a child is going to be watching this and maybe it's going to be their version and later on they get the opportunity to work on something that is similar that gives them the same nostalgia and excitement for me and I, I remember watching the credits go up and seeing my name on those credits and it was like kind of nothing I've felt to that point and nothing I'd felt after and I yeah it was it was such a special moment for me working on a project. I trained to be a cinematographer and I was a cameraman for a long time and spent a lot of my early 20s driving around um, Europe filming things um, which was wonderful uh, but I always wanted to do fiction work and I ended up um, on the side I was also illustrating comic books which was an incredibly fun thing to do and I mean it never made me anything in <laughs> remotely like a living but it made the thing to really start to understand um, in sequential storytelling and how you tell stories just through still images and so I ended up doing a weird combination of both of those things and became a storyboard artist so I moved from camera work and directing live action stuff to storyboards and I ended up 
direct your animation. You know, the original Alien, Ridley Scott, that sort of body, early 70s work was amazing. But yeah, it was, it was Alien. I think that was probably the, the main thing. I still watch that film now and again and I'm like blown away by it every time. I think it just, it's a bit of a fluke. It's like there's so many things that came together, at the, you know what I mean, at the same time and it just kind of worked. It's like having that on-set experience, like working with a DOT, like dirtying up the shot, you know, shooting it dirty, not clean, and like, you know, thinking of what, what a real camera would do as opposed to a CGI camera makes a big difference. You know, I think, that, you know, framing it up so it's not perfectly framed because when you're, you know, with a real camera, it's really hard to frame stuff up. The work that I do now at Jellyfish, the work that I've done over the last 10 years, has been really varied. It's been everything from world building and production design on feature animation films to um, uh, specialist factual TV programming about extinct oh. animals or the human body or genetics or evolution. Um, we've done live action creatures, I've done animation supervision for films. Um, it's a really broad church of things that I've done here over the last uh, 12 years. I've been a jellyfish. Okay. Okay. Yeah, and we are live again. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Hello, everyone. And so, yeah, I, I hope you've been enjoying the session so far. It's been great to see all the love and support on the chat. Thank you so much for everyone's messages and people have been so kind and so lovely with all the questions. We're so happy, um, you know, so we just wanted to like come in and just say hello to everyone <laughs> and uh, mention that, uh, I don't know if you noticed, but we've been dropping some links on the chat with the giveaways. So we have two giveaways all the way until midnight. Uh, we're giving away three uh, seats of my Nuke course. I've put the, on, the chat, on the chat right now. And also the Foundry, the lovely people at Foundry or lovely folks at the Foundry are giving away as well three Nuke X subscriptions for one year as well. So thank you so much, Foundry. <laughs> yeah, and I just wanted to do a quick shout out to our sponsors. Um, Chaos, UPP, UFX Studios, The Yard VFX, National Film and Television School, Dazzle Pictures, Daz Element, Next Gen Skills, and side fx thank you so much your support means that we can continue what, doing what we're doing and hopefully be bigger and and if we can better <laughs> it's a bit cocky to say <laughs> um for next year but yes i really hope that you stick around for the rest of the day because we've got lots more in store for you yeah absolutely thank you so much for all the lovely support and also for allowing us to do this stream without your support we would never be able to do it uh, so thank you so much Okay, so I guess then the links are on the chat. You have until midnight to kind of like sign up for the giveaways. And I guess next up, I guess, what is it? What's next up? <laughs> what's next? <laughs> um, next up, we have uh, Jeffrey um, from Megalis. Cool. They're talking about uh, VFX in Asia. Okay, cool. And they're coming to us from Japan. Okay, cool. So I'm going to put the board up for a second and then we'll be right back.
Hello. Hi. Um, hello from, from Tokyo, uh, Japan. Uh, my name is Jeff Reed Dillinger. Um, this is Chris Oprodo. We also have our friend Ash and Mario behind us, um, both for support and to kind of help <laughs> folks in the camera space. Um, <laughs> we're, we're, we're really happy to be a part of um, World PFX. I know Haley and Hugo and the team have been working really hard to make this happen. And we've had it on in our office. Um, so far, it's Friday night at 7.30 p.m. here in Tokyo at the moment. So uh, we've seen a little bit started and we'll look forward to the rest of the day. Um, what we want to talk about today, we will, we want to introduce our studio a little bit. Um, and then we really want to talk about VFX in Japan because Chris and I have had the opportunity in the last year to go to SIGGRAPH, to go to Annecy, to go to VIEW conference in Italy. And um, we get a lot of questions uh, when we say, oh yeah, we've, we've got this VFX studio in Japan. So we'll try to answer a lot of those questions today for you and maybe um, give a little bit more information on, on what it's like um, to have a VFX studio in Japan. So let me start. Um, I'm going to share my screen. So VFX in Japan. Um, Here's a, a, a map that I made. I have kind of the studio distribution of, um, I know this is World VFX Day, so I'm, I'm going to focus on VFX, but because Japan has such a big animation and game market, I think it's important to mention that as well. And there's a lot of companies that do a little bit of everything. So it was actually kind of hard to, you know, put them in a, in a category. But um, the, as you can see from the legend, the, this is just Tokyo. Um, the, the sort of dark red um, explosions are the VFX studios. Then, as I said, sometimes the boxes are kind of hard to put people in. So there's kind of CD production. There's some companies that have some effects teams, but they mostly manage, um, help uh, studios produce VFX projects. Then we have in blue the animation studios and green the game studios. You'll see um, it's quite interesting. There's a lot of animation studios out west here in Tokyo. This is um this is Ghibli here, for instance. Um, Sunrise, which made like the Gundam um, project, is over here. It I, I was always curious if there was a reason. I didn't know if like somebody started and then they just all kind of extended out here. But it, it's kind of funny how it's um become a distribute. And Ghibli was one of the last ones. Actually, a lot of the other companies were there first. Um, the black heart here, and um, I guess the heart of Tokyo is uh, Megalis. This is where we are. <laughs> Uh, right now, um, and I'll, I'll bring up the map a little bit later to show you interactively, but I just wanted to kind of give an idea of where we're presenting to you from now. Uh, a little bit about us. Um, first of all, this is what we looked like when we started the company. So yes, running a visual effects studio in Japan does make you age quite a bit. Um, I'm originally from the US, um, but I started coming to Japan in 2005. Chris never told me when he came to Japan first. So that's why it's funny. But you, maybe you can answer <laughs> 2010, the question. 2010. 2010. Yeah. And for Eagle? Yes. For right. Eagle. Yeah. For Go. Um, so Chris grew up in France, was exposed to a lot of Japanese <clears throat> pop culture, manga, anime. I um I I just came here for the food. The first time I came, um, I loved it and I just had to keep coming back. So I've actually lived here. Two different occasions the first time for two years now this time for three chris has been here for almost 10 years yeah very very almost soon to be 10 years so um that's just a little bit about us i uh i want to let ashton and uh, mario quickly say a little bit about something a little bit about themselves as well yeah, this yeah. is actually ash's second time here as well yeah coming into my fourth year in japan mm. um but most of my career was in london uk and I'm the compositing supervisor for Megalith now. Mm. And yeah, um, food is a big plus for living in Japan. Mm -hmm. I can, yeah, I can agree too. <laughs> um, my name is Mario and uh, I come from a different background. I come from robotics, but now I'm part of the research and development team here in Megalith. Mm. Yeah. And he's originally from Costa Rica. And uh, how, many, how many years have you been here? Eight. Eight years. Yeah. Now. He's a PhD candidate at um, Tokyo University at the moment, as well as. Uh, member of the Megalith team. So everybody asks us, why did you come to Japan? Um, it's a question we get a lot. Um, 
it, it, when we're interviewing people for jobs, everybody kind of wants to know this answer. Um, I kind of made one slide that answers it from my standpoint, I guess. Um, food. I mean, if you've been to Japan, you know um, why we would want to be here. If you haven't been, um, please come visit. Let us know you're coming. You can stop by the office. We we love to host people. And a little bit our, about our company. So basically, um, we do VFX. We do animation as well. Um, and we really wanted to bring the best artists from around the world to Japan. I, I was actually a member of a it was called CGJIJ. It was a mailing list back in the day. It was my Hotmail account as usual. And it was basically in the early 2000s of people in the VFX industry that were looking for CG jobs in Japan. And people would kind of exchange information about companies that might be hiring. If you couldn't speak Japanese, maybe what some of your options were. And I always kind of had this, this desire to come, come work here. Um, the challenge was finding a company to work for. And that's kind of, I feel like if Megalist existed back then, a lot of the people that were looking would have would have been attracted to our studio here. So that's kind of what we're trying to do. We're trying to create a studio in Japan that artists from around the world who may have an interest in living here or just um, kind of being a part of something unique would, would be happy to join. So a little bit about our, our company. It was founded in 2017. Um, Chris was one of the founding members. We originally focused on, on high-end um, effects. Chris comes from an effects background. I come from more of a lighting with a compositing background. So um, fortunately, though, I, I love Houdini. So we really built our core pipeline around, around Houdini. So even today, we're using, you know, we, we used Solaris in 2020, 2020. I mean, as soon as it was started. Solaris, yeah. From 2018.5. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, in 2018, um, Ash joined for his first time at Megalis. We um, started putting a compositing team together. Then um, Tonker House contacted us about doing a stop motion version of, of Oni. And we did some tests for that. Um, we've done some other talks about that. I don't want to get into it too much, but it ended up becoming a full CG project, which um, we're really happy with the results of. So please watch it if you haven't already. We've also done some VFX for shows like The Nevers on HBO. Um, we're going to show a reel in a, in a second, and you'll be able to see some of those. So, but most recently, we did a project for um, Netflix Japan called Zombie 100. There's an anime. We did the live action version. Uh, it's it's a fun fun show. If you haven't seen it, um, please give it a watch. There's a well, you'll see it in the reel. But there's a, a zombie shark at the end. And um, coming out December 14th, next Thursday, uh, Yu Yu Show. It's based on a, a manga in Japan that was quite famous, uh, maybe, I don't know, 20 years ago. And we're really hoping it does well. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty cool project. It's five episodes, about 45 minutes each. And um, I hope you guys watch that as well. So right now I'm going to queue up Hugo to share our demo reel. We'll talk over it a bit just so um because we don't have any music and i, I want to be able to comment on some of what you're seeing because maybe things that you recognize it may it may not be all right go ahead hugo should i stop sharing just gonna like um share my screen sorry <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, apologies for that because um apologies everyone i wasn't um sorry i should have given you a, good, a better heads up H hugo helped us make sure that the footage was cleared by netflix so i mean not by netflix i'm talking about youtube so um he's been kind enough to uh to share it for us today oh no you no, no you don't need to say that it you were very kind to to uh, help us a lot with that as well so okay so you probably see my screen now and uh i'm gonna just leave, leave it looping here and and then i'm gonna leave you to it so goodbye <laughs> <laughs> So this is from the, the zombie film that we talked about. You saw an image from here in the, the first slate that I had. Um, uh, one of our um, Japanese compositors, Keita Hoshino, did the shot. It's, it was one of the ones that we got the most reaction out of when we shared it. So um, the, like the producers of Netflix, everybody was like, oh, that firework shot. This shows how we recreated um, Shinjuku. Uh, it was the shot, when it was shot on set, it was just basically the 7-Eleven there on the bottom. We did an extension. 
that location is about 10 minutes down the street from us by walk. So it was fun to go there and, and take thousands and thousands of reference images. Again, this is a, a couple blocks down from where that last night shot was. But yeah, we basically had to recreate this little Easter egg. There's an Oni poster up in the top there by Godzilla. The other one's Alice in Borderland, which I also recommend if you haven't watched on Netflix. And here's the zombie shark I was talking about. In the manga, it's like three cells. So we didn't think we'd have to even, uh, I think you only saw one side of it. So we're like, oh, we can just do the left side. But um, it ended up being in like 90 shots in the film. <laughs> All right. So yeah, I, we, we can stop it there, Hugo. Thank you for that. Yeah, so that was our um, our zombie here. Let me let me reshare the screen. Okay, I did want to um, cover. Oh, thank you. Um, a little bit of Japanese film history as well. I think it's um, interesting to hear about it, especially since, you know, we're celebrating um, this day on, on a very, like, historic um, birth and, and the history of, of cinema. So I thought I could talk a little bit about um, this year. So in 1896 is when the first kinetoscope um, was brought into Japan. And a vitoscope as well. So those are both um, Edison's machines that he had made. Then the next year, a cinematograph came as well, all in this Kansai area. That was a Lumi Brothers um, creation. Then in 1899, the very first Japanese film was made, or the first first one that we still have um, evidence of, so to speak. Then in 1903, if anybody's been to Japan has been to Tokyo, you'll recognize Asakusa. It's quite a popular touristy area. There's a big um, temple there, just down the road to the side from the temple was this um, movie theater, the very first movie theater in, in Tokyo. And as you can see, um, it was a very, very popular entertainment district at the time. So uh, people really came out to, it was the center of entertainment in Tokyo. Then in 1912, the first major film company was created. And then more re relevant to today, in 1917, the first animated film in Japan was made. Then in 1923, if you know some of Tokyo's history, there was a really, really big earthquake and a lot of the wooden buildings caught on fire and so much of Tokyo was destroyed. So a lot of the film industry moved down to Osaka, Kobe, Kyoto. And that's when in 1926, Uzumasa was made in Kyoto, which is where most samurai films that you've seen were filmed. So they kind of built a samurai village and they had these stages. And here's a picture of one. I was actually there on Saturday um, for some location scouting. So here's one of their sets where you can actually, it's quite modular. So depending on the era, you can change, say you if you want the roof panels to be wooden or straw, if you want the doors to be of a certain style. So you go there, you help design this. I really like, I, I did this with kind of a wide angle. So I like the seeing the old catwalks up in the top still in this image. I thought, thought that was pretty cool. Uh, now the VFX industry. So more recently, it was about by the research I did, and like I said, it's kind of rough because it's hard to define what exactly makes a VFX studio VFX studio. But about sixty to eighty VFX studios in all of Japan. Um, only about five are outside of Tokyo. Most of them are in um, you know that central area that I showed you on the map earlier. Companies here tend to be small. We're eighty people at Megalist, but the majority of the companies are closer to ten to thirty people. And a lot of them um, are generalists, as I mentioned here. So you'll get people that can do a wide range of things, but a lot of times the companies might focus on one thing. So say like modeling for animation games or you know, that sort of that sort of task. Um, another thing about Japan is budgets tend to be really small, which is one reason why it kind of makes more sense to have smaller studios because you can focus on doing um, a project with a smaller team 
to kind of increase your profits as opposed to a larger company that um, can be a bit more challenging. If you want to talk to me about that some other time, please get in touch. Um, so CG industry, outside of the effects, um, about 500 animation studios. It's, it, America's, um, the has the biggest animation um, uh, um, market in, in the world, then Japan's second, France is third, uh, where first comes from. Um, I showed you earlier on the map, a lot of the animation studios kind of run along with that line. Uh, video game companies, though, tend to be back in the Osaka area, um, where Nintendo's in Kyoto, Capcom is right in the middle of Osaka. And before, actually before the thank you slide, sorry. I, I do want to share with you this map that I made because I think it's quite interesting. Um, so actually, the purple that you see now is all the locations of people that will be talking or maybe have already talked today. So we have Ian down here in Sydney, um, looking forward to hearing from a lot of these other people. But let's let's look at where we are here in, in Tokyo. And I'll turn on the VFX studios that we looked at before. Um, animation studios here that you see basically kind of along that line. And then when I turn the game studios, you'll see some popping up down here and in the Kansai area. It was quite interesting to me to sort of do this project because I found out about a lot of companies I didn't know about. Um, this place is called Akita. If you know about Kachiko, the dog in Japan, it's kind of a famous place for this uh, very traditional Japanese dog. Um, there's a guy that used to live in Tokyo that um, his wife is from there, so they went up and started a company there. There's a company up here in Hokkaido as well, and then a couple companies on Kyushu uh, in Kumoto and Fukuoka as well. So, yeah, I thought anything you wanna say? No, no, no. no. Okay. <laughs> I mean, except that you know. Uh, for anyone who hasn't experienced Japan yet, you guys should uh, come and visit us. Yes, <laughs> yes, right here. Um, yes, and I I was trying to leave some time just in case there are any questions. So I would like to see maybe Haley or Hugo could speak up with any questions that come in. Otherwise, I would like us to be able to um, expand a little bit. Yeah, I just have uh, uh, two quick questions for you, if you wouldn't mind. Is that okay? Yes, please. <laughs> so one of the questions that's showing up on the chat is uh, how how did you guys got to move to Japan? How did that happen? <laughs> yes, so I, I did brush over that. But like I said, that is the biggest question that we have. Um, so both Chris and I did come here the first time to work at other companies. Um, both of us spent some time at Square Enix. Actually, we 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 just missed each other, but it was during the time that uh, Final Fantasy XV was being made. And I I was coming from Sony Pictures Imageworks and then ILM. So I I spent twelve years of my career um, at Imageworks and then ILM. So I'd only really worked on feature films, and I was I was interested in in real time you know, game engine and I, you know. Square Enix was one of the more respected studios in the world at the time, and, and I was really curious to see, um, you know, kind of learn from them. That's a, it's, yeah, it's it's a lovely place. I visited already once Square Enix in Japan. I, I visited ah. Japan like ten years ago, and I they gave me like a a nice tour of the building, and I saw the mocap studio and everything. It was so lovely. Because I worked with them <laughs> once uh, on a on a trailer uh, a long time ago. <laughs> oh really? So, yeah, yeah. I, I they worked with us. I I I was directing a trailer for Just Cause Three called Firestarter, and they did most of the full CG shots on the end. So it was it was fantastic to meet them. Uh, this was ten years ago. <laughs> so right, 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 right. So one other question I have uh, here um, from the chat in terms of geography spread the visual effects, is it like mostly in Tokyo, or is there other places as well with a lot of visual effects companies? Honestly, I, I struggled to find that many outside of Tokyo. And like the example that I used, you know, maybe somebody's in Tokyo um, and then has either a family, you know, reason to maybe open a studio somewhere else. I was, I was expecting maybe there should be a little bit more industry for, say, local, like local advertising, you know, that, that sort of thing. 
but um, couldn't find much, uh, to be honest. Yeah. Another thing I wanted to point out was um, kind of the, the, the trajectory that most artists in Japan, the, at least, you know, a Japanese person uh, would, would come to be in the industry. Uh, most of the schools are um, as trade schools, as you say. Digital Hollywood still has a presence here. Um, they used to have um, a school in LA as well, but, but not anymore. And so they're in Tokyo and Osaka. So you get a lot of people going to say, you know, either six month, one year, two year, three year at the most programs and kind of getting a broad education. And this is where maybe that sort of generalist, um, you know, artist kind of comes from. And most of this happened to be in Tokyo. So I think people come to Tokyo and then kind of stay. I see. Um, Okay. So let me just see. There's another question here trying to like uh, open it up but I can't uh, yeah so um, there's there's a lot of people asking the, kind of the same thing uh, so thanks so much mm-hmm. chat uh, Lana and Space Monkey and Edo as well most of them are asking the same question how difficult is it like the immigration restrictions for you if you decide to move to Japan for example if you are in Europe for example how how is that even simple? Is it even doable? Like I'm guessing, I'm guessing a lot of people on the chat want to go to Japan. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Um, to, to be honest, a little bit. I think our company has brought in so many people. Um, we brought in Ash twice. I think we, <laughs> I think we've maybe the government kind of recognizes us. Uh, we, we've had visas go through in two weeks sometimes. Once we get all the paperwork together. Um, I know he's listening in the other room, so shout out to our, our visa person, Taka, for um, all the work that he does. I Honestly, we it's a much smoother process than than I, w- I would have ever guessed. We used to estimate about three months um, back during the pandemic. Um, obviously, the borders were closed for a period, and then you could imagine a bit of a backlog of paperwork. But in the last year, I mean, two, maybe a month at the most, you know. So it's, it's actually been... And, there aren't any really country restrictions, you know, and we've we brought in people from all over Europe, from Russia, from Brazil, from, from North India. America. Yeah. yeah, from India, Thailand. Yeah, many, every, every possible country we could. Yeah. Um, one thing, though, is uh, you need a bachelor or a lot of experience. <laughs> that's, uh, that's one thing. Yeah, you, you can you can kind of apply for uh, exemption, but it's it's a bit tricky. Um, yeah, and and obviously you know each, each country might have a different term for you know in North America it would be a bachelor's degree. Sometimes you know if they look at a Spanish degree and they translate it to Japanese, if it doesn't match what they're looking for, maybe you know they could reject it. But. Of yeah. course, of course. Uh, one one question that showed up a few times, and apologies if you've mentioned it, but I was was a little mm. bit uh, busy with the stream itself. But um, of a lot of people were asking if if actually if it's true the myth that you really need to know very very good Japanese to work in mm. Japan. <laughs> so in yeah, this goes so twenty years ago when there was that mailing list discussing it. Um, definitely, there were a, very few studios that you could even really survive in without speaking Japanese. We've actually heard that some Japanese people are, are hesitant to apply to us because they're afraid that their English has to be perfect. So I think we, we've we kind of found that, that ground where we can welcome people whose Japanese level is, you know, anything from almost non-existent to, you know, perfect or, you know, English as well. So we, we do have, you know, enough people that can help, you know, make, help conversations move along if, if there's any sort of uh, trouble. Of course, uh, but, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I, I've heard the same thing as well that it's a bit easier these days to do that. It was not the case mm-hmm. when I traveled back then. It was when I went ten, ten years ago. Uh, I have a. I guess this will be probably the final question, unless you have anything else. To, well, we still have like two minutes left, but uh, mm. before we move on. But one question that I got here was like, "Are you guys recruiting?" <laughs> <laughs> um, so on our website. Um, we do have a recruitment link and you can fill out information. We don't post specific jobs because it's so dynamic as far as what you might need based on projects. But um, I can say we're always looking for good people. You know, I mean, that, that's, that's something that we won't, uh, won't stop looking for. So, yes, um, you know, we're, we're happy to, to receive uh, any, any applications. 
Um, and and you too, I just have to point out, because you mentioned Square Enix earlier, we're just about a, what, 10 minute at the most walk from... Oh, from wow. <laughs> we're, we're, so you, you weren't too far from... from oh, that's amazing. Yet. No, I, it was it was lovely to visit them. It's such a nice building as well. Very underwhelming. Yeah. <laughs> very, very big. Um, yeah. <laughs> so... Um, one final question I'll give to the to all of you here is that mm. have been um, many ch changes since the strike ended. Did you feel like there's more work now, or is it kind of busy as usual? How how are you feeling after the strikes are over? So actually, Ash brought this up just before um, we joined the call. I think I don't know if you have any because Ash was actually in London kind yeah. of when the strike started, so he saw its effect on the industry over there. Whereas we didn't feel any immediate or direct effects, but because we also do international projects, it's probably the projects that didn't come our way that we didn't know about. You know, it wasn't necessarily things being canceled. It was just maybe a lack of international projects coming our way. Mm. Yeah, but, of course. Um, how, how, I mean, you, how was it for you in London? I mean, uh, oh, London, I London kind of stopped quite, <laughs> quite yeah, a lot. Yeah. I still have, you know, lots of friends keep me updated, but. Yeah. I feel like Japan was, you know, on a, on a different. Yeah. Like yeah. Just be, because the strikes didn't affect the Japanese industry, you know, things just kept moving forward. Mm -hmm. We were fortunate at the time to be working on some Japanese projects. So, um, yeah, cool. I guess we were a bit luckier than the rest of the world. But, right. Yeah. Well, I'm afraid we are running out of time. So um, I just wanted to thank you so much for joining us today and to show us Japan's visual effects and history and the amazing work that you've done so far. Congratulations to you and your entire team. So thank you so much no, for joining us today. No, thank you so much. You guys, you guys are putting a lot of work on this. For those people out there that are getting to enjoy the fruits of labor, um, yeah, Hugo and Haley have put in a lot of work and Ian yeah, and everybody else. So we, we appreciate it all. Oh, much, much thank appreciated. You so much. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, well, goodbye, thank everyone. You. And, uh, see, you, see you all later. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Vietnam is known for its bustling city, is known for its coffee, and it's known for its amazing food, but it's not yet known for its VFX community. Today, we would like to shine the spotlight on Backlay Studio for the World VFX Day. World of the Backlay Studio. Hello, I'm Backlay Studio. Hello, I'm Backlay Studio. Hello, I'm Backlay Studio. Backlay started 10 years ago. It was founded by two artists who worked a decade in big studios such as DNEG, MPC, and Booth. Since then, Backlay has become a household name in the Vietnamese film industry, working on over 30 movies. We became well known in Asia, accomplishing VFX shots with limited time, budget, and crew. Naturally, we attracted the attention of Korean VFX studios and we started collaborating with them in 2018. Our contribution was successful, so in 2022, Backlay joined forces with Cocoa Vision, a VFX studio in Korea, to create a new VFX studio called IEOI, with Backlay as the backbone of this new venture. In 2023 alone, we have worked on 9 OTT series for Netflix and Disney Plus Korea, completing over 1300 VFX shots.
We are known for our creature and digital double work, making a lot of realistic animals and monsters. We also have a dedicated AI department for multitude of tasks, from face replacement to rotoscopy, painting, and much, much more. Backlay's mission is to create a community, collaborating with other local studios and nurturing Vietnamese talents with the help of some international artists. With that in mind, Backlay, with the support of other studios, is launching in 2024 the VFX and Animation Vietnamese Association, aka VAVA. VAVA's goal is to put Vietnam on the VFX map of the world. Backlay and the VFX Vietnamese community is honored to be showcased in the World VFX Day among our famous peers. We strongly support the VFX world community in which to stop the narrative Invisible VFX are no VFX. Hey everyone, uh, we're the VFX Nomad podcast and we're coming to join the World VFX Day. Uh, I'm sure you're watching this streaming or later on. Uh, so we wanted to kind of keep a positive vibe about you know, the industry. There's been a lot of negative publicity about no CGI and VFX is evil and everything. And uh, yeah, we were just thinking that we'd share some nice stories about like the benefits of being a VFX artist and why we do it and why we're happy to do it. So we thought it was a good idea to talk about maybe our first time seeing our names in the credit and some other benefits. So does anybody have a good story about like the first time you saw your name and lights on the, the end scroll along with the other names that are a giant wall of text? I have a story about how I didn't want to see my name in the credits. <laughs> <laughs> really? So the first film, one of the first films I worked on as a compositor, Junior Comp was an NPC on 50 shades of gray <laughs> and uh i was like man is this it my whole degree and my studying for three years vfx at university then i think at this point i'd done maybe like a year and a half in roto prep finally i get to be a comper and it's like fuck it's like uh is my name gonna my first credit gonna be on this it's like i'm telling my grandparents uh, and they're super proud of me it's like oh what's the film about and it's like oh this is a uh, not so fun so yeah that was the first time luckily i didn't get a credit on that and uh, I think the first credit I got was uh, Guardians of the Galaxy or Terminator, one of the Terminator films. I think, was that a which was amazing egg or NPC? NPC, ah. NPC, NPC. And obviously, it's like it's a big thing for you. You get to update your IMDb, and your family get to go see it and things. So, and I think actually, to be honest with you, I think it kind of wears off a little bit the excitement. Yeah, which is a shame. Like, uh, but I mean, how about you guys? Was it a similar process? Were you straight in as compass, and did you get your credit then, or? Was it for you guys? I was definitely roto paint, but I was lucky in the sense that the um, the entire block of credits was just one thing, so it didn't say which ones was which. So all the people that I told uh, that I was a compositor, believe me. <laughs> you like I'm, I was actually the director. They just put our names in the uh, <laughs> in the big block. Yeah, uh, about, yeah, it's great. You, just man? having family with you, and then you know, there's. There's there's lots of professions that you can explain and it's uh, they don't exactly know what you do. I mean, they can kind of get your head around it if you explain some detailed analysis about statistics and marketing, etc. But the second, you know, the people that know you go in and see the product of your work and then see your name after the product has been presented is uh, it speaks for itself. And it's a very nice moment. Yeah, yeah sure. I, I think uh, I was really lucky to to start working on films really early on, like the, the first year that I started. And uh, before the Roto Paint gig on Luma, I got to work at a, at a small studio called Gradient Effects, uh, which was run by uh, some German folks. And we worked in a movie called Priest. I don't know if you ever saw this movie. It was with uh, the guy that plays Vision. Is it a horror film? It's not a horror film. It's like a no, sci-fi okay. Western. <laughs> And uh, th basically this okay. priest is really badass and he kicks everyone's, everyone's ass and there's like a train sequence where they have to stop a train that's a bomb from entering a city and blowing it up. And he's like fighting all these villains on top of a train. And we had some like blue screen. This is like the regular life of a priest, right? Yeah. This is what priest is. Yeah. It's like a is priest, that... badass, <laughs> badass priest. Anyway, it was, it was super cool because it was like the, uh, an actual film. And uh, I was using Shake, 
at this place. So we learned, uh, spent all that time learning Nuke and they're still using Shake and we had to do the blue screens and everything. And I had no idea what I was doing. And, but luckily they were, you know, b being very nice to, to me and uh, me and my friends that were, were, were joining to do that. But yeah, that was cool. It's just like, oh, this is a real film. It was anamorphic. And you're like, wow, this is amazing. And seeing in the credit and then, you know, going into Roto Paint. But it was still, even at Luma, I was with G. I think G helped uh, get me the job at Luma Pictures. And it was just like big film after big film. It was like, um, well, there was Green Hornet and then uh, Captain America we did and X-Men and all this kind of stuff. And it was just like one after the other. And even though it was like a Roto Paint um uh, title as you were saying like gee like it's still a film and so you're still like oh my god like i've you can feel the foot in the door you know if if there's any measurement of like i'm i'm almost there or you know i'm i've entered the room or the door's open it's like oh i saw the name in the credit right which is really important and i understand why people want to see their name in the credit and as you said josh it kind of kind of wears off later down you, i think you try to put some more like what you did in the film itself holds more weight to you later because you start to realize that, you know, you could work on it for a week and maybe still get your name in the credit and do like a little thing. Whereas if you were somebody who helped shape a scene or a shot and that like it was your creative input, I think that sort of stuff becomes much more valuable and more impactful for you later on. Uh, so that's that's how I feel. But it, it's always fun to see it. I guess, like for for all of us um, that have a passion about this job, um, it did not just come from one day to another. Like I always want to do VFX for film, and it's the first time I'm using a computer. Like most of us probably were using Photoshop or were doing photography or film or something. And at least for me personally, I'm sure for many people it's the same. That the moment you get into a film is like I've been learning so many things for hobby and for just for passion for so many years, and now it's like I'm actually doing film. Like I'm, I'm on a on a cinema and just looking at the film and I'm there in some way. And I think that's the magic kind of moment. It's not just that you've been learning for a year. It's more that you've been developing a, an interest for, for a field for many years, probably. And then you're suddenly into that situation. So when I started, I think uh, I, I was uh, for the first year working in some small Spanish um, films in a studio. It was named uh, Telson. And the first film I, I, I saw my name in was uh, it was called Mama. It was with Penelope Cruz. Um, we did lots of, of stuff there. Even as a, I started doing roto prep, comp, like they gave me the whole thing as I was progressing. And that was nice. That was super nice. I, I watched the premiere and stuff. Then went to... Whoa, you got to go to the I went, premiere. Th that's what you get film. with working in a small studio. <laughs> Holy shit, man. Yeah. And then, then I went to, to London. Uh, the other films that I did in Spain were you know, released uh, later, but then I worked in, in The Martian and all of that. And that was like, just opening Nuke and seeing Matt Damon was Adrian. like, man, <laughs> this is, this is did, crazy. Did you read the book of when The Martian you before you worked on it? Mm, not really. Mm. Cause I was a fan of the book anyway. So that, cause I wanted to work on that film cause I read the book and I was like, oh man, that's a, it's fun to like be a part, part of making something that you're a fan of already. Uh, I was just going to say, speaking of The Martian, Adrian, do you remember this? Oh, the yes, I, they have it. Well, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember yeah, this? The, yeah, yeah. There you go. Some of the, which is another advantage of working in the VFX industry, right? Like you get all this kind of like memorabilia. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, super, super. Cool. Adrian, what's your kind of like yeah. best memorabilia you guys have got Ooh. For, for films and projects? Just mm -hmm. always t-shirts in the hoodies. Hoodies and t-shirts. <laughs> yeah. Hoodies and t-shirts. T-shirts. Yeah. The occasional bag. Some mugs. <laughs> it's always the studio. Um, I, Adrian was talking about uh, the premiere. Actually, it's, I blocked this out of my, my head so. completely. But uh, G probably remembers some occasions. Like we used to get like sometimes visits from the director, actor. I don't know if G was there when uh, Seth Rogen came into Luma Pictures and thanked all of us. Yeah, I was there. Yeah. <laughs> like I, you don't get to really do it outside of like LA or maybe Vancouver or something occasionally. But like in LA, they would have like parties. I went to a, what was it, True Blood? after party and true blood at, i think at zoic or maybe i was a plus one or zoic. Uh, i think it, i think it was a plus one actually but anyways just being in that sphere and going to the party and like seeing actual actors and stuff was a bit <laughs> was a bit of a fun kind of thing in the hollywood sphere i'm not sure if it happens in other places i mean adrian you said it happened in spain so yeah i guess the smaller the studio the smaller the scope of vfx the more chances you just bring even the juniors and 
and everything. And, and did uh, you bring your tuck to London, Adrian? When because uh, you were like, right, there's going to be some epic premieres in London that are going to be going on when uh, I'm at NPC. <laughs> so you had your tucks ready to go at the end of the Martian and stuff. But uh, yeah, it was like a, sorry, oh, what you want to say? Uh, just getting into a huge studio with a huge <laughs> pipeline and a black room, and you know that's like a completely different environment and so enriching to mm. go through different environments and. Yeah, we've talked about this many times. It was fun in the glory days when uh, Sony Imageworks LA was popping because by working there, you had two great incentives. The first one is you would have access to the Sony lot, so where they did their their shooting and stuff. Um, the second is you would get big Sony discounts, and I'm sure that one is still uh, still present today. But it was like 30, 40, 50% on some things and big stuff too, like cameras, not just like bespoke items, oh, yeah, like, anything that was like stuff. a Sony product. But the, the lot was cool because everybody's going in and out of there. One time I was having a lunch with my mate Trip, and I think, I think Max might have been yeah. there, one of our, our previous guests. And uh, out of nowhere... Adam Sandler just walks by in basketball clothes because he just finished playing a basketball game. <laughs> he was like, hey, guys, what's up? Huh? <laughs> you want to play some ball? Oh, man. Then there was another time we had, like, gone there and, like, the Star Trek crew was there. And, like, but they were they were just on their lunch break in between shoots. So, so they were in, the like, the Enterprise getup. Yeah. I mean, it's, so pretty, it's so weird being kind of in that world. Uh, speaking of, like, people from Sony we had got an apartment with a couple of compositors. We were all trying to make it in LA when we first got there. And we were the, in this new apartment that we, we got. It was We were housing a bunch of other people on our couch and stuff. So there's like seven people living in a three-bedroom apartment at one point. And we were having like a little bit... Sounds like LA. <laughs> we were having some some drinks or some party one night. And uh, we, we were not... Uh, we didn't have any jobs, so we were just like fishing for internships and stuff. And uh, we're on our balcony, like, because some people were smoking and stuff. And we heard these two guys walk by, and they were talking about VFX, and they were talking about Sony. And I was like, oh, no way. So I ran out of my apartment down into the street of LA, and I was like, whoa, you, you guys are VFX? And they're like, yeah, we work at Sony Pictures, which is coming back from Atlanta. And I was freaking out. Cause I'm from this like really small town, and I'm uh, and I had just moved to LA. It was like within a month, and I was like, "Oh my god, it's crazy that I can just be on my balcony and hear a VFX artist, a professional VFX artist, walking down the street." <laughs> and I thought that was like the craziest thing coming from like you know, uh, hick town somewhere. <laughs> no offense to my hometown, but but it was just wild. And I, I know that was probably a super rare occasion. But uh, I just, something about that like stuck with me. Of, like, oh, I'm in the right place. This is the place for me um, at that moment, you know, to, to start out. I mean, there are those hubs, aren't there? I, this is what I miss about, because obviously I'm working remotely at the moment. So I miss about working in Soho, London. So it used to be all the studios, and that's changed now. They started moving out, but all the studios used to be in Soho. So you'd go for lunch and you'd be able to hear people complaining about a certain show and every, all the shows have got the, the show names right. So no one else has got any idea what the hell these people are talking about. <laughs> but they're like, oh, FTB on this and on, on this one. And it's, uh, yeah, I miss that. I, I miss the... Getting the gossip and hearing people chat about all this stuff, right? It's, um, well, there'd be everybody... Like each part, I think, the community side of it. Around the pubs in Soho, there'd be like a big street with some pubs and all these companies like MPC and DNEG and Framestore and, yeah. and everything. Uh, they would all come and like like drink in the, in the summertime, like in this outdoor area. And you'd just be mingling with other people in this big yeah. hub. It was super cool. I've done that a, a few times in London. It's something special about that, I think. Yeah, something you miss, I think, with the remote. I mean, that's a, another thing, I guess, about the industry in general, right? Like, you meet people from all around the world, basically. It's uh, which is another amazing thing. Like, you have these close friends with people from all sorts of different countries, so you kind of feel like you could do a whole ton of traveling and just stay with people that you know, right? As as well, and I know you guys have made the most of that. Um, yeah, yeah. Tr where, where is that? I never you? thought that VFX. I didn't get into VFX because I wanted to travel or live abroad or anything. Uh, well, I live abroad from the U.S., but I, once I learned that I could, and that was something that you could do, like it's so addicting to like move around and and sort of you use every place as a hub. So when I was in London, I was traveling all over Europe. When I was in Asia, I was traveling all over Asia. When I was in Australia, I was doing the whole Australia thing. And uh, yeah, it's just it's just crazy the the amount of folks that you meet 
that are from all around the world with a similar passion. And you have to be really a special type of person to get into VFX where you have the like left hemisphere, right hemisphere working together, like technical knowledge of a com how to use a computer properly with the artistic knowledge of how to compose a shot properly. And you, you meet so many like geniuses in any other field they would be considered a genius and they just chose VFX because, you know, that's, that's what they want to do. And that they could probably be making more money somewhere else doing whatever, but they're like, no, nah, I'm just going to do VFX because that's what they want to do. I think that's so, I, I swear the amount of people that I've met that are just absolute geniuses artistically and uh, technically, it's just wild to, to be a part of that community there. It's a unique challenge, isn't it, I think? Like, if you think about everyone that's working on machine learning stuff right now in terms of the coding ability, they don't necessarily care about the creative output. They wouldn't know whether their thing's making better images. They just think that if it's close to real life, it's a better image. But we know in VFX that that's not true. Because if we make real life, then people are like, that nah, doesn't look very good. <laughs> so <laughs> not it's, exciting enough. <laughs> it's a very interesting... So, yeah, exactly. So it's kind of like this... Uh, yeah, it's the, again, exactly as you said, it's this weird blend between the two and kind of your job is always up for debate a little bit in terms of what is it you do? Are you a technical artist and, and this kind of stuff? So I think all of us in this call kind of go between the technical and I think people of various different aspects are technical and creative. But it's really the beauty, the fact that like we are where the two meet, you know, we're like the marriage between the two. Yeah, like something that, that's like a, a great point that what I was thinking uh, apart from the fact that uh, anyone that's purely technical or purely creative will not arrive in this uh, industry, that's combined with the fact that this is not an industry that, at least yeah, for the last 20 years, has been a part of official universities or, or like a direct and obvious way for people to, you know, to pursue a path. So you also have to be a person that has the, you know, has the ability to go out of a usual path and pursue their own way and, and their own random let's see where this takes me and that combined with technical plus creative it like distills a specific collection of profiles that is quite rare uh, in other situations absolutely it's amazing oh, i wanted to touch on uh one kind of final thing that i was just thinking about uh why i got into this or the reason the passion is so strong for vfx it's not quite filmmaking or, or anything I remember the distinct feeling of showing a, a project that I was working on in my like high school auditorium. They let me show a film that I did with some VFX. And I remember that what I was doing, nobody understood how I did it. I was like the ma digital music, uh, <laughs> magician of, v like, of VFX. They were like, how the in the world did you do that? And from all the complaining and I guess negativity that we have with people don't understand what we do and they kind of confuse it. I think that's actually part of the the beauty of it. Like that was the thing that got me in there. So even though we're sort of angry that like, I don't know, the actors or something have no idea what we're doing, that's that's a good thing because, because we're the magicians, right? We can't give away all of our tricks. And even if we tried to give it away, they still maybe wouldn't understand. And people, it's like kind of the skill is so honed in and so special that you really need to be in the world and be diving in for many years to understand what it is that we're doing to make these like crazy images. So I think that is still part of the beauty of like when you see something on the screen and you're like, how the hell do they do that? You know, you see Avatar 2, like how long did this take them? <laughs> like how did they end up pulling this off? And I think that is that is a cool, a cool part of the job. I agree, but one thing we can do better is making people aware that I think there's more artistry and more people out involved. So for instance, in the case of the magician, right? When you don't know how they've done the trick, you think it's all these super complex things and all this super clever things that they've done. And then you see that it's like some mirror that's pointing in a direction or something. <laughs> Whereas I think the, the problem with v when people think of the same thing in terms of magician with VFX is they think they you click a button and it isn't any cleverness and all this kind of stuff. So right. I think uh, that's something we can do a touch better. Yes, we are magicians, but we need to make people aware that, yeah, it's pretty hard to do this trick, if that makes sense. Agreed. Because otherwise, if you just say, oh yeah, how I made it invisible is I click my fingers and it actually went invisible. That's not impressive. But if you, it's all the science and the trickery behind the thing. Yeah. So I think we could do better at promoting less of the technology that's being used and more of the artists that are being used. Absolutely. 
if that makes sense. Like the reason why Andy yeah. Serkis' mocap is so good, yes, he's a good actor, but also maybe there's a ton of people working on the mocap stuff, right? And the mocap suits and, and artistry behind all that stuff. So um, I think the more we can we can do a better job of drawing attention to less of the technical side and more of the creative artist side. Because uh, mm-hmm. that's always, I think, the biggest thing that shocks people when they see what we do. It's like, yeah, I had to frame by frame paint that thing there. For a frame, because of because of the love of it, right? And it's like, why does it look so good? Well, because it took me a day to paint that thing frame <laughs> by frame. So I think it's uh, right. So yeah, I, yeah, yeah. We're yeah, talking and reality and, and reality is, as I sometimes mentioned, it's so complex that there's no single set of tricks that can solve us every single problem. So we have to be completely open to a thousand possibilities for each shot and organically craft a solution that works. And hmm. that takes a lot of artistry from every single person involved. And the whole of film is. Uh, a trick it's not just vfx that is a trick and the digital camera shooting like the lights are changing the environment that the actors like film is all a trick we're just uh, a part of that trick that like we are the complex part of the trick in some way and and the Mm post-production part but that that we are not like some different entity and that's something i think that people should be aware of definitely Mm. so shout out to all the vfx artists uh watching the stream or are watching this video i think that's pretty good and and uh end note on there to it's all about the artists and the hard work frame by frame that they put in. Uh, so uh, thanks for this. And if you want to see more, uh, please look up the VFX Nomad podcast and check us out in some of our other uh, podcasts. So, okay. <laughs> see you guys. I'm St. John Walker, independent VFX advisor and consultant. Welcome to the World VFX Day Training Mega Slide Deck. The concept is simple. The global VFX industry is only as good as its skills. So we asked some of the top VFX schools from around the world to tell us what they are about in five slides, which we collated into the Mega Skills Slide Deck. A few words before we start. The order is purely random. If you're not familiar with these schools, please note the country is labelled in the bottom right corner of each school's title card, but note plenty of them do online courses too, so you may not need to be local. Check them out. Also, we don't claim this is an authoritative list. Some people didn't get back to us, and I'm sure there are great schools we're not aware of. We use recommendations and ranking lists like the rookies and industry themselves to compile our hit list It's not my personal choice. What we do hope is this mega skills slide deck is useful to anyone wanting to get new skills to progress into the VFX industry. Later, with everyone's permission, we'll put this on the World VFX Day website. But for now, enjoy looking at the range of quality VFX training from across the world.
of thanks to the school, uh, we get to have all the department really close and nearby. So whenever uh, Rose is setting up the environment, uh, she will kindly ask me to come check and see uh, how the environment needs to look. We then started look at blocking and how lighting is going to work. The whole thing was, okay, we're building on a 2D, 2D plane. None of this will be 3D elements, it's all 2D. Uh, so the way comp will work, we'll build back to front. We'll start with your background, build into the mid-ground, then we get your foreground. But many times, I think it was sort of a cross-pollination cross thing. And even if I haven't seen it, I knew what was the intention and what I was meant to see. Yeah, I mean, it's no, it's no easy task getting something just to fit seamlessly across, across you know, all these different shots. Um, so it is, it takes time, but, but we got there, which is always nice. We, we knew we wanted it to be like a spirit bit, um, but then it was like the colour choice and how we wanted it to kind of look. The whole animation process was kind of making the bear, if we'd say, like kind of dopey, as in like slow movements and like slow blinks, just to give it that kind of innocent kind of feeling to it.
Really? Well done, Zane. Thanks for putting that together. Well, I, I kind of thought it was important to remember that, you know, VFX is, you know, always changing, always moving the technology um, and the workflows always move. And, you know, at the motor of all this is skills. And all around the world, there's some amazing institutions doing some amazing things. And often, you know, outside of the VFX world, not really recognized. So we tried to collect them all together. Uh, those that we knew about, because obviously it's, you know, not an authoritative list. It's not my top 20, uh, although, you know, uh, we love them all dearly. Um, but it's important that we recognise that this motor for the industry is a lot of the time universities and colleges. So uh, all respects to them and thank, thanks to all of them for donating their five slides. I know it must have been crazy to get a, uh, an email out of the blue from some mad Englishman going, can I have five slides from you which describe your philosophy? Uh, thank you. And uh, most of them just... Um, took me at my word and uh, did it. <laughs> well, that, oh, that well. was great. Uh, do, we, do we have any questions for Saint here? Or, or thank you so much for putting that together, Saint. That was actually amazing to see. And there's well, a lot of information have a there, life. So. Yeah, it'll have a life after today, obviously, on the yeah. World VFX uh, Day website. And yeah, uh, there was a, there was a so, lot of questions. There was a lot of questions on the on the chat about if this was going to be available, and it is. Like the entire stream, so that everyone knows, will be as a VOD, and I will put in chapters so that anyone can go. Because of course, scrubbing eleven hours is quite tricky. So I'll put chapters for every single thing we saw today, so you can go directly to that thing, uh, you know. And the, that yeah, thing would be one of the skills, uh, and, megas. And some of those slides. You can't possibly read in in the kind of time available. So <laughs> that was not that was never the intention. You know, the slides will exist so you can read them at your own leisure later on. Cool. Nice. I have a question. Um about free resources. Um obviously times are tough mm. at the moment. Um, not everyone has the extra funds to to kind of put in some research mm. uh, and training on themselves, but um are there any sort of standout free courses that you recommend? Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't think that I, I can, but what I would say is, you know, go to all those, those, those places that were listed are kind of honeypots of talents and teaching talent and go to them first to see what, what they're doing. Uh, I know, for instance, uh, uh, my old stomping, stomping ground of escape sometimes do free courses. Uh, so look out for all all of, of those courses. Um, but you know, it, it, unless these places get their own funding, it's very hard to run a free course because it does cost money. Yeah. Uh, so I, I I do feel sorry for uh, people who who obviously can't afford and maybe don't want to do a, a whole degree. But check out those those websites first of all um, and see what's available for free. Yeah. And then in your in your research. Ooh. Oh, can I also say just in the, uh, I, I know this is, sorry, this is very UK centric, but check out screenskills.com. Sometimes they have, uh, uh, they fund free VFX courses as well. Sorry, carry on. <laughs> yeah, just one more question from me. Um, in your research, um, do you think that uh, there is, there are plenty of training in different corners of the world? Is it quite diverse in terms of the offering out there? Yeah, I think the, what I've noticed over the last, say, five years is the quality of teaching and the quality of the, the work coming out of these places has has increased uh, to, to, you know, uh, orders of magnitude. And I think that's partly to do with, with how industry itself is now feeding back into education. And a lot of these places that you've, you've just seen the slides of, they get industry in to talk and they get industry in to design the courses. And so industry is a lot closer now to education than it ever used to be. Um, I think there are still areas, and obviously this I'm no authority. Uh, I'd love to hear from anybody who thinks their school from somewhere else in the world hasn't been represented and should be. You know, send me an email and I'd like to sort of correct that um, so we have a, a more representative um, sort of um, slideshow. And maybe it'll be an hour long for next year. <laughs> <laughs> I have I have a, qu a quick question for you, uh, Saint. 
So the, someone on the chat was asking, what was your background? Obviously, the, uh, the obvious answer is it's, that it's, it's orange. Yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but no, they were asking where you, you know, what, where did you came from? What was your background until you got to the place where you are, you are now? Well, I guess my my interest has always been to try and I've always been involved with teaching. I've always been involved with teaching at higher education levels, at high university levels. But the trick has always been to have dialogues with industry and ensure that industry gets the kind of skills and talent they need. And that's kind of a creative thing because you have to create new courses. You have to create new modules to make it all work. You can't just do a traditional university course and get these skills so i've always been working out that interface between vfx industry and vfx training yeah absolutely and that's how we met actually. and i've been doing it for years i know everybody I know. out there i am so old <laughs> i was just i was just about to say that you have been really around for a long time but i wasn't going to say that but yeah, yeah. no saint has been amazing he's been work, working for a long long time in education from some scape to norwich university that's i think that's where i met you or maybe even was you before mm -hmm. that we've known each other for a long time um cool <laughs> and thank you for having me and thank you for letting me uh show this uh um this mega skills slide deck thanks a lot <laughs> it was mega so it was, it was mega yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay cool uh, thanks 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 Haley, particularly for kicking this off and uh you know we started our journey at the uh, view conference in uh, italy a couple of months ago and look at where we've got to so thank you very much amazing yeah. such amazing support so thank you yeah thank you so much Sam. cool excellent Okay, so we are now going to continue, and next up we have Trickster coming with a talk about Loki, so that should be cool. Uh, and then after that we have, yeah, well, we'll continue. <laughs> we'll come back and tell you about all of it. So I'll see you all very soon. Happy World Visual Effects Day. My name is Chris Smallfield, and I'm a visual effects supervisor at Trickster. And presenting with me today is Gero Grimm, FX supervisor. Today, we want to show you a little bit of insight behind the work we did on Loki Season 2.
Back in 2022, Marvel reached out to Trickster to get us to do some work on Season 2. We had worked on Season 1 with Allison Paul, the VFX producer, and she had returned for Season 2. New this time was Chris Townsend, uh, who we've worked with on Shang-Chi and several other projects, who was the overall VFX supervisor. The scope of work on this season was even bigger, which is always a lot of fun, of course, um, and but with that fun comes big challenges. And the scope of work we did on this season was we worked on about 220 shots across all six episodes um, with about 230 or so uh, team members from Trickster. These include artists, people in production, coordinators, IT, pipeline. Um, it was a really great team. Uh, and that was the only thing that made it possible, of course, to work it out. And uh, yeah, in the end, we're really proud of the work. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that now. As many of you know, working in visual effects is uh, challenging, but also quite exciting, especially when you get something, a concept that has been developed that is really completely unusual, uh, completely new. That, of course, makes it more difficult, but that's why we do what we do. Um, in this case, the big set piece that we were working on that was probably the biggest challenge was the loom. Um, if you've seen season two, you know what a, ro what a big role the loom takes uh, in the show. It is a pretty complex asset. Essentially, all of the timelines from season one have begun branching infinitely. Um, into a giant mess, and the loom is trying to make sense of this mess, but is being overloaded. Um, thousands and thousands of strands of time uh, are being woven back together uh, by this enormous, enormous loom. Uh, it's about the size of Central Park. Uh, so the scale, both physically uh, in terms of size and in terms of complexity, was extremely high on this asset. To add to the effects of um, the timelines, one thing that really helped to sell the scale was embedding it into volume. So just even around the curves, it's it's very subtle, but it really does help breaking up a little bit and creating that subtle detail that you really need. Like if you be that far away and filming something that massive. Um, in terms of rendering, uh, one key thing was optimizing the lights. That was really helped us bring down the render times, especially. Um, optimizing them in terms of the max radius like since we're rendering physically based um even though it's barely black they still kind of cause uh you know secondary bounces all that kind of stuff and that adds up to very high render times very quickly and also it makes the noise um hard to control having that many lights that are you know physically based that bright in certain parts and then very dim at the other parts <laughs> Um, in terms of the noise that we had to control, especially with having thin, thin lines that are very colorful, um, we added, we rendered them in double res, and then Comp would be able to control that a little better in terms of um, the sampling in 2D, um, removing some of the artifacts that you get when you have just yeah, all these lines. Um, and um, yeah, one thing that we really learned was also really hard, like lights and this kind of skill. He's very funny. Um, and uh, so we really relied heavily still on Matra that gave us a little bit more um, control in terms of lights, um, kind of like creatively tweaking them a little bit more um, and not basing it all on pure physics. Another creative challenge that the Loom presented was that it needed to be presented in uh, three different stages. So one where it's starting to malfunction, one where everything is going quite wrong, um, and then a third where the loom itself is just in catastrophic meltdown. Um, in addition to this, due to the time travel nature of the show, we sometimes had to show these various phases um, uh, multiple times in slightly different ways. Um, so not, not every time could something be reused. We had to sometimes make a bespoke setup for many different shots. Um, Thankfully, the way that our effects team developed the asset, uh, it was possible to do this. Um, and then uh, Comp was able to fill in the gaps and make sure 
that we had a unique look for each stage of the loom, as well as um, something that was driven by more or less the same asset, just in, in, a, in a different state. Beyond the loom itself, another very complicated effect that we had to work on was um, what happens to some of the characters as they need to go and try to repair the loom. Uh, in order to do that, they have to exit the safe, safe space of the TVA and walk down uh, a very long gangplank towards a launcher that will then launch a specific tool to help expand the loom. Um, the trick here is that uh, where they are is kind of anti-space, anti-time. Uh, they're outside of space and time, and as a result, uh, their presence is offensive to physics, apparently. Um, so there are reactions uh, of the environment upon the characters. Uh, they have protective suits. Uh, there's a giant tube going to the back of their, uh, their sort of retro spacesuits that streams linear time into the suit um, to keep them alive uh, in this very hostile environment. But uh, since the loom is malfunctioning so terribly, uh, the environment is also reacting. Uh, and the suit is not really capable long term of protecting the people from the environment. As a result, the suits are degrading um, more and more throughout the, the series. Uh, the, as the loom gets more and more unstable, the effect becomes more and more pronounced and dramatic tearing holes in the suit, revealing underlayers. Um, obviously, these are things you can't do practically. Uh, they did shoot uh, uh, a person in a suit, and, uh, and we did use uh, all of the actor's performance, especially in the motion. But in most cases, we actually replaced the entire body um, so that we would have an easier time applying our effects to the CG character. So what did the brief mean for effects? One thing that was very, very clear um, when talking about realism, it really had to feel that the cloth is tearing it, tearing into pieces. So turning into, you know, cloth is moving, parts, parts, flakes come off, and then those later turn into dust and then dissipate. Um, so one single sim didn't do it. Had to have like several uh, staggered sims that were um, needed. Also the effect itself, on the suit was not, uh, it couldn't be self illuminating, colorful, all that kind of stuff. Um, of course, around him, you'll see here, there's a lot of colorful effects that kind of show like the energy around him, but the effect on the suit was just pure realistic. The effects might sound simple, but um, especially the disintegration of the suit did cause a little bit of a headache. Um, you know, everyone knows Houdini, we, have, we, you know, like the growing effect. Doing this on points uh, might look cool, might get quick results, but it actually the problem was all the detail that we have in the texture, those, those were NK textures of all the holes and all this like intricate detail, as you can see uh, in here, um, was not possible to do on points. Like would have been possible, we would have had so many points that it would have been very slow and tedious to, to render. So what we realized or what we tried and it actually worked quite well is uh, deforming the UVs. Um, of course, we only deformed, uh, we created a new UV set and we deformed this UV set and then vectored it basically to make those holes grow. Um, it's hard to describe, so I'm gonna let me open up Houdini and I will show this one how we did it in Houdini. Um, so we got in the geometry, we did some kind of calculation, calculate this um, hole size, for example. Smaller holes we wouldn't advect, like we would just kind of leave them as they are, and especially the big holes that are important, we would then um, um, disintegrate. Um, so yeah, we would get a texture from uh, from texturing that we want to use. This is kind of like you can see here. This is the alpha map that we got from them, applied it to them, to the texture, just kind of like see in geometry in 3D where the holes are. And then we would basically use those points and um, gonna go here and bu 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 would put those points, those are the X UVs, would put those the UV into point space. So you can see here now we stop all those holes um, 
add everything still here. And um, once this was one there, we can kind of then do just point-based approaches to kind of deform those uh, UVs. And um, which was fairly simple in a way. We would just go from, as you can see here, we have, we have those points and we would basically, that's something that we, um, so instead of having, moving the points away from the hole, in this time, because it's UVs, you have to go the other way around. So you have to move the points towards the hole. Um, the reason why we also used the different UV set, of course, we didn't want to affect all the, uh, the diffuse maps, the specular map, all those kinds, of, they needed to stay the same. So lighting would basically apply the UV set only for the opacity map. The opacity map was also um, static. So we didn't get animated uh, textures for this. We just do, do that. Um, and once we were happy with the approach, we can see here, the points are moving towards the holes. Because it is a point-based approach, we can very easily just use point operators um, to, for example, soften it out, all that kind of stuff. Um, but as you can see here, it's very quick. You can see immediately the result um, in UV space. And then we would just basically copy that on the mesh. Um, you can see here now, if we display the UVs, we set two. You can see here that the UVs now look exactly like we did in 3D. Now this time they're actually on the UV attributes. Um, and one thing that also helped for us to getting, because we had a lot of those shots that helped was um, instead of doing actually cross them, uh, we would use the holes and wherever around the holes, we just kind of use a gradient to the distance of the hole and then deform and just basically with like a couple of noises, make the uh, mesh uh, move. And because we had so many effects on top of it and the motion was always complexer from what he did, it was totally enough um, to have those. And you can see here, um, it totally did its job. Um, no need for Clossum. Um, and uh, yeah, and then once we were, you can see here, we have the Closs mesh. And then we would apply the texture. We would kind of preview it. Of course, we wouldn't export it that highly subdivided. We would just export it uh, with the mess that we would work in. But that one kind of gave us the visualization how the holes actually behave and how they would look closer in rendering. Um, and um, the final result takes a bit of time. Again, here you can already clearly see why we uh, didn't do a point-based only approach. You can already see here. Um, how many points you would need to display it properly. And voila, now you would have here the cloth. And uh, I already prepared a play blast of it. And you can see here, the UVs are moving and shrinking the holes or inc increasing the holes. And on top of that, we have the procedural animation or the, you know, with the noises and it looked sufficient at the end. So that was just two aspects of the many that we worked on on Loki season two. Um, we worked on quite a lot more effects, assets, environments, um, interesting comp things, other effects things. And uh, yeah, but that concludes the talk that we have here. I would be remiss if I did not point out um, a couple key people that also worked on this project with us. VFX producer, Agustina Arcando, comp supervisor, Igor Majdanchik, CG supervisors Angle Ivanov and Sumesh Kumar Somnath, and so many more people that I would love to thank as well. Um, and we're printing their names here so you can you can see them. You know who you are. I'm very thankful for the work that you've done. Um, Trickster thanks you as well, and see you on the next one.
It is time for the emergence to begin. Hello, everybody. Oh, sorry. Um, I was muted for a second there, so apologies for that. Uh, a lot of buttons to press. <laughs> As you can <laughs> see, like I have, I have quite a lot of buttons here to press everywhere on in front of me. I have like I'm covered with lights and things like that. <laughs> um, so um, welcome to the radio show today. Um, yeah. So thank you so much for for all the lovely messages on the chat. It's been lovely to be to spending. We've been now on for four hours and a half, <laughs> so it's great. We've had some fantastic talks and some fantastic panels, and we still have a lot more to go. Um, I just wanted to mention that I've shared on the chat again the giveaways we have. The giveaways are up and running until midnight, so you have until midnight to sign up to uh, my online new course and then the three license that the Foundry was so kind to share. And talking of the Foundry, I'm just going to share real quick a video uh, from the Foundry just to as a, a thank you to the Foundry for giving away uh, these licenses for everyone on the audience. So I'm gonna I'm gonna play that real soon. It's just one minute long, so then I'll be uh, we'll be right back. Foundry's Nuke is the industry standard tool for compositing in the film and TV industry. We've produced and curated all the essential resources for learning Nuke and preparing you for the profession, as well as recommendations for other training resources. You'll learn compositing fundamentals, rotoscoping, keying, tracking objects, color management, 3D compositing, and much more. Our objective is to empower artists with all the knowledge they need to push their skills to the next level. Jump in and start learning today. Okay, we are back now. So thank you so much, Foundry. And I've posted the link again on the chat for the giveaway. So thank you so much for them over there for giving us the licenses. And yeah, I guess that's it, isn't it, Ellie? It's exciting. It's, it's going really well. Yes, <laughs> super exciting. Thank you all for joining us um, for this first ever World VFX Day. Um, we really want to make this what you want it to be. And um, so 
we're really happy with today's event um but watch out for more things and do send your feedback through the worldvfxday.com website um i will read everything eventually and um <laughs> use that to form future events. So yeah, please do get in touch. And just wanted to shout out to Michael from amiafilmmaker.com for creating the World VFX Day stinger that you see in between some of the talks. And um, just to give you a couple of stats, we have over 250 supporters and studios and company supporters around the world. And I haven't finalized these stats, but last count we had over 60 countries represented um so yeah it's been really amazing seeing all of your support coming through so thank you yeah absolutely it's been amazing to to it's just been great on the chat people also talking to each other so we keep the questions coming as well whenever we have a session we're trying our best to bring the questions into the speakers as well and and yeah it's it's just been great so we, we have still a couple of minutes to go before the next talk so yeah. Um, but yeah, don't forget to um, share your show reels and work on social media using the World VFX Day hashtag. Uh, we will share those and um, yeah, share any photos if you're getting together with um, colleagues or friends afterwards to celebrate. Um, then yeah, just uh, tag us and, and we'll share that as well. It's great to see everything so far and um, people at the studio having a little party <laughs> um, or people at home just getting together uh, remotely. So yeah, it's really, it's a really good excuse to just open up conversations and, and get together. So thank you for that. Cool. Excellent. I've just posted, uh, I just put it on the screen, the join tag thing so that people can join in and send a show reel as well. So um yeah i guess i guess oh thank you so much for all the love everyone saying that it's going really well that's great thanks mm -hmm. sean for moderating and also i would really like to thank all the moderators that came in today so we had sean moderating we also had sajel moderating thanks so much sajel uh and i know it's tough for you because you just had a a, a baby so congratulations on that <laughs> but um and uh, also like of course ian was moderating here for a while as well and of course Haley has been here all day long as well so thank you so much for that. Uh, but yeah, we're getting, we're really, I'm really over, I don't have words really to describe. I'm, thank you so much for all the little hearts and everything going on here. <laughs> it's great to see. Yeah, it's really good to see. Um, well, we've got a live talk coming up at half past 12 with Neha Huda from Pickstone Images, who's going to be talking about sustainability, equity, diversity, and representation from uh, an Asian perspective. And she's joining us live from India. So stay tuned for that. Cool. Excellent. So I guess we'll we'll just uh, stick around for uh, I'll, I'll put just the, the, um, the image up and we'll be right back with our talk. OK, thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us in for the first World VFX Day. Uh, it warms my heart uh, so much that, you know, that such wonderful conversations are happening uh, on, you know, things that are so important to visual effects. My name is Neha Huda. I executive produce visual effects at Pixstone Images. We are an India-based studio and we serve clients globally. And our majority work that we're doing is international, so we're not really involved with Indian productions which makes this conversation so much more interesting. Um, I think the conversation about sustainability, equity, diversity, and inclusion has been going on uh, for a very, very long time. And it's, it's, it's really interesting that a lot of panels uh, that we have, a lot of conferences, I think they're really the first stepping stone of bringing about the change we wanna see. But uh, I think we need to look at a conversation from a little larger perspective um, I think one of the most interesting panels we've had today has also been about, you know, um, even saying that, you know, that visual effects is in fact part of the film work that we do. And I think I'm going to tie up my conversation to that. And, um, you know, it's about, it's about having the need for visibility. It is so important we have that. And I think uh, the conversation about sustainability, equity, diversity, and representation uh, does not necessarily come into action until and unless we really understand that how it ties up with agency, how it ties up with how we, have, we as you know VFX collective, as VFX professionals across the world are involved in the filmmaking process. So any uh, project that you look at, you know, whether it's a film, whether it's a episodic or commercial, uh, the outsource industry is something, you know, that's a very, very dominant model um that based on which you know the visual effects industry stands and india happens to be one of those very very strong grounds where this kind of work uh, happens so it's very important to see that when we're talking about how we can bring uh, aspects of uh, esg sustainability into a workforce not only from a point of you know you know checking off boxes but from a point of view of actual applicability but looking at uh, it, it's so important to you know include in conversation people from the other part of the world, which is you know the east part of the world, and you know uh, countries like India. And I think uh, it's 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 really interesting that this panel that we are having today is the first World VFX Day. It looks very inclusive to me because you know we have people joining in from across different parts of the world. So how? Uh, conversation about sustainability, equity, and diversity is important. Uh, it's not just about having panels on it, but you know, having actual actionable items across the world when we see that things are changing in the world, uh, you know, environment is changing, climate change is a very, very real thing. Uh, it impacts the film business in a very, very big way. This last week itself, uh, we had a situation of cyclones and floods in China, India, and you know, that's one region of the world, and it's not just of the country, which is, a, which is a of interest for a lot of people who are doing business. Um, so if we are not going to create uh, frameworks in which we are consciously actioning aspects of uh, things that, you know, make our, uh, you know, working a lot more sustainable, I think it's going to be a very, very trouble spot. And I think how this conversation ties up into uh, us having a larger say in what we are doing, um, you know, in, in the industry and how visual effects professionals are perceived in the global framework of film production work. Uh, it's about having the right visibility. It's about having the right conversations. And the most important thing, it is also about, you know, talking about how Talent needs to be, you know, made more visible. It, uh, and when I say talent, uh, I'm talking about inclusivity of people who are coming from different uh, places. You know, this could relate with gender, it could relate with race, it could relate with so many different things. And I think this conversation uh, that we're standing at a time today where it's so important for us to come as a collective because we are having to even contest that you know, visual effects is actually a part of the real work that we're doing. And I think that says something to the state of affairs that we're standing in. There's so much hard work that goes into the work that we're doing across the globe. 
but when it comes to uh, larger conversations of how a film is produced or how you know how post production happens i think a lot of factors are not accounted for and i think a lot of it has to do with the agency we as vfx professionals have so uh, talking about what can be the possible actionable steps that you know we can take up to make uh, our workflows a little more better to ensure that you know we are marching into the future in a sustainable way uh, i think it begins i'm going to touch about uh, on a few key initiatives you know that we have been doing at pickstone and my hope is that you know maybe it inspires a few more other people to join in the conversation and really look at how we're producing our shows from a different perspective and bring esg sustainability not just as a component of csr but as a main component of the work that we do i'll begin with the uh, inclusion and diversity uh, which is something very very important um across the world we know the representation of people who are usually underrepresented underrepresented in you know our workforce especially you know on the creative side for women uh, in particular it happens to be abysmally low generally speaking when we are having a lot of conversations a lot of reporting work that happens uh, last week i mean this week earlier you know there was a audiovisual report that i came across uh, from the european region and there are so many other uh, places the conversation does not necessarily include a global uh, you know footprint in it and it's so important that if we are to truly talk about having real change in the world we have to look at we have to step back and look at that you know how things are tied up any project that is happening uh, probably in america or probably in europe it ends up getting into some sort of a circular economy where you know work is shared between studios artists are spread across so all of this accounting that we end up doing a lot of you know green reporting work that ends up happening does not really include uh, the work that is happening uh, you know in other parts of the world that are not europe and america and i think there lies the key to kind of have sort of account accountability for the kind of representation we have for the kind of inclusivity that we have it's so important also to talk about uh, the impact on local communities that we have and i think it begins with home and when i say home i'm talking about the local community of the immediate studio environments that we have the visual effects business is known to be very very prone to uh, high high pressures and you know deadlines that kind of uh, just everybody needs things yesterday you know so i think if we are not going to be mindful as we march into the future with ai and everything coming in it's going to be a difficult time for everybody so when i am saying that you have to ensure as a framework that you're providing enough adequate support be it in terms of mentoring be it in terms of well being initiatives that are targeted not just at the mental well being but at the, at the emotional well being of the people you know who are in the system health and safety remains a very very important aspect and again the conversation has to be inclusive so when uh, teams are uh, you know across the world are part of a project it's not just that you know these boxes are being checked off in one corner of the world but uh, you know in other corners of the world also and i think it really is uh, coming from a place where if we as a collective start being conscious of the impact we have on things this becomes a very very uh, different conversation for us at pickstone uh, we've been very mindful of a few things when it comes to uh, ensuring what kind of sustainability we have in terms of you know the environment there are a few key initiatives that we've been taking up so one is the water management uh, program that we have whereby you know we are using uh, the water which is the waste water of the office and we're using we're kind of recycling it and using it uh, to water the plants that are within you know the building premises in terms of energy efficiency uh, and the usage of uh, energy that we use part of our electricity comes from use of windmills and these are very very small efforts but they are coming from very conscious choices and it helps us uh, you know be more sustainable in the future and it impact the environment and the local community in a positive way uh this year we've seen our studio you know in a very very focused way come up with three key programs one is called pickstone bridges another is called pickstone creative fund 
and one more is called the Pickstone Emerging Talent Program. And all of these programs, they are action-oriented uh, programs, you know, which are involving people from our studio, people from outside of our studio, where the idea is to, you know, create initiatives that can help us bring conversations about diversity, representation for women, visibility for women, and talk about conversations such as the one that we're having right now, and we don't have enough of these generally in our framework, you know, and make them an actual part of our workflow. We've been spending time, energy, and resources in supporting projects, be it coming from independent filmmakers or be it coming from big streamers, where we're consciously trying to support projects where uh, people are able to talk about stories that are local to the region, which is generally speaking a non-American narrative, uh, where we've been spending energy and time in focusing uh, on projects where representation of women is not just on screen enough, but you know also behind the screen. Uh, so I think these are very very simple sim uh, initiatives. Uh, you know when it comes to rendering, uh, you know and seeing that you know how we can be more effective. We've been trying to move a little more towards real time rendering uh, softwares that help us save energy, that help us save time, and uh, you know th this is you know what we're building up a three D workflow on. And overall, I think uh, these are deeper discussions, and uh, and it's so important that you know when when we come on board, conscious of the kind of impact we have on our environment, on our social systems, and ju just generally, you know, how governance is working in our in studios and environment. I think we are able to contribute a lot more effectively uh, to the work that we are doing. It's also important to. Uh, see that you know this is this effort just doesn't come to life just by one studio coming into power uh, you know and doing all of this stuff this this work becomes a lot more effective when we as a collaborative uh, industry become mindful because uh, climate change is real it's happening you like it or not this is happening you can't put it off to tomorrow you know you can't put off conversations about diversity equal pay representation giving opportunities that support people who are generally underrepresented uh, you know, in some sort of a corner or, you know, just do check boxes for that matter. These have to be real actions. So what we also do is in order to, you know, make our uh, workflow more efficient, uh, we try, you know, and these are just simple things that everybody can possibly do. We try and ensure, you know, that we get enough and clear understanding, you know, when we're sitting with clients and this helps us, uh, you know, save a lot of energy and time and effort and again, you know, this ties up with the way, you know, we are using energy in our system, uh, the way we're using electricity, because, you know, more rendering, more passes means more waste. So we've been focused towards, you know, uh, cutting down our digital waste. Uh, these are things that I think kind of remain a work in progress. They don't get up, get done just in one time. So I'm more than happy and looking forward to, you know, connecting with colleagues globally who would be open to conversations uh, with us about these aspects and you know as a collective things that you know we can do i think having panels like these is a starting point but this must definitely lead to some sort of actionable items one fifth of world's population resides in india and generally speaking uh, the kind of numbers that we see uh, you know in studios in india range from anything you know like a 50 to a 200 seat of studio is is kind of a general range or uh, number of people that we have and these numbers are very very different from the kind of studio setups and i'm saying that these are studio setups which are for studios you know who are still coming out studios who are somewhere in the middle and studios you know that are very very established names uh, they are of course there so, and these numbers, the sheer size of the population of, you know, VFX professionals that are from India or, you know, that reside and work in India, uh, it, it's really, really huge. And I think uh, these numbers may be, you know, a little uh, bigger than, you know, what a typical size of a studio in other parts uh, of the Western world might be. So if we are to really see conversations come to life, uh, it's very important that, you know, when we are trying to, uh, you know, do business between different parts of the world, 
the right questions are being asked, whether as a client or as a vendor, which you know bring into focus the requirement, not just from a point of view of that this is a statutory requirement, but as a conscious choice of having. And I think oftentimes uh, it is just asking the right questions with the people about you know what kind of energy consumption do you have, uh, you know what is the representation that you know that you have in your workforce. And I think uh, if we come together as a collective, then it really, really becomes possible to see the kind of change that happens in the industry. And then I, this again ties up, you know, because we've been talking about, uh, um, you know, that about 500 people uh, who have worked on a feature film project, but, you know, a lot of directors say they, they are not really there. So you're really fighting, you know, for your place on the table. but I think the numbers are still so represented in a, in a very, very skewed manner when you know, even it comes to credits. The number of outsourced vendors who end up working on projects globally, they never even get their credit. So what I'm trying to you know, bring to focus here is that uh, conversations about having the right visibility, conversations about having the right inclusivity are very, very important. And I think when we as a collective become mindful of uh, the kind of impact that we have and the kind of value that we're adding. And it can't just happen, you know, in some parts of the world and other parts of the world, uh, you know, these conversations are not happening. The East and West have to meet the standards of visibility, the standards of, uh, you know, diversity and inclusion. They may not always be, um, you know, the same across the world because there's so many factors to, you know, count in. But, it's very, very important to still, you know, work in that direction and make sure that, you know, we ask the right questions, you know, when we are holding business between studios, uh, you know, when we're, you know, negotiating on so many other aspects of things. And I think sometimes when people are mindful, all of beca this becomes a possibility, all of this becomes real. I think if we as a collective are able to really focus on these kind of aspects, it becomes possible for us to have a larger, or you know, a more prominent place in the pipeline of you know making films work, and where we won't even have to kind of possibly in some day uh, not talk about you know no CGI kind of conversations because there are so many of us, and I think as a collective we need to come together. Um, it's also important. Uh, I feel that when it comes to uh, having the right parity of uh, opportunities or the right parity of things you know i mean it's so interesting and uh, you know a part of the world uh, you know with the strikes they've been fighting for better conversations about uh, you know what they can take home you know what their renovations can be and whereas on the visual effects part of the world it's 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 a sad state of affairs that oftentimes studios uh, kind of uh, end up creating some sort of like a price war where, you know, instead of going up the value chain and asking for better, uh, everything is kind of, you know, going down and, you know, it becomes a conversation of, you know, who does it cheaper and who does it fast, who does it faster and how that impacts is that, you know, when people are not being paid the market rate, just because they are not within a certain Western European, um, you know, space of work or, you know, statutory requirements, just because you know uh, they can do it cheaper, the burnouts are high. You know uh, the kind of re pressure it puts on resources is high. The wastage is a lot more. And I think again, if we as a collective can uh, be mindful of you know how relationships are working, and how you know the Western conversation of business is working on the Eastern side, I think we will see a very very different world of special effects that comes into place. And I think that's about for my conversation. I don't know how much time do I have left with me. You've got you've got um, another ten minutes. We okay. can ask questions. Yes, I think that would be great. We can ask questions. Great. And uh, let me just go to the live chat. Yeah, so someone said collectivity is key, which is, yeah, very, very poignant. How can the average individual get involved? 
it is the easiest thing you know and that's the beauty of this work i know when we talk about esgs this looks like such a mountain of thing that how as an individual you know we can go but you know i'm talking from a place of actually actioning this work say for instance you know uh, it doesn't take too much of an effort you know when we're into a producing meetings it doesn't take too much of an effort to go on the route of taking digital notes in place of doing paper notes it doesn't take too much of an effort to you know when you're working because cpus consume so much power when everything is super bright turning on to like a dark mode and i think uh, for newer businesses that are coming about and i think with the current changes in the industry that have happened a lot of people are uh, you know going on a route of setting up their own places the kind of partners you bring on board you know whether they are eco friendly or not what are their policies you know how governance works with them how sustainability i think it becomes sometimes uh, it can't just happen because there is a union that enforces or there is a government that enforces and this happens i think the key is in making those small efforts say for instance i'll give you a simple example so um so these three initiatives uh, you know the pixstone emerging talent fund uh, program and the creative fund and bridges you know these have been labors of love for me in the last one year and when i first started looking out for projects and uh, i would only get men coming out uh to me and not coming out i mean you know men coming up with the projects and when i would ask them that you know what's the visibility that you have for women so they would have somebody on screen okay great and i would ask them what about behind the screen and say oh we have somebody uh doing makeup and costume but these are not positions of uh you know uh, prominence so these are not positions that give women the visibility or agency to build a better future for themselves right so i think this started off uh, earlier this year and i think when we started having these conversation a lot of these people i met they became aware of it so when they started uh coming up with you know how they were growing up because some of these projects were in development they were conscious about these facts that hey you know we need to get some more women and it's not just because any you need to check mark sometimes it can be that some people because they need to get some sort of funding support to do it so across these three programs uh Pixstone as a studio, we are putting a part of our profits to support these initiatives because you know we are committed to having more diversity, more representation, more visibility uh, for women and people who are generally underrepresented in the craft of storytelling. And I have seen a gradual change coming. So all it took for me was to have that right question and ask. It's simple, you know. Yeah, that sounds great. I love all the work that you're doing. Um. How can studios kind of collectively get involved? I think obviously a hot topic right now is unionization. Yeah. Do you yeah. have anything like that in India? I know that you're usually in Hungary, aren't you? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah. Right now, um, what's your take on that? And is it a good way to to build on what um, you were talking about today? I think uh, unionization is a important aspect, but this only works when we as a collective come together. So what you know in whether you know you look at any green reporting whether you look at uh, conversations about we need to have x amount of time when we're producing shows you know we need to have x amount of budgets to be able to do this work uh, this work cannot happen if you don't take half of your workforce and when i'm saying half of your workforce i'm not thinking studio abc i'm thinking half of the workforce is sitting in america and europe and half of the, and more than half of the workforce and i think some of the biggest studios you know they have uh you know their offices in india also so this conversation doesn't come into force until and unless east and west start meeting on the same platform as partners in the process a typical thought process when it comes to and you know uh, you, we all see enough you know on linkedin and that there's this thought process because it's outsourced models so probably you know these artists are not as great as you know those somebody sitting i think sitting according to a geography it's a mental thing right you can't just kind of say switch it off that because somebody sitting in this part of the world and probably they don't know their work or you know they 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 don't know what they're talking about it doesn't work that way so they have to meet unionization is great but unionization is just somebody else i think you can't outsource your responsibility and your accountability as a content maker as a media professional as a vfx professional into doing this kind of stuff and i think a simple thing would be uh, and i have had the pleasure of working with some great clients 
where sometimes if I have undercoated, they would tell me, Neha, you've undercoated. Get the right price. And this is something very practical, but typically that doesn't happen. Generally, studios on the sides of the world, you know, they're putting against one, uh, one studio against uh, the other and they're saying, hey, they're giving it cheaper, so we're going to do it here. So I think as partners in the process, if you say, hey, this is the benchmark, and if we as an industry can set up a benchmark that this is the kind of uh, you know work standard that we have, this has to come not only from unions, but from people who are in the workforce as mm. well. Yeah. Okay, thank you for that. Um, we've got, got a few questions coming in now. I'm just keeping one eye on the live chat. Um, oh, sure. There's been a couple of questions about render farms. I think someone uh, yeah. probably jokingly said, can we stop clients from uh, <laughs> requesting so many changes? <laughs> that might- Yeah, yeah. I, um, think, I think it's a very, very important question because this again ties up with you know, energy efficiency. I remember I was doing a wonderful project and it was at the end of the project that, you know, we were requested to submit a green report. We were not asked to submit this green report before the project, but luckily for this kind of system we have, we already have, you know, better systems. So the key is sit down with your clients uh, and have a very clear and deep discussion with them exactly what they're looking for. Have the right workflows. So when you have the right workflows and have the confidence to say a no, that this is not okay, this is gonna to lead to waste. And I think the way to explain to people is when you put it in terms of money, everything is money, everything is a mandate rate, you know? So if you, uh, I think when you explain it that way, you know, your timelines of production become better, the kind of digital waste you end up having that becomes better. So again, it boils down to having the right conversations, deep, clear conversations about what the task is. Yeah. Thank you. Um, that kind of leads on to one of my questions, which was, mm -hmm. um, have you seen an increase in clients asking more questions around sustainability and diversity and having that as part of their requirements for working with vendors? To be honest, no. It hasn't come up. But what, do, what does happen is that, um, you know, we're one first population of the world in India, right? So if change doesn't, happen in action here is going to be a difficult place for everybody in the world. And I have the privilege of working between worlds. I work between Europe and India and it gives me enough contrast. So oftentimes, you know, when I'm uh, speaking with clients and uh, we're having a casual conversation, this does come up. They say, hey, you know, we like this, we like that. But as a framework, ESGs are not a part of media framework. It is not just something, you know, we kind of give... And I think it's time that, you know, we don't only look at, okay, there is enough money and there's enough creativity. But you know, what about your ESGs? Are you focused on that? Because you cannot put that off. You know, can you put climate change off? Can you say that, hey, you know, we're gonna make, go another 10 years, make films and create a lot of waste on sets and you, you know, use our resources in a certain way, but it has a carbon footprint. It has an impact, right? I think yeah. in India also, uh, I know there are some bigger studios uh, who are doing all of this from a CSR point of view and these things, uh, but I think in India, we are one of the very, very few studios who are building ESGs as a part of our framework as a main line of a business. But yeah. I would love, you know, to talk to people who are keen on collaborating and, you know, building initiatives around this area. Yeah, I love that. Well, that's that's a really good place to stop. Um, there are other questions in the live chat if you can stick around for a little bit to answer those. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a really interesting chat and a very big topic. Well, lots of big <laughs> topics there. So I really appreciate you joining us from India. Enjoy the events over there. And uh, yes, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. And I'm so happy, you know, this the first VFX World Day has a conversation about sustainability taking place as well. Thank you for your time and address. <laughs> thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.
Hi, this is Victor Perez. Happy Worst VFX Day. I would like to start by thanking Haley Miller for putting all this together. And of course, Hugo Guerra for taking care of this super long streaming. Um, of course, first of all, you all for supporting this amazing event, which is celebrating our crafts, something that we all loved. Um, in this uh, 20 minutes, I'm going to share with you something very little, but I hope significant for, for you, which is um, how I analyze events of light through uh, my mapping conceptualization of light. So I just have for you, you can download it for, for free, uh, this uh, mind mapping, this poster that you can find in this with this uh, QR. Um, it is free, you, it's available to, to everybody. And here you are going to find my link. So search on my links and you will find the, the uh, mind mapping. It's a poster that you can print, you can give your friends. This is for celebrating uh, the love for light, which is something that, that, I, that I love. So uh, let's go ahead. Um, let me just uh, mention what I'm going to focus on this, because of course I cannot review this whole thing. This map is actually something that I use for helping me visualize the elements of an event of light. So everything from photography, science, technology, everything is, is in here. Remember, for me, the most important part of, of visual effects is the mix between science, technology, and art. So with this poster, what I wanted to put in context is how everything is just being influenced by everything else in terms of the analysis of light. Light is something so complex that even it's a paradox for scientists. So for me, I just want to start by using a physically, a physically plausible uh, element and then transform in my, in my head into a mathematical operation and an operation of nuke and everything. But you have to start from reality, observing reality, understanding reality, synthesizing reality, and putting that into nodes in, in nuke in this case, because I'm going to focus this class mostly on, on the nuke compositing. Okay, I love nuke, everybody knows that. So uh, what is important is like, this is not about nuke, this is about how an artist uh, analyze the event of light. So what I'm going to, to do in this uh, particular scenario is to analyze this part of the, uh, of the map, which is the diffraction. So what is the diffraction? Well, the diffraction is one of the properties of light that is just making light that is traveling as more or less parallel rays. So uh, this thing that the sunlight is so far that the, the rays are coming almost parallel. This is like the, 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 the way of illustrating that. Imagine like a, a circle that is so big that when you focus on one side, on one little part of the circle, it's going to look like a straight line, but actually it's not. So light that is a radiation is just going to replicate that every time that is going to touch any, any surface. So basically a ray of light is not just passing through a hole, for instance, like a straight line. It's just going to bend corners, okay? It's going to do like that. Okay, so it's coming and it's going to, to move. And that is going to, to take all, also other consequences, okay? So like the intensity that is in here. So for that, I, I just need to go to another part of, of the graphic. I don't want to overcomplicate things in, in here, just to, just to be clear. But I just want you to understand that everything, all phenomena of, of light is just going to be related. So this is the inverse squared law. So light that is closer to the source is going to be, of course, more intense than when it's going to be expand. So it's going to expand. And this radiality is what is going to, to, to generate that effect that I'm going to, to recreate today. Again, I don't want to focus on a certain effect or a certain way of doing things. What I want is just to uh, invite you to reflect about how you analyze light. So in here, what I'm going to do is just to put everything into, into context, is to uh, apply everything that I just said 
into a, a practical shot, okay? So this is a, an element of CG that I just put in, in, in here. It's, it was not created to be on this environment, just to be sure. Uh, I'm just going to show you how the element was. And this is just a, a picture of a, of a sunset that has nothing to do with the original, the original environment that this uh, monster was created for. Um, what I'm going to do is to replicate what will happen if this monster was actually there. So if you have the sun behind, which is, this is the, the element, the, what will happen is like lighting here is going to bend the corner, as I said before. So it's going to behave with this fashion. So imagine that the sun is going to be there and that is going to bend the corners around the edge. So probably what you are going to, to, to see is like, when you don't have a strong analysis of what you are doing and you are just relaying on just notes. So if you perceive like you can synthesize reality with one note, just because someone else told me it's done like that, that is very poor. And I'm going to show you how poor is going to, to look. So I'm going to use a light grab, okay? Uh, which is, you know, that thing that you put when you have sources of light or you want to create the light that is coming from behind. But even this node that is a very simple node, um, it requires a lot of thought in the way you are going to apply the, the, the properties in here. So I'm going to use the B input as the background and the A input in, in here. So this is the intensity, okay? So what this is doing is just basically is blurring the, the background and it's just placing on top something with the intensity that I, that I put in here. So I'm going to put this on the string and this is the effect. So what you are seeing in here is just like this foggy uh, look, which is honestly is wrong. Well, maybe it's not wrong, but it's not justified the presence of this amount of fog. So why light of this intensity should be bleeding inside, okay? So the light grab is that light that is coming from behind, is that backlight that is bending in inside. But not all rays of light are going to bend with the same intensity or even the same uh, attitude because it's different if you have a source of a bounce light or a diffuse or secondary uh, light, light or the key light in here, which is clearly the sun. So. With this, uh, yeah, you can play with the tolerance, you can play with different events, but still, it's going to be quite unlikely that just with this note, you're going to have the desired effect. So for that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to combine notes in order to use uh, the technique that I, that I want. So something that I did in order to develop this many years ago, it was replicating the light grab. How can I replicate the, the architecture of this node? So that is what I'm going to, to do in here. So as I said before, I need to blur, I need to, to, to do that. But instead of doing of the whole thing, I'm just going to grab the sunlight, okay? So instead of trying to extract, because I could use a key to extract here, I'm just going with the easy way, which is I'm going to use a roto, okay? So roto, I'm just going to grab a circle in here, more or less like that. Good enough. I'm going to place RGBA. So that is going to be the source of, of light, okay? Just a roto. I can put the any value that I, that I want in, in here. Here you are. Now, of course, if I put any kind of correction in, in here, based on that, it's going to apply the correction of the whole sum. Let me just put something like a multiplier of that. So I don't want to apply the sunlight in there. I just want to use in the edges as the light was bleeding. So I like to use a, a node that I love to for, for the diffusion, uh, which is the blur. I really believe blur is the quintessence of, of compositing, okay? So um, I'm, going to, I'm going to go ahead by removing from this circle the parts of the monster. So for that, I'm just going to use a bit of uh, merging. So I'm going to stencil, for instance. Uh, here you are. Here you are. So I'm just removing the parts of the sun that are behind. Now, 
you can say, well, right now you are doing nothing. Well, yeah, you are right. I'm doing practically nothing, even if I modify a bit the edges. But that is not what I want. What I want is just to create the diffusion of this light. Okay. So instead of using a grade, let's do something else more specific. Remember, every element of light in Nuke is meant to be added. So it's a plus operation. So let's do this. The problem is like with the plus operation in here, I'm just going to apply with this, the sun outside. And I don't want the sun outside. So I want this bleeding inside. So I'm going to apply, as I said before, the blur so you can see the effect. For instance, this, I'm going to put 10. And now I don't want to add the plus over the whole thing because that is going to add me light outside. See? I don't want to add light outside. I just want inside. So there is an operation that is the plus, but only within the limits of the alpha of the B input. That is the A top. Okay. So the A top is just adding the plus inside the alpha of my original image. Okay. So that is what I want to do. So first of all, now I'm limiting the effect. So the concept is, this is the source of light that I isolated from the original painting. Here I use a roto, but remember, you can use a key or whatever you want. Then I remove the parts that are occluded by the monster or the element of the CG that I want. And then the blur is actually creating a expansion that is a diffusion. What is the only thing that, that I'm going to correct in here that I'm adding on top, by the way, remember, it's an element of light. But what is what I want to correct in here? Well, um, I don't like this light to behave in a linear fashion. Why? Well, I mentioned before that uh, following the uh, this area of the graphite that I have in here, the inverse square law is just telling me the light is not going to behave in a linear decay. It's going to have like a cubic fall off. So it's this thing like one quarter, one ninth, one sixteen. So it's having this, uh, this inverse square law, which is the formula in, in here. Okay, so I want to recreate that. And for doing that, I'm going to apply a logarithmic decay. So for that, I'm going to use uh, the log tooling in here. So I'm going to lean to log in this case. And then I'm going to invert the way. And I'm going in here. So this decay is going to be now logarithmic because I'm doing a bracketing effect, so a parenthetical, and everything that is in here is just happening in a logarithmic. So I'm going to remove the constraints because the um, all the constraints that you have in here are made for the uh, for, for the you know the logarithmic scans, and I don't care about that. And this uh, 1023 is because we are talking in a scale of 10 bits. So what I'm going is just to reset to a natural logarithm in here. So maximum, and here you are. Now the decay. Something that you have to to keep in mind is that um, even if you place in the log to link the uh, the alpha, the alpha is not going to be applied. It's, this node was designed for RGB, so it's not going to apply any kind of values in, in there. Do I care much about that? Not actually, because I don't want any any values of, of the alpha to be affected in here. And it's not changing, as you can see. So the alpha is not necessary, okay? Uh, th this is just for you to, to keep in mind in case you are playing with uh, alpha values or something like that. So things that I have to keep in consideration is like, I can apply, depending on the way I want to work, I can play with the original source of light or I can play with the secondary, uh, which is like the secondary bouncing light of, of the sky or other filters or elements or polarization. You know, you can synthesize whatever you want in your, in your mind. The important is like every thought that you have is translated into any sort of operation and be specific with the operation. So you can modify different aspects of the same event with different nodes. It would be a good idea that you put labels in here. I'm not adding all that level of detail in here just because I want to be quick and we still have something like five minutes. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to apply here, for instance, a, a, a multiply. So I'm going uh, very strong with the amount of light. See that that is changing. I can go like very, very high. 
And now that is going to even modify the aspect of this light. See? So I can go modify that. And you're going to see that the edges actually are going to represent the actual color of light. Well, something that you are going to notice is that it's going to be quite tricky to get a natural level of results. So conceptually, you can work with the original color of light, which is correct. But, you know, also we are in a constraint of chipping light because we are recreating light and, and synthesizing and simplifying. Of course, you cannot just complex every, every single operation. So you need to go to the core, something that is quick. And right now what I'm doing using for, for this is just a plus, a blur and a grade, basically. So instead of applying in there, I'm just going to give you another idea, which is what do you want to see from that light? Well, what I want to see is actually how that light is going to be color in order to get that bleeding inside. So I'm going to apply that in here after the, the color. So that is going to, to give me uh, another kind of control. Okay, see? Now, something that you are going to, to notice is that the edges are going to be lost. You are going to lose a bit of the detail in the edges. Something like this. This is completely normal. Why? Because light is just going to build up over the edges. So it is normal that you lose a bit of that, uh, that uh, thing. So with this, I'm going to uh, touch the amount of light. And with this other, the diffusion, which is, as you remember from the previous note that I was using, the light grab, you have the diffuse and the intensity. The only thing that I have in here is being an open structure, I have the ability to change every single parameter like I did in here. So I'm just applying a, a logarithmic decay for, for this blur. So I'm going to expand even more. So I'm going to do like that, for instance, that looks good to me. So then it's always the same, the same uh, question is intensity versus diffusion, because that is what you need to match mo most of all. Then of course you have color, but color is going to be linked to the intensity. So with this, I can go higher. And then with this, I can just go with that. See that you are going to use very, very big numbers because right now I'm playing with the scale of a, a very high intensity that is then being translated into logarithmic. But this is something that is important. Most importantly, the amount of detail you are losing. I like to say that compositing is actually destroying the images with the style. So, so actually what we are doing here is, yeah, it certainly is destroying the edges, but are destroying as they were supposed to be. So, in order to recreate the intensity of light, it's not about lens flare or adding more light into the, to the background, but it's understanding how light is going to behave in that particular case. So does it mean that the light wrap is grown? No, it's not grown, but it's limited because with an open structure, you, you can modify every single step of that process that you are uh, creating in, in your mouth, um, in your mind, sorry. So um, instead of doing that, you can just add and attach more and more elements that you want to amplify in, in there. For instance, another thing that I can do is I can create a secondary expansion because the first one is good, it's going to be the, the, the strong one, but maybe I just want to add a second element of, of that. So with this and this, I'm going to add a plus operation and I'm going to add another blur in here, okay? As you can see now, this is creating a different, uh, a different aspect. Of course, I'm duplicating now because I'm having double the light. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do this. I'm going to expand higher. Have a look at the difference. See? So I can create even more, and that is going to have a different effect of diffusion. Can I create another one? Why not? I'm going to add this other one. So 
How much? Well, until you decide, because basically is is going to be by i. But if not, instead of doing this multiplicative way of adding blurs and blurs, maybe you can just deal with something in in the middle of the of the brackets of logarithm. So I'm going to move this now and I'm going to amplify in here after after the blur I'm going to modify that. This is just a, another way of showing how you can change the aspect of, of this and you can change the color very subtly. So this would be like a secondary correction of that light. So it, it's getting the original color and then in here is having a secondary color. So that is going to be, for instance, to synthesizing something about the, the atmosphere. Okay, so of course I can go with this like forever and keep adding and adding elements on top. And just to show you the difference, it's just like these nodes are just adding this. Just but this tiny fraction is actually giving me a lot of information. So this is what we need to focus in. It's like little steps that can give me a maximized output. Okay, so that's all that I can share with you today. I leave you with the rest of the of the streaming. Um, thank you very much for for attending this uh, little this little snippet. But, um, thanks everybody. Uh, thanks uh, Haley and Hugo for for this amazing job that you are doing. So speak very soon and take care. Bye. Hello, my name is Robert Ryu. I'm the Director of Innovation and Technology at Real by Fake, and I would like to introduce you to our new videogrammetry system. Video what? Videogrammetry. But before I do that, let me take a minute to talk to you about photogrammetry. The concept behind photogrammetry is to take pictures of an object or a set from as many angles as possible. You then bring these pictures into a software that will reconstruct the geometry. And once the processing is done, you can bring it into your favorite 3D software. Now one day somebody said, hey, why don't we try this at 24 frames per second? So this is an example of the kind of results you can get with videogrammetry. You have total freedom with the camera, you can move it any way you want, and the character is perfectly integrated because he is full 3D. The big difference between videogrammetry and mocap is that in mocap, you only capture the body, you only capture the movement. In this case, we capture the performance, we capture the facial expression, we capture the clothes deformation, we capture everything. This is our studio. 
We can take it down if we want to and move it to any location where it's needed. The red center is the capture area and it varies between 2 and 5 meters. Once everything has been processed and cleaned up, we have this add-on that we created for Blender to import the geometry. And I have the options to have variations. So let's say I want to have 10 of them. So it will extract 10 characters from different places from the sequence. We also have an option called blue key on texture. And that allows us to key the clothes if the character was wearing blue. And we have different options for keying. So now we generated 10 characters and they all look like they have different clothes and that's because we keyed them. This is done directly in Blender. We don't need to go through compositing for that. Let me show you. For example, instead of keying the blue shirt, I will key her face. So if I click here, you can see the faces change color, but the shirts are back to blue. But we don't want that, so I will go back to blue. So I will just key the shirt. And now it's up to me to play with the shader parameters to get the result that I'm looking for. I can even adjust the tolerance so I can get the pens too, because they are blue after all. And now at this point, I just play with the settings until I get the desired look. I have many settings I can play with, the hue, saturation, the value. And we actually have four different systems for keying the clothes and change the colors. And one cool thing about our system is that even if we make copies of our characters and our instances, they will all have different colors. And this is another method that we have to change the color of the clothes, but this one is not based on keying. And it has a very small impact on the skin color. We have the ability to add accessories, in this case hats, but they could also be weapons like swords or anything. This is a test that we did capturing six people at the same time. There are some issues with the ground contact because there were not enough camera information, too much occlusion to really capture all the motion. But once they start dancing, it's pretty good. Also, the capture is limited at 65,000 polygons. So that means that if you have six people, each of them will get about 10,000 polygons. You can see the comparison here with one model alone and with the six dancers. We also made a test to bring one of the characters into Embergen to see if we could make it burn. And uh, it works. You can see that there is some flicker on the character. That's because Embergen doesn't support alembics that are changing geometry at every frame, which is the case for videogrammetry. But it still works. So when the character gets into the box, he will catch on fire. And even if there are some flickers from time to time, it won't affect the simulation. And the guy burning is actually me. Now at this point, you must start to realize how powerful and incredible this technology is. Videogrammetry is very good for mid to background characters. It's not designed for close-ups. It's very, very good for crowds. I will show you some examples later. Same thing for extras. You can add props, like I said before. You can do VFX. We support motion blur. A lot of the videogrammetry systems don't support motion blur because they are designed for VR, but we can do it because in VFX, we need motion blur. We can also generate a skeleton. So if you have a character that's supposed to transform into a monster, you could capture your character and then continue the animation with the skeleton that will have the exact same movement as the capture. We have the possibility to export the captures for gaming, so for Unreal. It is affordable. What I mean by that? Well, I will show you some examples later. When we do the capture, we don't light the model. We use the light that's on the setup. So you don't need to have your director of photography on set when you do this. You don't need any kinds of permits to do videogrammetry and also we can move the system to any locations. But there are some restrictions you need to be aware of. Just like for photogrammetry, we cannot use transparent objects so like water bottles or glasses. We cannot capture any details that are smaller than 6 millimeters. For example, a cigarette. We would have to redo it in 3D. We cannot do free flowing hair because again, it's smaller than six millimeters. We cannot shoot reflective material because it would reflect on the green screen. So if we had to shoot a sword, we would use a wooden sword and replace it later in post-production. Obviously we cannot do green clothes because we're shooting on a green screen, but khaki colors are okay. So army stuff that works well. We are limited to a five meter radius for the capture area, but if we need somebody walking or running, we can put them on a treadmill. Ideally, you don't want to capture more than two people at the same time. Okay, so now let's talk about crowds. The traditional way to create crowds is to shoot a small group of people, move them around and shoot them again and comp everything together at the end. And if the camera is moving, you will need a motion control camera. It's a long and expensive process. For very large crowds, another way to do it is to shoot people on green screen and put them on cards that you can spread all around the stadium. That was the method that was used for both Rocketman and Bohemian Rhapsody. The problem using this technique is that if you move the camera on the side, you will see that the characters are actually flat because they are cards and you can't relight them. But if you use 3D models, then you have total freedom to move the camera any way you want and you can also relight the entire crowd. Now this is what we can do with our videogrammetry system. 
You can move the camera any way you want. You can relight the scene too. Videogrammetry gives you freedom. For example, let's say you work on a TV series, Star Wars or Star Trek, and you have all these aliens that keep coming from one episode to another. Well, if you shoot them on blue screen, you are stuck with the camera angle you had with and the lighting that you had at the time of the shoot. With videogrammetry, you don't need to worry about this because you can replace the camera anywhere you want, you can shuffle your aliens anywhere you want them, and you can relight them to fit in your environment. Now let's take a look at this other example. Now imagine if you had to shoot this for real in New York. You would need the permit, you would need to close the street, you would need the camera crew, you would need security, you would need everything to cost a fortune. Or you could just spend half a day in our videogrammetry studio and capture all your actors, and the rest is a full CG shot. And if you need the shot at night, well, you just need to relight the scene. Now I'm going to show you a few shots where we added characters using videogrammetry. Imagine the scenario, okay? Shooting is over, and now the director wants more characters in the scene. But these are complicated shots because the camera is moving, there's a lot of interactive lights and everything. Imagine how you would do this without videogrammetry. So for each shot, I will show you the characters in white so you can really see where we added the characters. So if you had to shoot this on a blue screen, that would be complicated because you have interactive lights, you have moving cameras, so you'd have to redo all these lights and all these camera movement in a studio using motion control. And you would need to perfectly match the lighting. There's a helicopter spot on this one. So we all know how complicated it is to match a blue screen shot with a real environment. Well, this is way much easier. If you think this technology could be useful for you or you would like to get more information, feel free to contact us. Hi, I'm Tim Webber. I'm the Chief Creative Officer at Framestore uh, and I've been a visual effects supervisor for much of my life and, as we'll discuss, I'm now also a director and writer. Because I'm going to talk to you about uh, filmmaking in Unreal um, and in particular a short film, Flight, uh, and some of the technology we developed to allow us to make it particularly fuse our pipeline. So we made this short film in Unreal. We actually made it in version 427 because 5 was just coming out when we started and if we'd known we were going to be delayed in making it, we would have switched to 5 and we would have benefited, benefited from all the huge uh, improvements in version 5, but we were stuck with 427. To make it, we, uh, a large part of what we did was push forwards some of the developments I originally did uh, to make gravity, you know, ways of getting real, genuine performances in an unreal world. And to allow us to do that, we set up tools and workflows that allowed us to make films in unreal, but at scale and at quality. You know, many people have made short films uh, with small teams of specialists in unreal, but we wanted to make sure we could uh, it could scale up to work on feature films and with a broad range of artists of all sorts of uh, ex sort of specialisms and expertise. Um, the full set of technology uh, is only really particularly relevant to certain types of films, uh, very very CG heavy films. Um, but many of the parts of what we developed along the way uh, will be very useful on a wide range of films. In fact, we're using them on a lot of films already. But when you bring them all together in the way we did on flight, then the whole becomes greater than the sum of the parts. And it, it does enable you to do things very differently and, and to tell stories that otherwise couldn't be told. So let's start by having a quick look at the trailer for flight. Start somewhere calm, moment by moment. And where is it? When did this happen? It was a few hours ago. I'll get you into a memory flow. It's too fragmented. It's a prototype and it's not always pleasant. Just, I saw something. You've got to help me. She might 
still be alive. I, I can't remember. So we had a, a number of different aims of this project. Um, as I said, one of them was to show how we can make films in Unreal, but at scale and at quality. Um, so we needed to bring together you know, the best talent in a huge number of areas. In the end, we used pretty much every department within Framestore, which is 20 plus departments. So a lot of different specialisms. And you can't necessarily retrain everyone, um, and they need to be able to work together in a coherent way. So we set up tools to allow that to happen, to allow some people, you know, animators who, who have decades worth of learning to be an animator but haven't got the time to retrain to use a different tool, um, to allow them to work with Unreal but not necessarily in Unreal. So we can get all the benefits and yet use a wider pool of people. And also to work as you know in the way you work on a feature film you know there's a lot of iterations a lot of client input a lot of uh, toing and froing and having to keep track of the you know the huge amount of information you know we we even though it is only a short film we worked as if we were working on a feature film and we wanted to develop all of this on a real project we always feel that if you develop a tool set sort of in an ivory tower it's never quite what you want and whilst it was more challenging to do it whilst we were making a film and it made the making of the film more challenging because the pipeline was being developed as we went uh, it came out you know very beneficially in the end and I really wanted to show a new way of making films from the creative flow point of view it's, it's a way of bringing some of the benefits you get in an animated film where you're gradually working all of the film up as you go along and you're seeing the whole film more visually as you work on it but with human characters in it um, so you know it, it was a largely CG world and there was an awful lot of flexibility all the way through but it still had very human performances in it um, you know so you get a lot of the benefits of the creative flow of an animated movie and you also get a lot of the benefits that you generally get out of working with Unreal, the immediate interactivity, the faster iter iterations and therefore more iterations, uh, the fact that you can see stuff in more context as you're working on it, you can see approximate lighting, more detailed environments, and you know, everyone working on it can see that together, so it can be more collaborative. And it also means that everything is a little bit more able to be done in parallel and uh, there is more stuff open throughout the movie. You can make changes, you can make your decisions earlier because you're seeing more context, but you can still make changes later because everything is live throughout the process. So here's an example of uh, the sort of traditional creative flow of a film. And you have to get the script absolutely perfect and very polished before you start shooting because the shoot is very intense, you don't have time to focus on too much else and it's very expensive and during the shoot you have to make sure you get everything, all the coverage you need, every possible option you need because you're not going back to reshoot to pick stuff up again so you shoot an awful lot of extra stuff you don't end up necessarily needing. And then when you put it together, you, you're editing, often with, if it's a visual effects heavy project, often with unfinished material, you can't really see what you're working with. And you put that together and you try and get what you think will be your finished film and then you start to work properly on the visual effects. And of course, it's not quite as separate and gated as this and we do post fears and we do lots of things to try and make this more easy. But the benefits of the process we used is all of that becomes much more one part of a single process. You're doing all these parts of the creative flow in parallel, working together and seeing more context as you go. And you can see a, an approximation of it here. Yeah, and, and there are many additional benefits of working in Unreal. You know, the fact that when you're doing the production design, I can sit down and see through a shot camera with the right lighting what happens if we move uh, furniture around, what happens if we move buildings around, what happens if we change the lighting to, you know, uh, to see how those buildings work with slightly tweaked lighting. 
uh, you can design and choreograph some very complicated material uh, very effectively. And you know, we we didn't really have a production designer on it, and the fact that I think that we managed to achieve what we achieved shows how flexible and immersive the process is. There's also lots of side benefits. Uh, for instance, even though we were, you know, we were asking our actors to perform in an environment that didn't exist, certainly didn't exist when we were in rehearsal, we were able to put them in VR headsets, they could understand the environment they were going to be working in, and when they were on stage, we had the environment on the LED screen, so they could see the environment they were performing in uh, and, and understand what they were doing. And they could see that right down to a jet cop flying over their shoulder at the right point or a car whizzing past, so they could react to the environment they were in. We also, you know, Unreal made it very easy to go from previs uh, to tech viz. I mean, there's obviously many advantages of working in Unreal in previs, and everyone's doing it an awful lot these days, and I, I won't go over those. But, um, but you know, having done the previs, which we could lean heavily into as well, because because we were doing, we were finishing in Unreal, we were taking that process through to the end, we could put more work into the previs, get a huge amount of benefit from that, because we weren't going to throw it away and start again. It was just a continuous flow. We were continually working everything up. Uh, gave us a lot of advantage to judging the film at that stage and to being able to you know, save, save work from not redoing work later. Uh, but as I said, also enabled us to plug straight into TechViz when some of the stuff we had to shoot to achieve, for example, the, the three-minute long shot during a chase sequence on Tower Bridge, which would be an incredibly difficult thing to shoot uh, for even for a, you know, a big budget film, and we had to do it on, on a very small budget for a short film budget. Um, we, were a, we had to plan that very immaculately. We only had a total for the whole film of a four-day shoot. Um, and we couldn't afford anything to go wrong and we had to get through the shots very quickly. But we, we developed tools that allowed us to feed the previs straight into TechViz so that the TechViz was live and at, we'd make tweaks in previs and see them in the TechViz straight away and that would help us plan our shoot. And we could see exactly what we needed to do on the set and it made the shooting very cost effective and quick. It was also very interactive on the shoot. You know, we could see what we could see the shots, even though uh, it was a lot of you know motion capture and a lot of everything was a virtual environment essentially. But we could see how the shots were going to look. We could get live comps, bits of live action integrated with the CG, and respond to what we needed to respond to on the shoot. And obviously, the post viz was not a separate process. It was just fed into part of the process. The way we did it, it meant we got immediate uh, comps of the live action and the previs um, just coming together. So we had good material to edit with. We had material that looked roughly like the final shot to edit with, with barely any human interaction at all. Uh, so the post was then just flowed smoothly into the animation. It was just a continual working up of the same process and improving. And even the fact that in animation, you know, it, it, it took us, I didn't have to look at play blast. You know, normally you'd do a play blast and then you might have to render to see how it was going to look in the final lighting with all the final context around it. And that might, might take a couple of days before you saw that. We could turn that around, including the compositing of the live action, all automated within about 20 minutes. So sometimes I'd make a comment at the beginning of a review and see it very close to how the final images were going to look at the end of the review, which was incredibly beneficial. Also, because we'd designed the lighting in previs, which means we were designing the lighting in more context, we could plug that into the stage, we could almost get everything automatically lit from our original design, and certainly uh, when, when the live action elements and the CG elements were put together for post-vis, they just fitted together, not perfectly, but they fitted together largely enough to be able to judge everything and to work with everything and to not need many tweaks after that. Then, of course, it comes to final delivery, and, and that is a, a challenge. You know, that was the bit that Unreal is not so suited for, and, and that was the 
the harder part of the challenge is getting final quality pixels out of it. But the fact that we pushed all the way through, uh, you know, I think shows what can be achieved. So all of this was enabled by Fuse. Fuse stands for the Framestore Unreal Shot Engine. Um, but it's also called Fuse because we are fusing together a real-time pipeline and the traditional visual effects pipeline that has been developed over decades. And we've all developed lots and lots of tools to make that possible. But bringing that together with the advantages of uh, a real-time, interactive, everything live pipeline without losing the benefits of both is what was so important in the way we designed the tool set of Fuse. And that's really what enabled us to achieve the scale and quality and, and to get you know, the range of people working together. Um, part of that was obviously getting a really robust version control system so that everyone knew what version they needed. We could look at the version. We'd have one version for on the LED walls on set, one version for previs, one version for the final render. We'd have one version with this hairstyle, one version with that hairstyle that were needed at different times. And everything was controlled. And if you wanted to redo a render you did two weeks ago, uh, you could redo it and it would all come together the same as you, you know, the same as you wanted it to. Everything was tracked and there's you know, one of the challenges with Unreal is there's a non-deterministic side to the render, which was still challenging, but everything that could be managed to, to be kept on track was for automatically for all the different departments working on, on the same show. And this, you know, this brought many of the similar benefits to the visual effects workflow, as I showed in the creative workflow, you know, everything generally uh, is, is not as linear as this diagram suggests, but you know, there is a linear process with gates between one phase and another phase when you're doing traditional visual effects. And working in Unreal and with Fuse enabled us to work way more in parallel and way more creative input at any stage along the way and way more seeing everything in context. So we could be working on the production design from almost day one to you know, a couple of weeks before the final shots came out and, and were delivered. Um, we could be working on the lighting all the way through and tweaking the lighting all the way through. And everything, yeah, everything was in context, everything was fluid, everything flowed from one stage to the other. Another important part of the tool set that we needed to develop was uh, working we're using Unreal and live action together. You know, that, that's something that is very rarely done, frankly, and we obviously needed to do an awful lot of it to create the particular film we were making. And so we developed a lot of tools to um, help us work with layers and rendering setups to make all of that process much, much more easy. Okay, next section. So there were a lot of challenges and complexity to the film. You know, it, it was a proof of concept, and we wanted to try out as many things as possible. And I certainly, uh, in, in directing the film, made it pretty challenging. I mean, some of the big challenges we had uh, were things like the long shots. The concept of the movie is it's being told through someone's memories being visualised, and so a lot of it is POV shots. And POV shots tend to be long, continuous. We, you know, we had a number of shots, minutes and minutes long, which had to be very carefully choreographed and designed, either because it's a complex chase sequence, as I said, on uh, Tower Bridge, or because there's a drama sequence and you're actually understanding the character whose POV it is through the way he's moving through the room and the way the camera moves. And so all of it needed a huge amount of choreography and precise work and that was possible thanks to using this process that we did but but very very challenging of course a short film budget is very challenging under any circumstances but to make a film as complex as this on the budget we had was was definitely a big part of the challenge uh, as I said we had a, we had a four-day shoot initially and we ended up I'd say doing a, probably a five-day shoot but one of the benefits is we were able to come back and do an extra shoot later for 
other reasons we had to come back and re, uh, reshoot because there was an accident and we lost some time on the shoot. Um, but that was actually quite easy because you don't have complexity of sets. You know, it is a it is a virtual film, and it was quite easy just to slot back in and pick up some work, which also enables a greater you know creative process. I think. Um, you know, another big challenge was the level of human performance I was after. I wanted real, genuine, natural human performances, and yet in this fantasy world. And I think, you know, we managed to achieve that. And one of the things I'm most proud of is that at the end of the process, I, you know, I, I looked actually at the 20, it was about 20, the most, all the most senior people across the film on the uh, visual effects side and on the production side, and... Of all those 20 or so people, 80% of them were doing their role for the first time. So a lot of people stepped up and did some amazing work. And I think, you know, that's all thanks to the team, but it's also enabled by working in this way, which does enable you to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it um, to help things move forward. So uh, despite all of those films, all of those challenges, I think we managed to complete it and uh, and it's been going down very well and it's it's now recently become available uh, on the internet so please if you get a moment please do watch it thank you very much
talent, resources, technology, incentives, everything you need all in one place. Welcome to Ontario, a top VFX production destination worldwide with a thriving province-wide industry working on over 400 plus productions each year. With a network of more than 50 world-class studios and a diverse and highly skilled workforce of over 7,000 professionals in VFX, animation, and post-production province-wide, we're equipped to handle projects of all types and sizes. From feature films and television series, to blockbusters and independents, and everything in between. With support from industry stakeholders and top-tier education partners, Ontario's VFX industry is a well-oiled machine. We're also known for our innovative Made in Ontario technology, including software, class virtual production spaces, and remote infrastructure like CertNet, offering innovation, flexibility, and cost savings. And if that wasn't enough, we also offer competitive incentives for film and television production, like multiple tax credits, including a VFX-specific provincial tax credit that guarantees stability and certainty. Everything you need to make your next production financially viable in Ontario. Don't miss out on the opportunity to bring your next VFX production into focus. We are the Computer Animation Studios of Ontario. Visit us online for more information.
Hi, my name is Freddy Chavez Olmos. I'm a director in the DGC and also a creative director for artificial intelligence at Voxel Studio. This past summer, I had a unique opportunity to direct a short film within the constraints of a virtual production stage, all within a two hour time frame. It was an intense learning experience, not only in terms of virtual production, but also in utilizing new AI tools to streamline the process. When I first learned about the initiative by the Directors Guild of Canada for virtual production, I knew it was something I had been eager to explore as a filmmaker. I had some exposure from a post-production perspective in my previous role as a compositing supervisor at Image Engine on the Obi-Wan series and The Mandalorian Season 3. But I hadn't had the opportunity to be in the director's chair in a virtual production shoot, working with cinematographers, actors, and technicians. So I felt this opportunity truly aligned with my goals. To apply for this initiative, I needed to submit a short script based on a location they were building for virtual production at Lumo Stage. I had a choice between two locations, a subway station and a rooftop patio. I opted for the subway station since I had a compelling idea to incorporate a scary urban legend I had heard about in a subway station in Mexico. Lastly, I had to prepare a five-minute live pitch. I believe the pitch went well, but there was an important piece of information. I would only have two hours to shoot the entire film. This was a new challenge for me, especially considering the complex prosthetic makeup look I wanted to include in my film. I knew that achieving this on set within the two hour window was impossible. So the idea of using AI and machine learning to streamline the post-production process became evident and something I wanted to try. In my mind, I wanted to prioritize completing my shot list on time without letting technical issues get in the way and focus on getting the best performances from the talent. In the end, eight directors were chosen in Canada to direct short film projects in virtual production, and I was one of them. It was an incredible experience. The pre-production process moved swiftly, from casting to sorting out all the shoot details. Since there wasn't time and resources for rehearsals on the virtual production stage, I had to work with my cinematographer, Gordon Berghill, to figure out the best way to shoot using diagrams. Shooting on virtual production stage offers many advantages, such as full control over a specific location and fast set of changes. However, I also encounter limitations on the go that I had to address in post-production. For example, we decided to shoot with the Sony Venice 2 with anamorphic lenses. But the LED wall we used had a diameter of about 38 feet. It worked well for our medium and close-up shots. But once we started to do wide establishing shots, the curvature of the LED wall and the seam lines between the practical set and the virtual environment became apparent. So, I made a conscious decision to shoot it as a traditional blue screen shot, which is pretty much a push of a button on an LED wall, which is quite handy for these situations. Another challenge was the differences in dynamic range between practical lights and the LED wall. I noticed that some of the lights in the LED wall didn't match the practical ones. Given the tight two hour time constraint, I decided to address this in the DI phase, where Andy Gomez, the DI colorist, spent time tweaking it. I'm also very grateful that the production designer, Wayne Elliott, and his team built actual set pieces to blend with the CG environment. I find this essential when shooting in a virtual production stage. The more foreground and mid-ground real set pieces you have, the better it looks on camera, and the less it resembles the rear projection from the 1960s Batman series. The same can be said for using real atmospheric elements on set, as it helps creating the illusion of depth and helps giving more texture and variation to the deep blacks in the LED wall. The resulting horror film has been selected in multiple festivals and has opened up new opportunities. The completed film is currently screened at the Spark Animation Festival, 
but I would like to conclude this case study by showing the VFX breakdown, where we utilize machine learning and new AI tools to expedite the process and improve efficiency in post. Without this approach, I don't believe I would have been able to complete the film. As industry returns to normalcy and production ramp up quickly, efficiency will be crucial. I believe AI, machine learning, and real-time engines will play a significant role in achieving this. Not by replacing us as many believe, but by assisting us. I am grateful that my current role allows me to explore these new technologies and tools to help tell stories in a more efficient way. Thank you for joining me today. Hello, my name is Sean Pollack, and I'm VFX Supervisor at BOT. Thank you for the opportunity to talk about VFX. It always makes it better, doesn't it? We get to collaborate with our clients on storytelling and world building. This can be very challenging, requiring design, technical skills, and attention to detail. It's really a mixture of technical and artistry. Reality shouldn't limit the storytelling, so that's where VFX comes in. Some of our recent projects which come to mind are Stephen King's The Boogeyman, the presence of the monster in the house is represented by vines of decay, which cover the walls and ceiling. As the movie progresses, the vines get thicker and more present. We set dress the environment with CG vines and mold to complete the world building. The monster avoids light, and so we had shots where the child wraps himself in light strings. We added CG strings of lights trailing behind her as she walked through the creepy basement. We also enhanced shots with additional candles, booby traps, and performance improvements. Another project is Shazam! Fury of the Gods. As part of the costume design, the characters wore magical high-tech chest pieces. On set, the actors only wore LED light packs, and our job was to remove them and replace it with Super Bolt. It was very challenging due to character movement and deformation. We did the look development for the Bolt and integrated them in the scenes. In the peripheral, it's set in London 60 years in the future. We designed high-tech additions to the world. Bach created glassy road surfaces with animated CG chevrons which moved in front of the vehicles. We also removed people, cars, and road paint such as bus lanes, crosswalks, and road construction. This proved very challenging due to the amount of 3D camera tracking in Roto. To put reflections of the city into the roads, we had to create CG buildings to render into the road surface. Besides glassy roads, we also created digital eye scans and CG knives for several knife fights. Within the plate, the character had only the knife handle, so we tracked the arm movements and scene to add the CG sharp blades. It's very exciting work to enhance the story through art and technical means, it requires attention to detail and a talented, dedicated team. Thanks, and have a great World VFX day.
Hello everyone. Happy World VFX Day. I'm Vinita from HR department. Delighted to be with you today to celebrate the incredible world of visual effects. First and foremost, I want to express our gratitude to all the talented individuals who contributed their skills and passion to the field of VFX. At Bot, we recognize the importance of a creative and collaborative environment where your talents can flourish. Our commitment to diversity and inclusion extends beyond words. It's reflected in our hiring practices, mentorship programs, and ongoing efforts to create a workplace that welcomes individuals from all backgrounds. Today is not just a celebration within our company, but also a global acknowledgement of the VFX community. Take a look and enjoy how the life at Bot looks like. Bot and what do you think Bot's culture is about? Uh, it's been several years since I started my job here, and this is my first office. So Bot is the sole reason for all my progress, and I am very happy to be at Bot. Bot has a fantastic culture. It has a lot of positive vibes. I value how everyone here respects the perspectives of others. We appreciate BOT culture and activities conducted at BOT. BOT gives important to an individual growth, takes good care and is open to any suggestion. I am happy here because of the career opportunity with training and internal job positions. I like BOT VFX in all ways, but some of us enjoy the good vibe in the workplace and everyone respects each other and their point of view. How do you feel working at BOT looks like? It gave me a good exposure as this is my first job as an HR and my first learnings are from BOT as well. At BOT VFX, I have found a creative haven where my VFX skills are nurtured and celebrated. Working at BOT VFX has been a journey of innovation, collaboration and an artistic growth. I find the management and HR team to be approachable and open to any kind of suggestions or feedbacks. What VFX commitment to excellence is truly inspiring. I am privileged to contribute to such remarkable projects. The kind of social impact which BOT has is unbelievable. The small act of trying to make a difference helps us stay connected to the ground. Joining Body Graphics was the best career decision. It's a place where creativity flourishes and the dreams materialize. It's been my privilege to be part of this VFX industry for the last 15 years and Bot values its employee as the best in the industry. The culture is designed in such a way that uh, we learn together, work together and grow together. I am honored to be surrounded by some amazing creative people at BOT. Where imagination knows no limits. BOT VFX isn't just a workplace. It's a family of visionary artists working together to redefine possibilities. Tend to be a part of the team that consistently pushes the boundaries of VFX. Proud to be a BOT. We are so happy and glad to have a supportive team. When I say support, it not only means in terms of professional environment, but also in terms of all-round development. Whether it was COVID or any difficult circumstances, we all stand by each other. As they say, when the going gets tough, the boats get going. On this special day, let's take a look at a real masterpiece. A standard created exclusively for celebrating World VFX Day. This was created at the beach of Chennai by our artist Swadesh Ranjan along with several other artists from Bot VFX as a tribute to the father of VFX, George Melias. They had great fun while creating it. Now it's your time to have a look at the glimpses we captured while artists were creating sand art of the iconic cinema magician George Melias, the father of VFX.
Hello, I'm Jan Pinkava, the director of the Animation Institute at the Film Academy Baden-Württemberg in Ludwigsburg, Germany, and conference chair of FMX in Stuttgart. We're proud to be part of the family of international institutions and companies supporting World VFX Day. Visual effects from the spectacular to the invisible play a crucial part in storytelling in film, TV, stream shows, and all visual media, from the screen-based to the immersive, from the recorded to real-time. World VFX Day shines a light on the professionals around the world who make the impossible believable through their art, their craft, their talent, and their energy. They richly deserve our acknowledgement and thanks for their dedication and for their amazing work. That's what World VFX Day means to me, an opportunity to show appreciation and to celebrate visual effects and the amazing talents that make them. FMX is proud to be part of World VFX Day. We have presented, discussed and celebrated visual effects and animation for more than 25 years. And we're going to do so again in Stuttgart in April at FMX 2024. I hope to see you there.
problem. Hi everyone, we're we'll talking to you about script to screen, our comprehensive approach to filmmaking with VFX and virtual production. My name is Fausto Tejeda, a VFX and VP supervisor here at Pixamondo. And hi, my name is Mujal Liao. I'm the head of virtual art department here also at Pixamondo. We'd like to start by showing you all a quick demo of some of the work we've done over the past couple of years, which include both commercial and episodic projects. So sit back and enjoy.
So first we would like to show you an overview of like the entire process from idea to in-camera final pixel. So starting with the idea, usually we get a brief from the art department or the writer. Sometimes we'll get concept art. This is where the idea happens. Then we go into visualization. So for the VAD, we are trying to figure out what it is that we're trying to build. And then once we have that, we move into the realization phase where we actually take the idea that we came up with and put it into um, life, bring it into life. And this is where the traditional art department will f focus on their physical build while we optimize and add resolution to the virtual set. And once both parts are ready, we take it to the stage where we would meet up with the director DPs and production designers. Everyone gets to look at it, give feedback. We do uh, adjustments and notes based on the feedback. Then once all that is done, we go into a shoot prep where the DPs can do their pre-light and blending, where the whole environments actually come together from the virtual to the physical. And if all things goes well, then we can go into the shoot day and uh, if everything was planned out smartly from beginning, we end up getting a lot of in-camera finals. In this case, we wouldn't have to do anything at that point. Uh, however, there are moments where we actually have to add more CG um, elements or do an establishing shot, in which case we'll go into more of a post VFX workflow. So here we've selected some examples to walk you through some of the aspects. Um, in this case, we've chosen this environment underwater known as the Kamina Council Chamber, uh, where we can talk about visualization. So in the next slide, you can see we usually start with the concept art. So in this case, we know that it's underwater. It's going to be surrounded by these beautiful relief um, that really tells us the history and the culture of the Kelpians. And uh, we're going to have this large audience seats where a lot of the digitables were going to be added to the environment. And in this environment, we also had to design some fish, alien fish to go with it. Um, what we end up doing in this case is usually looking for uh, something that can provide us with a silhouette that can be changed and maneuvered into multiple other silhouettes. So by creating one creature, it would allow us to gain more different looks out of it when it's curled up and bent and seen from different angles. We can get more looks out of that same fish. And here you can see all the various concepts that we went through designing these creatures for the underwater environment. For this environment, we wanted some elements such as crowds, but due to some time constraints, we weren't able to have those ready on the day. In order to facilitate these needs in post, we took our original asset, rendered them out out of Unreal, and simply added our crowd setup, which was done in Nuke through a complex card system. Then simply comped our foreground plate element along with our new render final. Additionally, for all shots we had in the sequence, having elements such as torch lights in our practical set really enhanced the illusion and helped to really merge both physical and virtual worlds. Having things such as shimmering, spec, and caustics in our water outside really helped to sell the fact that they were deep underwater within this chamber. This is an example of a full CG shot using our original VP asset with added elements such as coral, fish, and vegetation, enforcing the fact that you can take a well-built VP asset and use it for any of your post-production needs. Shifting our focus to the production phase, on-set virtual production offers practical advantages. It enhances collaboration amongst the creative team, provides cost efficiencies, and allows for real-time adjustments, having the power to reshape the world within the frame as the camera rolls. Being able to easily reverse our set, shift colors, and adjust lighting on the fly was nothing short of amazing. It gives the director and DP much more freedom to explore new shots and make changes as they see fit. Uh, while it's very easy to adjust the virtual space, oftentimes what ends up costing um, a lot of energy is actually putting in the physical pieces into the environment and stripping it down. So in this example of the interior, we can see these 
prison cells where people are kept um, has been laid out in a very symmetrical format. So we can see on the top down that all the prison cell space is matching symmetrically, which allowed us to do a beautiful French reverse shot where we didn't have to move the practical assets at all. And we can simply rotate the environment by 180 degrees and get a completely new direction where we can shoot. And this made us very efficient during the shoot. Here's some examples of final shots. The last one, which had both the onset lighting and the wall going to full exposure to mimic the light from the sun, all captured in camera. As we move into post-production, the integration of visual effects during the phase is seamless, enhancing the final product in ways previously not available to us. One of the main benefits of virtual production is the fact that everyone involved at the start of the project, such as the art director, production designer, DPs, and director, usually have full ownership of the final product. What used to be dictated only in post now gets decided and agreed on before we actually shoot. So what we get in camera tends to be more authentic to the creator's original vision. And in this example, you can see the moonlit mausoleum. It's a massive cavern underground and with many pods and sacks scattered throughout the space, surrounded by enormous gates, as you, see, you can see in the background. There were two hotspots that we had to build, one on the ground floor and then the other one on the upper deck where we can oversee and overlook uh, the entire space with the many sacks. So one of the challenges that we had to face was blending the intricate and highly detailed pattern on the floor into the virtual space. Uh, luckily, we were able to do so with pre-built elements like dust, dirt, atmosphere, and by adjusting the lighting with some CCRs, we were able to achieve a seamless blend that on the day it was so realistic that the actors were actually falling off the set. Here are some examples of some of the practical assets that were scanned both on the day and during the early phases of pre-production so that we were including them within our environment. And all these elements really just help to enhance the realism of the environment and help to tie in some of the practical and digital so that it all felt seamless and within the same world. Here's one of the establishing shots for this environment. And as such, the background had to be fully replaced. This usually involves rotating out the practical plate elements, match moving our camera, then re-rendering our environment with the same lighting conditions captured on the day. Using tools like Level Snapshots and Unreal really facilitated having the same settings as what was used on set. Having limited AOV options out of Unreal forced us to really refine our asset and try to get out our beauty as close as possible with little changes needed. And with this environment, it's so large and ambitious that we really had to pay close attention to the optimization and performance of the environment. So since Nanite wasn't available during the time, we had to watch the way we build the assets and adopt more of a game asset workflow, tiling textures with uh, masks and pack textures with, uh, that utilizes the different channels that's available to us, paying close attention to the poly count of the envir environment. We had to take the back half of the cavern and turn it into DMP, reproject it onto proxy geometries and cards. So that way we can actually utilize all the performance that we have for the mid-ground and the foreground. Here are just some beauty stills from our final version of the shots, uh, which included some of the environment elements, as well as some examples of adding additional things like holograms on top of the console in which our main character Burnham was interacting with. For this shot, we achieved our lighting transitions of the pods using a combination of render elements and masks that were output of Unreal. We had a pre-existing layout in Maya for this environment, so we rendered out our digi doubles using Arnold. And Nuke, we brought in all our render passes as well as Alembics for the hologram seen on the console and matched the final look to be consistent with the surrounding shots in the sequence. The final result is a harmonious blend of real-time and traditional techniques to produce a beautiful image in a quarter of the time it would normally take with traditional VFX. In conclusion, we hope that you take this information and understand that VFX and virtual production are not just tools. They're partners in storytelling, allowing filmmakers to push the boundaries of creativity. The technology is still relatively young, and we look forward to what we, as an industry, will be able to achieve in the future. And with that, we hope that you enjoyed this presentation and we look forward to a fantastic World VFX Day.
Thanks, everybody. Hi, I'm Charles. I'm from Select VFX team. I'm the founder and CEO. It is great to be on live on a very special day, which is World VFX Day. It's a great opportunity to talk about collaboration. So we do often collaborate with many international clients across future films, episodes, and TV commercials. So we need to know why there is a need to collaborate. When we talk about the large volume of projects where there is a lot of sequences to be done and the timelines are really tight to in fact meet. So the clients obviously need the partners like us to in fact support them. Now, in fact, we need to know how do we actually collaborate when we come into the real VFX world. So we all know about there is a stage called production where the shoot actually happens, whether it's indoor or outdoor, whatever concept director wants. So once the edits are being locked, the client in fact approaches to in fact support us on various VFX streams, whether it's RAS copy, prep or paint, or even cleanup, tracking, match move, and as well as the compositing. So assume there is a sequence where a girl is being chased by a creature, assume this uh, creature is a uh, alien right where there is a need of VFX where we need to track the overall movement so where the select VFX team would be engaged to in fact complete the task and hand over to the um, client where the client would be engaged to do a creature CG on the final compositing and that could be another cases where there is a sequence where the shoot is being done on a, in an indoor where the actor and actress would be inside the car talking about a brand where the actual shoot is completed and the final edits are done the client will approach us to do a vfx completely so we in fact take care of each and every steps of the vfx starting from markers removal and to do a cleanup activities and also do a keying and finally the background replacement so once we complete all the tasks, we hand over the complete output to our clients where the client will in fact cross check everything is as per the expectations. If there is an improvisation, client will approach us. And again, we will in fact review in detail in terms of screen sharing. And once it is done and final would be approved by the client where the collaborating and other finishing activities would be done by the client. So in summary, 
Collaboration is very, very important aspects between the clients and vendors or partners where we in fact um, support them throughout the VFX journey until collectively as one team, we deliver the final successful product to our client. Once again, thanks for the opportunity.
Hello, 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 hello to the world. My name is Dedi Bilamba, currently in Montreal, originally from the Congo. I am the co-founder of Afro VFX. Afro VFX is uh, an initiative, a program that I started with my good friend, Eric, uh, with the mission, you know, to transform, you know, the African uh, uh, VFX and the animation ecosystem. And uh, we did it uh, for the first, uh, uh, we started last year with the support of Orange Côte d'Ivoire and the government of Canada, and which helped us to give free training uh, in uh, the continent of Africa, started in West Africa, in the country of Côte d'Ivoire, DJ Droba countries. So uh, today for World Verific Day, we are so grateful. Thank you very much for the old organization team. Shout out to Haile uh, for invite for reaching out and inviting us, you know, to this presentation to share about, you know, the, that Afro VFX experience with three person, Melanie Pongo, a 3D animator, uh, Abdu Sako, VFX uh, wizard, and Elden Bumuhore, who is an HR and GI specialist, who were, who were, you know, involved in the first cohort and the next cohort of Afro VFX. So, right now, let's meet uh, Abdu and uh, Elden. Well, uh, my name is Abdu Sako. I'm living right now in Montreal. Uh, I'm an FX artist at Friend Store. Um, basically, I've been uh, with uh, Afro VFX for the past two years and a half. Uh, it's an amazing journey that we've been uh, going through right now. We're trying to open the door for the VFX in Africa. So uh, we're doing one day at a time. And what is amazing about that is that we have an amazing team. And I think we're here to make everything change for us. Yeah, thank you very much. Elden, can you introduce yourself, please? Yes, uh, so my name is Helden. I am a project manager, but I also have had some short stints uh, in different VFX companies uh, in Montreal specifically. And specifically in, in regards to VFX, uh, the first company or the first initiative that has my heart is Afro VFX, in which um, I've been with uh, for about two years now. And um, I'll speak more about my involvement with Afro VFX as we continue. But Great. Yes. Thank you very much. So, what after this, we're gonna uh, Melanie will join us. Okay, well, Melanie used to be, uh, you know, she is an instructor or so for for Afro VFX. But first, I have a question for you, Abdu. So, uh, how does it feel to be able to give back to uh, artists uh, on the continent? You know, I think this is the the most amazing part about my journey because you know, I mean, I'm from Africa, born and very proud of it. And you know, when you come here. It's, it's always, like I always say, the reality that we have there and the reality that we have here, it's totally different. And, you know, in my wildest dream, I'm not going to lie, if you would have asked me when I was young, are you ever going to be, like you say, working on Thor or working on X-Men, I would have tell you that, you know, it's impossible. You know, it's not even, it's, it's not something that's possible for me. And to see me now, you know, 25 years later, here in Montreal and being able to uh, not just work to with major studio, knowing that I can actually have an impact. That's what is, is great about it. And that's exactly why I love uh, Afro VFX. So I'm somebody who like to, to help out, you know, part of my second job, let's say I'm a teacher also. And yeah. knowing that I can actually with my craft help people in Africa. And when you told me, especially in my country too, I'm like, it's just all the stars being aligned and everything is it was just perfect. So Helden, you uh, was part of the Animazon initiative. Okay, Animazon is an outreach initiative uh, from Afro VFX, which targets uh, ladies and women. Because when we started Afro VFX, we got like plus five hundred applicants, but less than less than fifty girls. No, it was incredible. So we decided to have an initiative, and you was the the, the perfect per, perfect person. So you traveled to Abidjan with mm -hmm. Jose, Jose Chapdelaine from Rodeo FX and uh, Karin and Tihuka from uh, Real FX, and you yes. you went there. You were able, you know, to to talk to students at school to make some port portfolio reviews. So first, tell me about your trip in uh, Cote d'Ivoire and uh, to, what was the impact for for you, you know, meeting those uh, aspiring artists. Yes, I did have the opportunity uh, or the chance rather to go to um, Ivory Coast in Abidjan to kind of scout out what the ground is like. And uh, wow, I was amazed first by the passion. The young um, individuals are ready 
they're ready, they're willing. I mean, um, even they would get to the studio, to the Orange Digital Center before us. That just shows how the commitment is there. And then the second thing is the fast learning uh, that uh, I got to uh, to see. So some of the ladies that um, I interacted with, and I was just looking at their portfolios from a very removed point of view, just them showing me what they have done, you would be amazed with some of the things that they've done just having touched Maya for like three months or the yeah. ones that self-taught through looking at, at um, looking you at YouTube and then using After Effects just to add whatever it is that they're using or using Adobe, things like that. So you would be amazed by just the quick learning skills that are on ground. And then some, uh, you know, not all that glitters is gold. So I, I feel like I need to also bring in an aspect where there's a social component to it that um, uh, that I had to, you know, bring back to uh, to the team and say, hey, let's pay, really pay attention to this in regards to just, yes, we are trying to encourage more and more women as, as we're lifting up the Francophone VFX world. Um, we are trying to build from scratch saying that, hey, we have seen on the world level how women have been for, uh, left behind. So now we're building from the ground up saying, let's not forget women, but also let's not forget the particular um, the particular context of said Francophone women on ground when in regards to having access to such a field. Uh, we need to be aware that some uh, social norms aren't, aren't at yeah. the same level as on ground are ready for. I mean, just uh, to finish off, Animazon was supposed to target about, you know, we were being gener um, moderate with it and saying 70, you know, 70 people will be okay, including the team that went also and whatnot. I mean, we exceeded that. Wow, 150 individuals attended every single day. There were people filling the the rooms, ready to listen, ready to show their portfolio. So, uh, when we talk about the African continent, continent in regards to VFX, we are here, we are ready, we are willing, and it's just a matter of um, the doors being left open by the rest that have been able to en enter those uh, those doors. So yeah. yes, Ella, then there's something that you say that is true. Like the commitment that they have there, it's it's always incredible. And it's funny how me too. At first, we always expect to not see uh, that much amount of people, and then all of a sudden we see the actual number, and we're like, you know, they do. At at first, we're like, okay, a class. If we can get twenty, we good. And then you look, five hundred people show up. Like, and so and. Can, Yes, you know, we and, realize and, that there is an interest there for the VFX, and that's something that yes. um, it's it's great. It's great to know that to see that there is actually a lot of people who are very interested to know how we do those things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what was your reaction, Abdul? Because you was teaching uh, Houdini and Nuke, and it was very intense, very you know condensed program. So it was an initiation to Houdini and Nuke. So so can you tell us about you know the classes, the feedback that you got, and and what what did, what did you expect from them? You know, this is where I think that um, this is where you you see the big difference between when we have everything for granted and when you don't. Uh, why I'm saying that is because, you know, I'm teaching here and I have amazing I have amazing student also here in uh, Montreal, but it's not the same because I realized that them um, all the all the kids that we have in uh, Afro VFX is almost as if they realize that this is a big deal you know this is something huge this is a big opportunity this is something that um, I have it but I have to give it my all I was very surprised I was very surprised to see how quick they learn the commitment that they have uh, how they ask questions I mean even during the week they send me questions send me images you can see that they really 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 want to get it and that's where I find that it's a it's a great thing because now you're looking at them and you know they they tribe into that. So I would say I was I was it was a very pleasant surprise that tell me that we shouldn't doubt Africa, you know, because again it was so so new that I was like they don't know nothing about this, but at the end of the day you'll be surprised how you know it doesn't take much. All they take is passion, and then after that, sky is the limit. Yeah, definitely. And we are lucky to have, you know, uh, an entire ecosystem behind us, you know. Uh, we're lucky to have, you know, uh, software companies like Foundry, SideFX, you know, Autodex, you know, willing to help, you know, uh, studios like Cineside, Dineg, uh, Audio FX, uh, and um, Hybrid, you know, uh, uh, 
uh, willing, you know, to give, uh, you know, uh, classes, you know, master class in texturing and prod and this and that. So that's the lot because we are based in Montreal. The initiative has an impact on the African continent, but we are, all of us, we are based in Montreal. And since Montreal is a major hub, you know, for VFX and animation, we are lucky to have the support of all these, uh, uh, these, uh, you know, uh, studios and artists, you know, as a company, but as uh, individuals, you know, people are committed. And uh, and uh, it was very important also for us. We're going to thank you. I have to thank you because uh, the the goal of, of Afro VFX is to provide, you know, free training uh, to have raised the the the, the stand the, the standards, and uh, we also want the the people over there to appropriate and understand that it is possible. Uh, you don't uh, possibly have to to travel to Europe and or North America to be able to have an opportunity. Stay. You can stay in your home country, be focused, dare to dream and opportunities will come. And so when they see hey, Abdul, the first time they saw Abdul Sako, because for them, you know, you see X-Men, Abdul Sako, Thor, Abdul Sako. They, that's not something that, that you know, OK, you can say Abdul Sako, Real Madrid, OK? But <laughs> <laughs> so when they realize that, OK, the, the instructor is a guy who grew up in Montreal, but is from Cote d'Ivoire like us, you know, when the girls met uh, Elden, Jose, and Karim, they were like, "Okay, so, so they 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 just like us." So this is very important. We didn't we didn't help from everybody, but having having, but representation matters. Okay, mm -hmm. so having so having you know people like you uh, in in a, you know um, leadership position in expertise position was very very important. So the mix of you know. Those studios, those software companies, those organizations like VES Montreal, like you know, the Trojan Horse was unicorn, and uh, you know, all those organizations, you know, the experience was great because our students, four of our students participate to participate to an, um, a competition called Sony called Sony Talent Link, Link uh, League, sorry. They won the competition. They went. They traveled to uh, to Spain, to Japan. They come back and say, "Okay, this is possible." So, we really want to thank you, thank you, thank you very much. We won't take much of your time. Well, thank you very much. You know, and, I would um, say that uh, when, as much as it's a uh, thanks to us, you have to understand that it's a thanks to you and Eric because this is this is something, and I keep on telling you guys, this is something that is bigger than us. You know, we try to do something that is it's brand new and something that can actually make a big impact. And that's also a reason why uh, I joined because we can really impact the the young in there. We can make a difference with them. Hey, Melanie. Yes. Hi, Melanie. Um, hi, hi, Melanie Punk. Oh, hey, hey. And you hi, everyone. Uh, I, you I just fixed my technical issue. I'm sorry. I, I really love I really love what just happened here because um, you know they say that you never leave a room without making sure that there's somebody who can continue on or build on to what you have. I am um, uh, I really have to apologize because I have to step away, but I couldn't have stepped away until I made sure that there is somebody who can bring a voice that is in regards yes. to what I provide. So Melanie, uh, the baton is yours. Run with it, my girl. And um, Abdul, always a pleasure to see you, Dedi, on Ensemble, and uh, have a good discussion, right? Melanie, you was an instructor of the 3D animation for the first quarter of Afrobraphic, but can you please mm -hmm. introduce yourself? Okay, so my name is Melanie Pongo. I'm out French, out <laughs> Ivorian, and so I'm a 3D animator. But right now, I'm currently working uh, at Isar Digital as a head teacher for the cinema department. Uh, mm -hmm. So right now, I was a teacher at Afrovafix. I mean, I'm still a teacher at Afrovafix, but right now, I'm also a teacher at Isar Digital. So I work on different production, like as VFX and feature animation, like Paw Patrol, Pinocchio, like uh, various projects. So yeah, major, right now, right major, major, major projects, <laughs> major projects, right? Uh, can you tell us about your know, experience uh, so far with Afro VFX? You know, because you you had the that um, you know very hard task, you know, to introduce 3D animation to to them, which is not not easy. So, what was your reaction when uh, you saw the response from the the, the students? And, and you uh, a few few weeks ago, you was in Abidjan too. You met them. So, tell tell us about all of this. 
Yeah, I, I was in Abidjan. It was like since uh, like almost 10 years since I haven't been there. So that wow. was really great, like going to the Isar uh, sorry, the, the, the Orange Digital Center, meeting them because I had like a really great like pleasure to meet them since there was uh, like uh, some students and we had like some talks about 3D, also about 2D, like everything about the industry and stuff. So I like answered back their questions. Um, and also like about like working with Afro-Relifix, I was really surprised because some of them were really motivated. And also besides uh, the program we were providing to them, they were also like trying to ask questions like on social media for like uh, maybe like push that projects more. So I that was like a real pleasure because like it's always like great when you're a teacher and people are really interested in what you do. So like, I, I discovered like many talents and I hope like they're going to maybe come to Canada one day so they could work with us i mean and then maybe go back to to ivory coast i mean make sure they go back to ivory coast so they can maybe yes. develop the industry and work on their own projects on their own films like i mean that would be great okay so well, outside, for me outside of afro vfx you know when it comes to the african continent and your craft what what are you your goals your dreams Okay, so for me, it's like, it's very simple. Like I had like a lot of talks with a lot of different people. So, you know, about what we can do in, in especially in Ivory Coast. What I want to do is maybe develop a school, like develop like a program that we can have so we can teach properly 3D so people, so that people, they can do their own project, like develop their own films, their own feature films and stuff, and even advertising. And and for me, it's very important because this is the like the country of my of my father. And what about you, Abdul? Um, I'll say for me, you know, the the number one goal will be to, I'll, I'll say the dream, and it's it's gonna be a reality is to have an actual feature animation movie made in Africa, everything done from scratch. So basically, the goal that I would love to see is to have a full-blown studio in Africa. And mm -hmm. from that studio, we can also have a type of uh, school. So basically, you, ha it, you will have the whole thing done in Africa. So going from the student that, that we're going we're gonna to give some formation, those same students going to graduate, go to the studio, then they're going to be able to make that movie about a story mm -hmm. based off Africa. So it's that that day I will be able to say that we made it. Yes, and 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 we are lucky to have you know studios in South Africa like you know Chocolate Tribe, you know uh, the um, Kogali in, in Kenya and stuff. So people are doing stuff, so we are very proud of it. So yeah. thank you very much to 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 for so for the end. We have a message for the world since it's World VFX Day. Uh, so everybody who wants to to uh, to contribute, wants to help, wants to be part of it, wants to be inspired. We are all we are always looking for mentors, you know, to give feedback, to um, to interact, to give uh, master online master classes mm -hmm. and stuff. So uh, feel free, you know, to reach out. You know, you can go on afrovfx.com on 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 our social media, whether it is LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram. So be part of it. Be part of it because. Um, um like like we all, uh, always said um those kids over over there they were not waiting for us they already dare to dare to dream they were already uh, uh, doing doing things so what we can do is just to uh help us you know accelerate you know and this acceleration will help us all of us you know uh, in the international uh, you know ecosystem so so thank you very much uh happy world very fixed day to everybody and uh, see you soon, whether it is in uh, Cote d'Ivoire, Senegal, Congo, wherever, waiting for you. On our ensemble. Merci beaucoup. Yeah. All right, guys.
Hello, welcome to our little corner of World VFX Day. We're super excited to be part of this. We're Pixel Talent. We're a global recruitment company operating in a lot of creative areas across this fine planet of ours. Uh, visual effects, animation, um, uh, senior positions, executive positions, artistic positions. Uh, we're a bunch of um, talented recruiters, we think, working across the globe and um, helping a lot of companies. And um, I'm Marcus, I'm based in Adelaide, Australia, working in Australia, um, the UK, across in Canada as well. Uh, been in, in the industry for a long, long time, over 20 years, and um, we've got a lot to get through. Hello, I'm Ros Webb. Um, <laughs> I work with Pixel Talent. My career, my recruitment career spans 15 years um, working across visual effects, animation and game studios. And my career has taken me to Canada, to Australia and currently back in the UK. Um, so what we wanted to discuss with you today is interview prep. There's a lot of advice out there on real reviews and how to put together your CV, but we felt that the one universal truth across recruitment mm. is that everybody has to go to an interview. And in VFX, we can be traditionally fairly casual compared to some corporate environments. But however, I think some people fall into the mistake of therefore not preparing for interviews adequately, thinking that it's okay to show up to an interview, tell them the great projects they've worked on, and that's sufficient. And unfortunately, sometimes it is not. So we wanted to put it out there to have you guys send us questions, any questions you had about preparing for interviews, and we would help answer those for you today. The main topics that we're going to cover is how to prepare for an interview, some of the things you should do before an interview to find out as much information as you can, help you prepare for the interview itself, and also to help you prepare some questions that will really help you get to the, the nuts and bolts of what it is that you really want to know about an organisation. Perfect. And so let's just jump straight in. So talking about the pre-interview prep, um, look, obviously, we're going to assume people have read the job description. Hopefully there's one available. If there isn't, then ask for one. It's also really good to find out a little bit about the people that will be joining you on the interview as well. Uh, those uh, the interviewers, um, what's their background? What's their relationship to the position? Perhaps could one of them be your manager? Uh, we want to, I guess you want to find out um, a little bit more about as much as you can about the uh, people involved. The company is probably a given as well. So we're assuming that people will have completed a little bit of a study of the, um, uh, the recent work the company's done perhaps um, and uh, look at where they're heading, maybe where they've been. Um, and if any of that stuff is not um, clear to you from the research that you've done, then be prepared to ask those questions. I think something that's that's key to find out prior to an interview, if you can, and you, you're not always able to, is to find out what the actual main skills and attributes are that they're looking for in the role. You know, a VFX supervisor role may vary slightly from company to company. You mm. may have a job description that has 20 duties listed, and it's a very exhaustive list. Some companies, these five key points are the most important bulk of the job, and the rest are just sometimes tasks that you have to do. And that may vary quite a lot. So it's important to establish what that is if you know what part of the job description is actually most important and what attributes are most important to the hiring managers then it can help you prepare your interview responses and your questions to really demonstrate your competency in those areas we did receive a question about where to uh, find information on a company you know should i ask friends should i Google the company, yeah. like what's the best way to find the most accurate information about a company that I'm interviewing? Yeah, for? it's 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 quite pertinent as well because you look. I mean, there's a range of roles that you'll be going for that they may actually be confidential as well. So then putting that out to uh, someone you know, a mate, or something like that. I mean, there's a risk that people within the company don't know that that role is being uh, advertised or it's being recruited for. Us. Just be aware that not everyone will have an um, have. Uh, an understanding of the vacancy coming up as well. Um, I think probably things to avoid would be, look, there's some sites out there. I don't think I should name them because I don't want to dispute their reputation or anything like that. But um, people will always post negative stuff on websites. If they've had a bad experience, that's going to be shining bright. I mean, I've had tons of fantastic experiences with companies, um, but I just totally forget to actually write those good experiences um, on those certain websites. So um, take it with a little bit of a grain of salt. And I think, um, you know, you're obviously doing your research. Uh, you've already looked at the website, the company's real, uh, et cetera, as well. But, um, uh, you know, uh, if you know people, 
don't be afraid to ask them what they know about that company as well, but try and be a bit circumspect about why you're asking. Most of the questions that we received were actually around what to do in an interview. So we wanted mm, to um, let's focus cover some that. of that as well. Um, Marcus, do you want to go okay. first? Yeah, look, um, in particular, uh, I get told I talk too fast in an interview. Um, and <laughs> feedback Guilty. sometimes, I'll repeat that, I get told I talk too fast in an interview. Sometimes uh, hiring managers... Um, we sort of, Pixel Talent sits between the um, candidate and the hiring manager of the company. And so we get very direct feedback coming through from uh, the hiring managers. And sometimes it can be, they just spoke too fast. So if we're involved in that interview, and sometimes we're, we partner up with companies and we, we do sit on them sometimes, um, I, I'm quite confident and happy to say to the applicant, listen, just um, slow down a little bit. Um, we get that it's all good. it's all good to be nervous it's fine but slow down a little bit so that we can actually hear what you're saying because it's a bit of a difficult line or something like that and it's often actually the way so um you try and be clear listen to the questions really carefully it's okay to say sorry do you mind repeating that or again as i said earlier to say uh does that answer the question for you as well um speaking of questions when should people Gosh. be hitting the questions Roz? Can I actually just interject on your last point? Because I think something that I was thinking about yeah. as well is that if you feel like you've covered a topic, but the recruiter or the interviewer asks you again about that topic, I think it maybe indicates that you weren't clear before. Uh, and a lot of the time people will say, well, I already, I already said that like as, as discussed, but it's either that you weren't clear when you mentioned it before or what they're actually asking is looking for a different answer. And some interviewers are really good at that. Some interviewers will say, oh, no, sorry, let me clarify. What I mean is this, this, this. Can you can you tell me about that? Whereas some interviewers are not as experienced. Like you have to remember that not everyone is a, is a top skilled, very, very experienced interviewer. Um, they may not quite know how to reword it to get to what they mean. So if yeah. you find that someone's asking you to repeat yourself, maybe ask for clarity. And um, And don't go for <laughs> too long on the response as well. I think that, you know, it, it give yourself a chance to check in by pausing and letting them perhaps ask a follow-up question or dig a little bit deeper perhaps into the into the conversation because the, st the, the conversation may start with one question but the journey of, of the answer is quite unique as well and actually something that's quite interesting so give a chance for the other person to interact as I didn't do with you Ros because you had some interesting points to add and I was just about to move on to the next topic so i was going to say that was a beautiful to. segue to the next question which was, <laughs> was should i save all my questions for the end and actually no yeah right like if, if you if your conversation yeah. naturally brings up questions that you have again rapport building right it's a back and forth conversation mm. between two humans um i would say that if it comes up naturally in conversation to ask it any questions you have around the role and the role duties probably should be addressed earlier on in the interview um, if you get the opportunity, of course, um, I would refrain from saving everything till the end, because if there's only three minutes yeah. left of the interview, that's not a lot of time to ask your questions. And if you and the interviewer have had a 20 minute discussion about the role, and then at the end, you ask a question, which indicates that you actually don't understand the role, the interviewer will think, well, what, what have we been talking about? Like, why, why yes. wasn't it? Why don't we sort of establish this question earlier? Um, and in relation to timekeeping, someone may have a meeting straight after the interview. So if it's rolling on to a few minutes beyond the end of the interview, it shows a lot of self-awareness to say, you know what, I do have more questions, but I'm aware of your time. Yeah. Can I get an email address and I'll send them through to you afterwards? And that is a completely reasonable approach to take. Marcus, there was a question um, that came through about gaps in, in careers and how people should approach that in interviews. Like, do you have any advice around that? Yeah. Yeah, look, uh, totally be honest about those gaps. Um, there is nothing wrong with uh, um, taking time out to focus on other areas of development or to have kids or to, um, you know, you've just been hitting it hard on project after project relentlessly for some time. You just want to sit on a yacht for 12 months. Kudos to you if you can do that. That'd be great. But, um, yeah, look, I mean, we're in, you know, 2023 coming up to 2024. This is the time when we can focus on the things that are important to us as well that covers areas of work-life balance it covers parenting uh covers illness as well you don't need to go into explicit detail and you shouldn't feel that you need to justify every element of that but um just f feel free to say what you want to say about it and don't feel that you're going to be judged by it i, I think 
if you're a parent and you're concerned about um, having taken two years out for um, bringing up kids from zero to two, et cetera, I, and you find that the response from the company is, so do you think you'd be up to the task now after two years out of it? I'd say it's probably not the right kind of company for you. I kind of think that it's, um, it's, it's, there's plenty of other opportunities out there. I think match one that's going to match your culture a little bit. But there is just one more um, interview question that I wanted to cover before we move on. Um, someone did send us in a, que a question about how to approach the reason for leaving question when you left your last company under difficult circumstances. Um, like a lot of the responses we've given today, I would always say be honest, but there are ways of describing situations honestly that is in a more positive light. For example, um, if you didn't really have a great time at your last company and you left, but you maybe fell out with your, your boss because you didn't like the way things were going, don't walk into an interview and say, my boss was a jerk. I didn't like him. I had to quit. I couldn't, totally. couldn't, couldn't work together. Like it's just, it just doesn't come off well. Like you want to be able to demonstrate your ability to handle conflict yeah. as one example. Um, and say, look, there were some personal differences on the team. Um, this is, I've since learned that actually this is how I deal with those situations. And I felt that maybe an, a new company would be the right fit for me. One of the questions we received was around being rejected. Someone wrote into us to say that the interview went very well. They got on very well with the interviewers. They answered all the questions they thought to a good level, yet they were still rejected for the position. What, what did they do wrong? What could they have done better? It's very hard for us to know specifically in that specific scenario what happened. However, let us tell you as recruiters that sometimes there's actually nothing you can do. Sometimes the, the production schedules change. Sometimes there's an internal candidate that gets the job. Sometimes it's just that you are really strong for the position, but what they're looking for is actually something slightly different. And it doesn't mean you are not a strong candidate. It's just that the they may be looking for someone a bit more junior or maybe someone a bit more senior. And I think if you get feedback that's fairly generic, it doesn't mean they're hiding some insidious reason. It literally could just be that it's one of a million reasons beyond your control. And I think, I know it's hard in the current environment where there's not a lot of opportunities out there, um, which we're hoping is changing, very soon um i know it's hard to not get reasons but sometimes it really isn't it isn't you what happens yeah so if you're receiving a lot of negative feedback um that is a tough thing to sort of uh, go through because you don't really have mm -hmm. a um you may not have a good reference point for it but uh you can ask people or you can actually bring that up with um you know a professional recruiter and they might run a mock interview with you or they might ask you some questions and if that happens, you probably need to be open to a little bit of feedback about how you're responding. Um, mm -hmm. Just, you know, there, there could be some small tweaks that make a big difference and it's often very hard to see that from your own perspective. So getting a third party's perspective on it and if you can get that directly from the interviewer and just uh, that you've been speaking to and just say, listen, uh, I've had a couple of re rejections. Is there anything that you think I should change? Is there anything more that you wanted to see in my interview as well? Did I talk too fast? Did I not answer the questions? You know, be open to a range and hopefully you'll get that feedback coming in. So our third section that we want to focus on is just how to get the answers to the questions that you've got. And uh, because often you feel as a candidate that you're the person who's supposed to be answering the questions. But there's a lot of benefit from you asking questions as well to sort of provide solid responses that shape that help paint the picture of what your skills are and what your core competency is as well. But I guess, Ros, the challenge is how do you ask intelligent questions that show that you actually understand the role and the complexities of it? What's, what are some tips that you've got on how you go about that? I think it's important to, as we discussed earlier, you know, review the JD and, and ask questions around the, the, the key competencies. Um, I think it's very important to try and establish where the role fits within the organisation. You know, what are the, the growth opportunities for that role? And I know, Marcus, I think you'd received a question around um, how do you how do you find out about growth opportunities without making it seem like you don't want the role that you're applying for? Um, did you have yeah. any thoughts around that? I'm a coordinator. I think specifically it was along the line of, um, uh, I'm, I'm a pr sorry, production manager, but I really want to do producing. And I've been promised those opportunities at other companies. So when do I put that into the um, into my set of questions? I, I guess 
you know, you could try and find out what the trajectory looks like for other people that have been in that situation in the past. You know, do you do you hire from within? Is that something that happens or do you tend to do most of it from outside? Um, have there been opportunities for people in production previously where they've uh, been able to move into producing roles? That would hopefully prompt a question from uh, one of the people, one of the interviewers to along the lines of, is that something that you're interested in? And again, we're all about the honesty here. It's fine to say, Absolutely. I think, you know, like there's a lot to learn um, about producing and production. I haven't had a lot of client experience, so I'd be keen to sort of sit with someone and understand that and understand more about the bidding process. Uh, but yes, it is an area that I'd like to get into. I don't think there are too many companies that will turn their back on a candidate who has aspiration. And again, mm -hmm. if it is a company that just says, well, sorry, that's just not going to happen, there are probably going to be other companies out there that you'll have that opportunity to grow. And Growth is inevitable with um, many, many candidates and not for everyone. A lot of people are just happy to do to do what they do and that's totally fine as well. But if you have ambition, you can paint the picture of maybe in a couple of years of, of um, this is of interest to me, And uh, but be honest and say that you've got a long way to go. That's how I would approach and like, it. Anyway. And like Marcus says, if, if they turn their noses up at that, then that's not a company you'll grow at. So it's, it's actually important to, to yeah. find that out. And this sort of leads me to... One of the, the big things we wanted to raise in this section was mm. one of the general questions that people always ask is, what's the culture like? What's the culture like? But what we think you should think about is what does culture mean to you? Culture could be one of many things at many different companies. It could just be pizza parties. It could be half days on a Friday. It could be great you know, maternity, paternity benefits. What do you want yeah. in a culture from a company? Because if you ask an interviewer that question, it will probably be like, oh, it's great. I love the people. We're like a family here. Or that's not yeah, that's not what yeah, you yeah. want to hear. Work hard, to, play hard. This, work hard, <laughs> play hard. Does this company provide the things to me that are important to me where I work? So like our last question, hmm. if growth is important to you, you could ask what are the training programs like at this company? Do you have a mentorship hmm. program? Absolutely. You know, if, if what you care about um, is parental benefits, then you ask about, what changes have you seen in the company in the last few years in the way that you handle maternity and paternity benefits? Where, where have you been as a company? Where are you heading as a yep. company as well? Because the cultural Excellent. development of a company is is a, a growth in its in itself, really, isn't it? And it's a constantly um, a moving target for the work life balance uh, for many people. It's it's always something that we're striving for. So it's fine to understand that a company may not have everything lined up culturally, but it is important to ask, well, where are you heading? Uh, Marcus, that was a great point. You touched upon work-life balance, and that was one of the topics we received a question about. Mm. How do you handle the topic of overtime in an interview? If you've been previously burnt and burnt out, how do you approach this in a, in, in a positive way? And yeah, get look, an honest answer. Again, and get an honest answer. I, I think really be human about this uh, again and just say that uh, recognize i would phrase it as a question and say look i totally get that we're going to have crunch times uh, from time to time in your experience um say the last six months what's it been like with your company what's uh, what have the hours been like are people working weekends is it, is that on the cards in the future um do people get home leave at six o'clock or are they there all hours uh you know and it might prompt a conversation about where the company's been, recognising some dark times when deadlines were, you know, everyone was up against the wall with that, uh, and times when, you know, perhaps say that we're actually actively working on policies to discourage people working overtime or um, we want, um, we've empowered our, our um, departmental managers and department heads to ensure that they're pushing people out the door at a certain time. So, And we're also trying to resource up so that we um, those gluts where production requirements are really high we're trying to overcome those uh, but again you would indicate that you understand the nature of the industry that you're in and that there'll be creative and technical uh, pressures at various times so that's all the time we have today for questions thank you to everybody who sent questions in to us it's been a really thought-provoking um, and interesting exercise for us as well if anyone has any further thoughts or further questions they'd like to ask us, you are more than welcome to send us a message on our LinkedIn page. There's a small message button that you can click to send us a message, or you can email us at hello at pixeltalent.co. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of uh, World VFX Day. We're really 
pleased to be part of this and uh, support this as a global initiative to recognise the amazing talent that's out there and kudos to everyone who's involved in it and thanks for listening to us today. Enjoy the rest of the day. Okay, I just wanted to come in and just say hello to everyone. I hope everyone is enjoying their day. Um, you know, I'm 
I'm really happy with everyone. I mean, everyone has been so amazing on the chat. You, you're always sending so much love and so much kindness. Thank you so much for all the kind words. A few of you already put some misty eyes in my eyes as well. That could be because I'm tired. <laughs> could also be like that. But uh, yeah, just wanted to come in and just to say hello. It's going to be like about two minutes until my talk goes in. So uh, I, have a, um, I have a video essay that I want to share with you today. Uh, the video essay is called What's Up With All The CGI Hate? Um, so I'm basically trying to like also like share some light to this problem uh, together with <laughs> Todd Vazari and also with uh, with Jonas, which we we saw him talk this morning as well. But I also wanted to just mention to everyone that we have a lot more giveaways now. And uh, the giveaways, a lot of people were asking on the chat, the giveaways are going to be delivered uh, after the stream. So the links are going to be live until midnight. So we have the giveaway of my new course. You can win my new course. Foundry Lovely, like the Foundry, the lovely people at Foundry are giving away three new Kex licenses. And then we also have uh, some pens from Victor Perez as well. We have some book from Claudia. We also have some uh, merch from VFX uh, shop and also some incredible software from Daz Element. So I'll keep sharing the links on the chat. But uh, but yeah, without further ado, I'm going to show my, my, my talk and hopefully we have time for some Q&A. If we don't have Q&A, don't worry. Well, I'll come in and we'll chat in a second. OK, so uh, enjoy. I hope you enjoy. Hi, my name is Ugarre and welcome to Hugo's Desk. I've been working in the visual effects industry for over 20 years, either as a compositor, a visual effects supervisor or a director. This video is based on an article I wrote on the Creative Blog website back in September, where I discussed some of the problems facing the visual effects industry today. Problems like the public's obsession with practical effects versus digital, the discord about films having too much CGI, and that CGI is to blame for the lack of quality on today's movies, but also about the general lack of understanding of this industry by the mainstream media and the general public. Basically, this video is my attempt to bring some clarity and suggest some solutions to solve this recent dislike of CGI and visual effects. So without further ado, let's just get on with it. It wasn't that long ago that CGI was considered cool and had the respect and admiration of the general public. Back in the 90s and 2000s, it inspired the entire generation of filmmakers to push the medium in a way that simply was not possible in the 70s and 80s. It definitely inspired me to work in visual effects. Decades later, however, it seems that CGI is not so beloved anymore, or at least that's the narrative that has been conveyed by social media and the mainstream press. So what happened? Why is there a so-called anti-CGI backlash trend in social media today? Why do we have so many articles, tweets, and YouTube videos complaining about CGI and explaining that back in the day it was all so much better? It's very easy to blame the film studios, superhero movies, popular YouTube channels, the press, or even the Scorpion King sequence from The Mummy Returns. However, the so-called bad CGI trend is perhaps a deeper problem that has been growing for some years now. But why should we care? We all know social media is not real life. So does it matter that there's a negative sentiment towards CGI and VFX? In my opinion, it does matter. I feel this is a serious problem plaguing the visual effects industry and it has a real impact how the audience perceives it and understands its contribution. In my view, it already is damaging the credibility of the VFX companies by making them scapegoats of the film industry. The more we are blamed for the state of filmmaking today, the harder it will become to greenlight projects, approve budgets, have a sustainable work-life balance, and it could even dissuade the next generation of artists from joining the industry altogether. In my opinion, there's no such thing as a bad CGI shot. There is, however, and quite often, really bad creative input, confusing feedback, terrible shot design, low budget and lack of time. 
Not to mention that often films are made by a committee of people that are not so much interested in the creative aspect of filmmaking as they are perhaps in achieving the highest grossing profits. It has become commonplace to say that practical effects are better, more tactile, grounded, and even more real than digital VFX. Depending on the concept of the project, this could be the case. And as a visual effects supervisor myself, I do believe that in most situations, the best visual effects is achieved when something is filmed for real, since it serves as a basis for the digital VFX. Having said that, the best films are often the ones which are able to merge everything seamlessly and all departments work together to make an outstanding shot. The so-called VFX experts forget that if they don't notice the VFX, it doesn't mean it's not there. Photorealistic CG renders have been around for more than a decade and invisible VFX has been an hallmark of many directors' works over the years. As Andrew Oxen, senior hard surface model at Double Negative, mentioned on Twitter in reference to Dune, a movie he actually worked on, Andrew says, and I quote, Everyone is talking about CG fatigue, but it doesn't bother anyone that 90% of these four images from Dune Part 1 are completely CG. When the director has a vision and we get time to do the work right, CG suddenly isn't a problem. I completely agree with Andrew. I don't recall anyone complaining about too much CG on Dune, or any of David Fincher's movies for that matter. I only mention Fincher here because he has become synonymous with invisible VFX since most of his work has hundreds of CG shots. But he's not the only one. Off the top of my head, I can think of some films that have not received any VFX backlash despite of the substantial amount of CG on display. Zodiac, Gone Girl, Mad Max Fury Road, The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo, Tenet, First Man, Inception, The John Wick series, Top Gun Maverick, just to name a few. VFX critics don't complain about these films because they are well directed. They have a strong creative vision and use all the tools, both physical and digital, to produce a better movie. Curiously, some people are still convinced that some of these films have no CG at all. For example, a few weeks back I wrote a post on Twitter and I was very surprised by the way it was received. At the time of the film release, most people thought John Wick 4 was all shot practically and it had very little CG, or at least that's what some VFX experts wanted you to believe. And this happens time and time again. It happened on Barbie. It happened on Mission Impossible. It happened on Fast and Furious. Let's also not forget that in 2022, social media was flooded with statements mentioning the Top Gun Maverick was all filmed for real and that no CGI was used. Later, we saw how that turned out to be. Once the visual effects breakdowns were released, for instance, from the Visual Effects Society Awards or before and after articles, we discovered the amount of CG used on that film. That's why an interesting aspect of this ongoing debate is that although heavy CGI movies have a pretty bad reputation these days, not all films are treated the same way by the critics. Movies like Ex Machina, Interstellar, Dune, Avatar and Blade Runner 2049, among others, are critically acclaimed, were nominated for various awards and won the Oscar for Best Visual Effects. Of course, all these are considered good movies and have achieved a certain status in popular culture, meaning they can do no wrong. Either they have no CGI or the CGI is ignored because it's invisible or the creative vision is so well respected that it doesn't matter how much VFX is in the movie. Another problem that contributes to the misunderstanding surrounding the VFX industry, it's its language. Sometimes when I interact with people on social media who don't work in the VFX industry, it feels a bit like a quibble over semantics where no one really understands what they're referring to. To a great extent, the visual effects terminology itself can be very confusing for both the mainstream media and the general public. For instance, some of these terms are not even used by the industry in the same way people understand them. CG, for example, means computer graphics, and it's usually something rendered in a 3D software such as Maya, Houdini, or Blender. This CG can be composited into a live action plate using 2D software, like Nuke, Fusion, or After Effects. 
but it can also be a full CG shot, meaning that it's entirely done with the 3D software with no footage, but it was still composited inside the 2D software for final delivery. A more general and broad term, CGI, means computer-generated imagery, and it's less used by professionals in the visual effects industry, since it's not specific enough, and it could mean any work done on a computer. And probably, I, I don't think I've ever said CGI these many times as of recording of this video. The problem is that sometimes both the media and the general public think the CGI and VFX mean the same thing. And although VFX is created with the help of computers, it can also include practical or special effects, SFX, that normally are seamlessly merged and digitally manipulated together with CG elements into the footage. Think uh, like digital de-aging merged with real prosthetics, facial replacements on stunt doubles, or replacing a superhero's real suit with a partial or full CG after the principal photography is finished. This just to name a few examples. For that reason, I think the visual effects industry needs a better way of explaining itself. I know it's not easy because it's a highly specialized industry with a very steep learning curve. And many times visual effects artists struggle to explain in simple terms what they do for a living to someone outside the industry. Most people can understand and visualize what a painter, carpenter or sculptor does. But it becomes more difficult to figure out what a ZBrush artist, a Nuke compositor or an FX TV actually does. These job titles are not familiar to the general public, and in a way, this creates even more confusion when trying to make sense of the industry as a whole. Therefore, it would be useful to develop a more straightforward language. For example, wouldn't it be easier to refer to someone as a digital sculpture rather than the enigmatic ZBrush artist? For the record, I have nothing against ZBrush artists. They are the best. Of course, I'm not blaming the VFX artists here, just mentioning that we could all improve communication in order to better explain visual effects to the general public. For example, just look at the wonderful work that Todd Vasari, Stefan Ceretti, Ian Fels, Stephen Fleet, among many others, are doing on social media platforms, trying to explain visual effects in simple terms and paving the way for a more mainstream understanding of our industry. We need more professionals to speak openly about VFX. I would highly recommend bookmarking this thread from Todd Vasari, a composer supervisor at Industrial Light and Magic, where for a few years now, he has been pointing out every time a film has been incorrectly promoted as not having any CGI. I would also recommend this amazing video from the Movie Rabbit Holes YouTube channel called No CGI is Really Just Invisible CGI. A great video that points a lot of these topics as well. But why does Todd Vasari even have to point this out? A possible answer could be that the general audience is obsessed with practical effects. But why is that? This trend of saying practical is better than digital might be because many people prefer the nostalgic and romantic idea of craftsmanship in cinema. It's probably easier to understand when one artist creates a physical sculpture or prosthetic piece for a movie than to grasp what hundreds of people working on a computer are actually doing. The fact of the matter is that they are both artists making something new and creative. This artistic divide is further amplified by many official behind the scenes featurettes showcasing only the physical nature of filmmaking and seldom the digital or post-production side. Back in the 90s and 2000s this was not the case. Just look at the amazing behind the scenes and extras on films like Twister, Godzilla, The Perfect Storm, Fight Club, The Curious Case of Benjamin Button. All of these films have extended breakdowns, interviews, and really detailed documentaries about the practical and digital side of VFX. For some reason, something was lost in the 2010s in terms of showing how a movie is actually made. One of the reasons these behind the scenes don't usually showcase VFX process might be because the featurettes themselves were created before the film's post-production even started. This makes it difficult for the VFX behind the scenes to be included in the home releases since the period between the film's theatrical run and the home market is so much shorter than it was before. Another reason could be that today behind the scenes is mostly a marketing vehicle for the film studio. 
and they don't seem to believe that it's important to showcase VFX, or in their view, they don't make a great story. Not everything is lost though. Some filmmakers are able to make a difference in the way VFX is communicated to the public. For example, the Marvel movie Eternals has an audio commentary with director Chloe Zhao and the VFX supervisor Stefan Ceretti, which is a treasure trove of knowledge, very much similar to the audio commentaries from visual effects supervisors from the late 90s, from which I've learned so much. In contrast with some studios, directors, actors and producers, which seems to take every opportunity to throw the visual effects industry under a bus. This trend can be problematic because most of the audience doesn't really understand that there are hundreds of people working on a movie. Filmmaking will always be a collaborative process and it's a shame that certain filmmakers still try to convince their audience that large productions are instead a small, with minimal CG, when most of us in the industry know that that is far from it. I'm just complaining here, right? So what can we do? What can be done to address all these issues? Feel free to entertain my suggestions. And if you have more, feel free to write them on the comments. Film studios need to be a bit more ethical with their marketing campaigns and not oversell or misrepresent the way a film is made. We have advertising rules regulating how companies sell their products, and the movie industry shouldn't be immune to such rules or ethical guidelines. If a certain actor is boosting in interviews that they did all of their stunts for real, and later we find out that actually it was a digital replacement or a CG takeover, then they should be challenged on these statements and make sure that all departments involved on the making of that stunt or action sequence, including the VFX, are acknowledged. Of course, the problem is that almost every VFX artist have to sign an NDA. So, most of the time, the truth about the role of digital VFX in a movie is not disclosed. In my opinion, the studio should allow their artists to speak more freely so that they can be recognized for their work, showcasing their experience, and help the public understand how a movie is actually made. On the other hand, some filmmakers should not contribute to the narrative of no CG is better. What we're looking at here is not CG. No. It's all real. It's all real. I think you feel f when it's fake. You know it's somehow artificial. All of this is real. All of this is real. No one ever says that making a movie without sound, makeup or music would be superior. So why do people say a film is better because it has no CGI? Making it sound like the film is elevated for that reason. Having no CGI on a film is a creative choice. Just like color correction, music, sound or even dialogue. These features and creative choices should not be presented as solutions to make a film better. Some of the things that can really make a difference in elevating a film or an engaging story, great performances, outstanding cinematography, beautiful set design, and amazing VFX, invisible or otherwise, just to mention a few. Having said that, filmmakers sometimes are also guilty of misusing digital visual effects, using it as a tool to solve problems that could have been fixed during filming if, for example, more time had been allocated to the production. Everyone always says fix it in post. I say let's fix it in prep. Also, the mainstream media and the general public needs to verify their sources. A quick Google search or even checking out internet movie database will reveal that most films have hundreds of visual effects artists in the credits. You just need to stay for the end credits to see that sometimes there are thousands of artists working on a film. Of course, unfortunately, not all movies credit every artist. For example, Oppenheimer or missing many artists from their credits. But that is another topic for another day and perhaps even another video. These artists ultimately are not responsible for the creative direction of a film. They produce what their supervisors ask them, and in turn, the supervisors follow the directions from the client, producer or director. The VFX industry indeed follows an established hierarchy so that everyone knows their rules and responsibilities. 
Finally, my advice to everyone would be next time you see a bad CGI shot, think of all the artists behind the scenes who had to deal with confusing feedback, lack of sleep, overwork and unreasonable deadlines, making it almost impossible to deliver a good CGI shot. And the next time you share an article or a video in where someone complains about how CGI is killing cinema, do your research and draw your own conclusions based on facts rather than other people's biased opinions. In the meantime, let's all rediscover great movies old and new and celebrate the artists, the crew, technicians and everyone making them possible so that we can enjoy this amazing art form for many years to come. Anyway, that is all for me today. See you next time at Hugo's Desk. Goodbye. Okay, I hope you've enjoyed that, <laughs> at least as much as me. I do apologize for my rants. <laughs> I do apologize for my two rants. Uh, I didn't get red this time. Oh, apologies for that. Didn't get red this time, but um, but I was almost getting really red. But uh, yeah, I just wanted to like chat with all of you because I saw some people on the chat asking if I could put this video in. Yes, definitely this video will be a standalone video on my channel. Uh, I'm planning to publish it on Monday. And um, yeah, and I, I have I have quite a lot, of, a lot of other videos that I really wanted to do because it I, I really feel that it's part on us. We really need to like start standing up for this thing. It can't just be a few YouTubers, okay? It can't be just me, Jonas, and Todd, and you know, like it can't be just us. It can't be five or six people. It has to be 20, 30, 100 people. We really need to back this off and we really need to make a stand. Otherwise, this is never going to be solved. So that means that just like I say on the video, I would even emphasize even more. Next time you see shit like this, you need to absolutely call it out and you need to retweet it and retweet it and retweet it so we can make it trending because the biggest problem that happens is that it always it always gets too late when we get the breakdowns. It's way too late to fix the problem. And we have the power to really like turn the public opinion about this. I, I really think we do. Because like I say on my video, it wasn't long ago where CGI was actually cool. You know, like like people actually enjoyed CGI and people actually had featurettes about CGI and there was commentaries and audio commentaries and videos and tutorials and and we even had like really extensive tutorials and really extensive documentaries about it. And we can definitely go back to that if the artists make a stand and also if the companies make a stand as well. It's really important that we all come together to do this because otherwise we are going to be screwed. It's just going to become a problem more and more. It's going to become an issue and it's going to grow and grow. And I'm sure it's going to grow more now with Barbie, with the nomination. I'm sure Mad Max is going to be a, a problem as well. Like we, we, we kept, we keep getting into the same rabbit holes and we need to really fix this thing as soon as possible. But anyway, just to say that thank you so much for all the love and kindness and all the messages that I got on 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 the chat here. The video will be published most likely on Monday or Tuesday, depending if I can sleep until then, because I'm pretty tired. <laughs> it's been a really long stream. And um, I've been on this room now for like, uh, how, how long have I been here? Eight hours and a half. <laughs> streaming with like little my little gadgets and buttons in my command center. So it's been a long, long day. But as soon as I can, I'm going to publish something on my YouTube channel because I really think it would be nice if we can share it around and, and just have more people speak out about this. So I, I implore everyone listening, if you have a YouTube channel, just go and do a video about this. <laughs> just Let's just go. Let's just all go and all do it, okay? Um, without further ado, like we do have, let's see here, we have... Okay, so we have pretty much, how long do we have for the next one? So yeah, I just wanted to like also let mention, we have a, like about two, three minutes uh, to go. 
Um, yeah, union is another thing that I would really also emphasize that people should really unionize. I am part of the union. I'm part of Bektu, and I'm parting of the union for years now, and I really advise everyone to do it as well. But okay, so the last remaining minutes, I just wanted to like uh, mention everyone that we still have quite a lot of things to watch today. So really looking forward to having Cinecite with Eric Chang. He's going to be talking about uh, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles from Cinecite. We also have What's Next for VFX with Ghost Effect, VFX and Gen Ingenuity as well. Uh, we still have, uh, of course, The Minds of Mandalore. So it's going to be like a huge talk with ILM and Tippet Studios um, with a bunch of people from Tippet and a bunch of people from ILM as well, including Phil Tippet as well. We're going to have that talk as well. And then we also have Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse as well coming up with Alan Aikens. And then we wrap up with Return to Normal, which is going to be this really cool panel. Um, and then, don't forget, we have an after-party on, on the World VFX Day YouTube channel. So go ahead and I will put a redirect. So when we finish here, it redirects directly everyone to that channel. But I will post links before we go today. And yeah, I guess I guess that's it. I'm gonna wrap up my little mini rant here. Just wanted to take the opportunity to really thank uh, Haley for inviting me to get into this adventure with her. Um, so thank you so much, Haley. It's been amazing to do this, and and thank you so much for for all the support. And also thanks to all the sponsors and everyone watching. And I see so many familiar faces on the chat. It's really really lovely to see everyone here. We've been running for like eight hours and, and 20 minutes. I've noticed some people here. I've been here since morning, since the morning. I noticed that. So that's a huge commitment. You're here with me in my command center. Let's just get on with this. Okay. So next up is Cinecite. And I'm, uh, well, before Cinecite, we just have a, a few words from our sponsors. And then we have Shorewheel. And then we're going to go for Cinecite. I'll see you very soon.
terror strikes the heart of Manhattan yet again today with another brazen and deadly hike. Stop it? Uh, I think so. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eric Chung. I'm an animation supervisor for Cinesite Vancouver. Uh, I'm here today to talk about the animation work that we did for our part of the movie, uh, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle Mutant Mayhem. Uh, the movie was first developed at Micros Animation uh, out in Paris and Montreal. By the time Cinesite joined the journey, it was about one year into the production. Uh, so we literally jump on to this fast moving train um, and you know our challenge was to quickly adapt and match the style and all the wonderful work that's coming out from that studio. Um, as for the rigging team, well, I've, we were provided with the models, so we put the models through our rigging system, um, and then the blend shapes were provided by Micros. Uh, obviously, there's adjustments involved, uh, extra controls needed, um, whatever works to, for, for our rigging system uh, to match the style. Uh, we had about two months of ramp up time uh, for animation, which is not a whole lot, um, but considering all the, the groundwork was already kind of done by Micros, um, it was, um, I would say, just enough time. Um, so we, we started off with receiving a couple sequences from Micros, uh, work in progress, just so we can study the, the style, um, the, the posing, uh, and the spacing that they're using. Um, and then we, as soon as the rigs are ready and finished testing, uh, we would um, do a couple of animation tests to show the directors, um, just to kind of get their blessing that we're matching the style. Um, and then once that's achieved, uh, we start building library shapes and uh, cycles for all the characters. Just to stay consistent uh, so that animators come on the show, they have something to reference to, uh, and then the, the whole show and style can, can, can look consistent. Um, and then on top of that, there are 2D line drawings on the show. Uh, so it was communicated to us from Micros that they were using paint effects lines. Um, so, uh, and since paint effects is native to Maya, uh, it wasn't a too much development work, but uh, our pipeline team had to make a more user-friendly UI, as you can 
um, as some of you might know, the paint effects tool is quite complicated and there's a lot of options and stuff. So we wanted to make sure we have predefined uh, strokes that animators can use, um, uh, ability for them to change color in, in one simple UI, uh, and then also ability to change the profile of the curve so that when they draw it, it's an easy uh, curve that they can just adjust to, to change the shape of the, the lines uh, and the color and whatnot. Um, so after we got that ready and tested um, and, and tested the tool, uh, it was time for production, shot production. Um, so next I want to talk about the uh, animation style of the show. Um, TMNT is animated on twos mostly, uh, with some exceptions, of course. Uh, if a character was up in the air and we just needed a little bit more hang time, uh, wanted to feel a little bit smoother, we'll just add the ones in there. Um, there's no really hard rule that has to be on twos, uh, just whatever fits the moment. Um, and I think like the animation on twos have a very appealing and traditional feel to it. Uh, for animators, we can focus more on the spacing and uh, the breakdown where they don't have to worry about the ones and the polish there. Uh, we can spend the time on polish and looking at the posing itself. Um, acting style, the directors, uh, they really focus on a more naturalistic style of acting, uh, acting choices. So uh, we stay away from cliche hand gestures. Uh, we usually, you know, find a good storytelling pose and we stay in it and we try to milk it for as long as we can. Uh, and we, you know, try not to move the character too much if we don't need to. And the directors are very, they know the characters very well. Uh, and they were very clear on how the characters should act. Uh, oftentimes during review, they will act on camera. Uh, we, we always had a very clear vision of what these characters should be doing, um, which helped tremendously. For animation workflow wise, it's pretty, pretty basic. Pretty, pretty general. Uh, you still go through your shooting your reference, video reference, um, you do your blocking, you do your spline, you do your polish. Um, so that's still pretty standard thing to do. Uh, I have prepared a couple clips of workflow. Uh, the first one I want to show you guys is a action sequence of a splinter fight. Uh, in this clip, uh, this was done by our lead animator Neef. Um, and in this clip of the fight, uh, he has put together like eight or seven, eight clips of Jackie Chan movies. I think somewhere there are some MMA references, um, but he pretty much took all the references, stitched them together, and then we show the directors um, to get their blessing. Um, and then we went off to, to blocking the action. Next shot is an acting shot. Um, this is done by Jennifer, one of our um, best actors uh, that we have here in the studio. Uh, so in this one here, she again, she shot reference, we showed the directors, and then we went ahead and start the process. So let's let's take a look. Live with new and confirmed information, a fly monster is attacking the city, but the turtle teens, along with the rat, warthog, stingray, crocodile, bat, frog, lizard, and cockroach lady are in fact fighting against the monster in an attempt to save New York. The giant monster is bad, but the mutants you see here are in fact good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really thought Sorry, I, I, I really, got past um, it. That's the thing from my past. past. Live with new and confirmed information. A fly monster is attacking the city, but the turtle teens, along with the rat, warthog, stingray, crocodile, bat, frog, lizard, and cockroach lady are in fact fighting against the monster in an attempt to save New York. The giant monster is bad, but the mutants you see here are in fact good. <laughs> Sorry, I, I really thought I, I had got past that. That's the thing from my past. All right, next, I uh, want to show you guys a couple sequences. Um, these are, we did about 21 sequences in total, um, and these two are uh, two of my favorites. Uh, the first one is a action fighting scene of Splinter. Um, in this one, uh, the turtles were captured. Uh, spoiler alert for those of you who haven't seen the movie, um, but uh, the turtles were captured and Splinter is uh, here to rescue them. So this is Splinter's first time in a real fight, and the directors really wanted him to uh, feel a little less confident in the beginning uh, and then progress into the master that 
that he is throughout the sequence. Um, the, the directors really wanted the essence of Jackie Chan fight in there. Uh, so the choreography was kind of boarded out uh, loosely. Um, so we then kind of reference heavily on Jackie Chan movies, um, as you can see earlier in the workflow video. Um, so yeah, let's take a look at the clip. Stay back, everyone. Go, go, go! Okay, next we have an acting sequence to show you guys. Um, this one is really enjoyable to work on. I think all the animators really liked working on it. Um, and the acting here, it's very genuine. Uh, it's really true to the characters. Uh, and you can feel the emotion and subtext on, them on every shot. Uh, and the credit really goes out to, you know, all the wonderful animators that we have uh, and the great direction from the directors. Um, and the general idea here is that Splinter feels like he's losing his kids uh, because they want to be out in the human world. So he figured he'll throw them this surprise party um, where um, they can feel like they're in the human world, but in the sewer. So let's have a look. Surprise! Ah! Oh! <sighs> Dad, you really can't keep scaring us this? like that. Welcome home! Why are there balloons in here? Dad. What are you doing? Look, I'm not stupid. I know something's up. You, you do? I do. You're done with the sewers. You want to be in the human world. I went through your stuff. And I found your human clothes. What the I hell? Dad, how did that even... Those aren't ours. even get in our stuff. Boys, boys, it's okay. I think I maybe found a way to make you happy. Uh, look, Dad, uh, we appreciate it. It could be anything, but it has to be pizza. I uh, have pizza, right. What are you doing up there? Don't lie. Tell me. Are you in trouble? Is something wrong? Is someone trying to milk you? It's no, never is milk. trying to milk. Why us, do you Dad? always jump straight to milking? Do you need help? Anything you need, I'm here. No, 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 Dad. Dad no, look, no. We're, yeah. we're just running errands, shopping, getting the stuff we need to live down. Yeah. yeah. Really? That's it? Yeah. Yep. That's mm -hmm. that is quite so literally nothing it. Nothing else. <laughs> All right. Well, hey, Dad. Thanks for the surprise party. Yep. Appreciate it, Dad. We will be leaving. Goodbye. All right, so that's uh, that's it for the animation presentation today uh, for our part of the movie uh, for TMNT. I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Thank you very much for watching. See ya. Okay, we are back. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Hi. <laughs> How is everyone? We're still here. We're still alive. <laughs> just wanted to like let you know. So I just wanted to flag something up to the audience. So we are now, since we have been running for eight hours now,
flagged twice for copyright strike on YouTube. So in case the stream goes down, um, uh, although I, I must say to everyone, I did, we cleared all this up. We went through the copyright system on YouTube. We checked everything. Everything was cleared. I double, tripled, cleared everything for the last five days. So I'm not even sure why we're getting copyright strikes since everything was cleared before. But anyway, we're getting them anyway. So that means someone manually is doing a, a copyright strike. I'll do an appeal later, but I just wanted to heads up to everyone, but that if for some reason the stream goes down because of the copyright, don't worry because I will put it back online as soon as I can. So if it does drop, the only thing that will happen is that it will give you like a, you know, the wheel of death for a few minutes and then it will come back. Don't worry that I will put it back again. But, um, but yeah, there's no copy. No, there's no copyright infringement. You're right on the chat. And also like, the weird thing about this is that we have permission from all these studios and also not to mention that I've tested all these videos for the past week. That's the only thing I've been doing the whole week. Tested 160 videos on YouTube. So, uh, and a lot of the studios were so kind of tweaking the videos and putting new music in the videos and all the studios today were amazing at helping us to tackle this. But I'm just warning everyone that it might happen, but maybe it doesn't, we'll see might not happen. It's been twice now and it didn't go down. So maybe the YouTube gods will be kind to us and we'll see. Um, but anyway, it, it is a shame that we can't, we're not allowed to show our work. That is really a shame. Um, again, goes back to the topic of my video, I guess YouTube, YouTube claims as well. <laughs> maybe I need to do that. But anyway, I'll leave it to Ailey as well. We're going to just chat for a minute and then we're going to leave you uh, to start the next, uh, the next panel really. Yeah. Um, so yes, uh, thank you again for joining today. We're super pleased with the support and um, really looking forward to the last few talks. So the next one's up at five o'clock. I just wanted to take this opportunity as we have a little bit of time just to let you know a little bit about World VFX Day and how it came about. So um, I'm Hayley Miller. I am the founder of World VFX Day and I've been in marketing and comms for about 10 years and visual effects for about five years. I've worked at Territory Studio, MPC slash Technicolor, and uh, most recently at Pixamondo. And um, now I'm just doing this. <laughs> um, so the idea came about because last year I was looking for a day like this, um, you know, the usual sort of social content calendar uh, planning and couldn't find anything. So I thought, oh, it'd be really good if we did have a day like this. And um, I think back in July, I started kind of putting the feelers out and seeing what people felt about that. Um, and most of the feedback was really, really positive. I think obviously it's a really tough year this year and there was a bit of sort of concern of, over whether we do it this year because of the strikes and so many people out of work, myself being one of them. Um, but I just really had a gut feeling that we we needed something like this to bring people together across the globe and just showcase VFX. Like I work in marketing, so I'm not at the coal face. I don't do what you amazing people do, but I'm in awe of what you do. And I really do have such a passion for VFX. And um, this is why I wanted to start it. So it was really first and foremost to collaborate bring people together and hopefully make a difference in working with other organizations um, to use World VFX Day as a platform to really highlight some key challenges and um, some positive parts of the industry as well. So, so that's a bit about that. As for the future, um, I invite you all to, to give feedback on this day and, and what you would like to see happen on World VFX Day and we can work together. I genuinely mean that. So please contact me through the website. I will read everyone's emails and um, yeah, together we can make it what we collectively want World VFX Day to be. And who knows, maybe we'll have an in-person event in the future and other things. So yes, that's a bit about that, but please feel free to ask any questions. <laughs> Well, it goes without saying, thank you so much, Haley, for, for sorting all this out and for organizing all this out and inventing all of this of, of this event because it is it is really magnificent and it's amazing to see the amount of people that you brought in and the amazing event that you pull off in such short notice. So congratulations for that uh, because it's been amazing and the feedback speaks for itself and we've been having huge numbers over the whole day. We're almost at 10,000 views, unique views. So it is great. Uh, congratulations, Ellie. 
Thank you. And thank you, Hugo. Hugo's been putting so many hours in as well. So around the clock. Um, so yes, we there's only the two of us working on this, obviously with the support of all the studios and individuals around the world <laughs> making this day happen. And I can't think of any other industry that could make it happen this quickly. And it just shows how much passion and support there is in this industry. So I feel really quite humbled um, watching everything today. Um, and I just wanted to quickly have a shout out to um, some of our sponsors, um, which means we can keep going with this. Um, and that includes Chaos, UPP, UFX Studios, The Yard VFX, National Film and Television School, Dazzle Pictures, Das Element, Next Gen Skills Academy, and SideFX. So thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. I have them on, on the screen right now. So thank you so much for all the amazing support that you provided to making this stream a reality. Um, and I, I have the best compliment ever, uh, Haley. A uh, couple of, like um, like during the day, someone contacted me on, on LinkedIn and thought that the stream was really slick and really cool. And they were asking me how many people were operating all of these things. <laughs> and I was like, it's just the two of us, man. <laughs> it's just the two of us. There's no one else here. You see, there's no one else here. There's I'm, I'm alone. So uh, we're both alone here. <laughs> so yeah, but it's it's been great. So uh, well, without further ado, I guess, um, unless you guys have all questions, I mean, we do need to like, um, we're going to do a little break now because we need to start prepping for the live call so I, we need to bring in everyone on a zoom call so we're just going to put a, a board up like a sign up and then maybe take this opportunity to drink a coffee or stretch your legs or get some water or maybe just close your eyes for a minute <laughs> and um and we'll be back at exactly five so i'll i'll see you all very soon um and yeah go and stretch your legs for a bit okay see you soon bye
Hello, welcome back everybody. I hope you've got your teas and coffees ready for our next four talks um, before we move over to the after party for more talks and um, showreels. For now, we are very grateful to welcome David Lebensfeld, uh, president of Ghost VFX and Ingenuity Studios, who is going to be interviewed by Dan Sato, who's the co-founder of Animation World Network. And um, yes, we're really looking forward to this talk on what's next for VFX. Haley, thank you very much for inviting us and uh, welcome everybody. We're, we're pleased to uh, be part of the inaugural World VFX Day. As um, uh, Haley said, I'm Dan Sardo. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of Animation World Network, awm.com and VFX World. And it's my pleasure to join you today with our guest, David Levensfeld, who's the president of Ingenuity Studios and Ghost VFX, who's going to share his thoughts and give us the benefit of his hard-fought VFX industry experience as we talk about the current state of the industry, how business leaders are preparing for the post-strike land, uh, post landscape, while they hopefully get people back to work. And the big question on everybody's mind, kind of what's next? What's What, what can we look for in uh, 2024? And as a quick note, we'll do our best to squeeze in uh, some questions if we can at the end of the session as we finish up. David, welcome. Why don't you introduce yourself and then we'll dive right into some questions. Thanks, Dan. And uh, thank you guys for, for having me here. Uh, like mentioned, I'm David Levensfeld. I'm the uh, president of Ingenuity Studios and most recently Ghost. Um, Ingenuity is a 20 year old company that we started 20 years ago uh, as is Ghost. And most recently we've we've joined leadership teams and joined efforts. Um, so that's that's me. That's you. Um, so let's we're we're going to dive right in, uh, David. Um, we're coming off two big strikes. Productions were shut down for a month. That. Yeah, you heard you heard about that. You heard about that. Um, uh, and and productions are only kind of now just starting to ramp up, and some of them are not even coming. You know, they're not even returning. Uh, it's quite a tumultuous time for streamers and the big studios. We've had some VFX industry layoffs. Some studio closings, some industry unionization efforts are springing up here and there. The cinema box office hasn't rebounded as we'd hoped. Things are a bit unsettled, to, to say the least. Um, how have these realities kind of impacted the overall industry? And where do things stand now as we head into 2024? Well, I don't think I'd be alone in saying this has had a tremendous impact on the industry as a whole, uh, you know, VFX being certainly part of it. Um, you know, being in the community, it's a little hard to tell how much, you know, we have a front row seat to how we're affected, but of course, everybody across uh, all disciplines in, in film and television have been affected as well. Uh, I, you know, it's been, it's been devastating. We've seen studio closures, of course, we've had to do layoffs like everybody else in the industry. Um, and obviously this is all in response to strikes, but prior to the strikes, I think this was also in response to studios figuring out their model. Um, so, you know, the, the double whammy has been, has been difficult to manage uh, and unfortunate, but I do think that we're, we're coming out of it and there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Obviously the strikes are over, um, but there's a priority for the studios to figure out how the model works and then we'll see a ramp up. Well, speaking of, of, you know, the, the, the new model and, and whenever there's a tumultuous time, we all kind of wait to see what the, where the equilibrium, re, how it reestablishes itself and what's kind of the new normal. Um, there was a, uh, Let's focus on the streamers for a moment, because a huge amount of the visual effects work has come from episodic uh, uh, productions, and that has really been spread all over the world. There's a lot of regional shows and a lot of regional studios have been doing a lot of the work. Um, what has been fundamentally kind of what ha what was the problem leading into the strikes with regards to how the streamers were bringing on? studios like yours and how has that how was that impacted by the strike any differently than just everything shut down well i think the there's been a globalization of of content in general right and it's been led by streamers um because they have reach across the entire globe 
uh, different than, you know, say broadcast television or something here in the States where it is very localized and that type of work happens locally, um, which has enabled studios like Ingenuity to grow in LA and, and you know, in the States, essentially. Uh, the globalization of it is, has created a bunch of studios across everywhere and I think is riding a, a growth in the industry itself, all of these studios have have grown. So I think overall, it's been a, a net positive. And it's also enabled studios like ours to, to work with other studios and other locations and access talent um, across the globe. So prior, prior to the strikes, I mean, I think for the industry, it's been a, a completely a net positive. Uh, I'm curious to see how this plays out after the strikes. I mean, you know, you mentioned what new normal is. I don't think anybody who has spoken today or part of the industry really has a, a clear picture on what new normal is. I mean, I think it'll be better than what today is, but uh, you know, we'll, we'll have to see, but overall, I think in the past, it's been a net positive. I think it'll continue to be a net positive um, as, as the globalization of VFX continues. Um, it also enables, you know, artists that are, that didn't have access to, uh, to doing this type of work uh, professionally across the globe. Um, to shine so yeah and we'll I, I was i have okay. a, I, I i have a question specifically on that which i'll get to in a minute but i want to touch on something that you mentioned with regards to the this this trend you know there's been this this real globalization of the industry what has um obviously with the pandemic but even before the pandemic with the expansion of uh and increasing use of cloud-based technologies and pipelines and and the speed in which work can be done which enabled a global workforce much more than in the past but from a business standpoint what has pushed this globalization has it been i mean you guys have 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 studios and locations in a lot of different places around the world as a lot of others do what has what's been behind that push to expand and in the way that you have um in the various places that you have what's behind that that's a good question i i mean i think it's really three things it's it's access to talent without a doubt um you know being able to access talent that you don't have locally it used to be the case where you had to drive into an office if you lived in la to to do work and that's who you had to do the work you know 10 years ago or whatever uh it's it's access to local markets so having an office in Argentina, you have access to, to uh, South American, we don't have an office in Argentina, but for example, you have access to the South American market, which is, a, well, you know, Latin America is a big growing market. So that there's that. And then the last piece is, you know, truthfully, you know, cost. It's their, their cost centers outside of the United States or the United Kingdom um, that are, you know, help you uh be a healthier business and and make margin so that's really those three things that i think have driven it and looking at costs also is part of that equation you know the economics of it is that also that a lot of it, uh, there's a lot of regional support tax incentives rebates mm -hmm. and things like that that make it that are part of what makes it, it, it i mean it, part of that is done by regional governments be ostensibly to bring in talent you know to help support talent in that region um but is well, that also part of talent, but economic economic growth as well i mean it, it's obviously of course talent but but it is driven by a uh, building industry that's not uh organically there does that help um does that help buddy you know not just uh new professionals new artists but people that have been in the industry for some time that had to go to london or vancouver or la now they can stay closer to home or even stay at home because there's just a lot more regional production that's going on. Yeah. And and a growing, not just regional production, but also a growing industry in general. There are other aspects of this industry that need visual effects or need the talents of somebody who has visual effects skills. Um, that's not specific to broadcast or streaming or features, you know. That's that's also something I wanted to get into. So let's jump to that for a moment before we uh, jump onto the getting uh, beamed a little bit more on the biz side. Uh, <laughs> um, Let me see. Adjust a little, Henry. 
as you look at the profile of the business, the type of business and the type of work you guys can take on, um, how has that changed as the technology, the skills, the artistic and create, you know, the creative and technical skills that are needed to create digital entertainment type content? There's been an explosion of areas outside of, you know, film, TV, uh, and games, let's say, that require that. How has yes. how has that impacted kind of the profile and scale and scope of the work that you've taken on and would like to take on, and consequently, opportunities for your artists to work on different things and expand? I mean, I think it's, it's alternate revenue streams and it's volume. So I think those two things help sort of build up a healthier business. Um, it used to be the case where you know, 20 years ago or whatever, uh, it was really feature films and broadcast. Like that's, that was the avenue for visual effects. And it was, you know, the industry then was of course in its infancy, infancy. And then we've seen the growth of streaming help, help fill in a lot of those gaps and the breakdown of a normal TV schedule. Cause it used to be a slow summer and all of these things that help really normalize your staffing levels and your projections and all these things to build a, a healthy business. And I think that what's happening now and what's been happening the past couple of years with these emerging technologies, I mean, top of mind probably is like the sphere, right? These types of things uh, help help really normalize your, your year and your staffing and your projections because it is another avenue. It is another revenue stream. Another example would be um, uh, concert production, right? Oh, the visuals and concert productions, I mean, look at the Eras tour, right? The Taylor Swift one. The the production value in these things have gotten insane. And they require uh, skill sets that we studios, us studios have. So being able to tap into these other worlds, these other sort of industries has been a great benefit for, I mean, speaking for us specifically. Yeah. Got it. Um, Let's talk a little bit about business development and how studios approach business development because um, coming out of the strike, obviously, but is one thing as business starts to ramp up, whatever that means on whatever pace that's happening. Um, but it's it's apparent to everybody that the kind of spending like drunken sailors that the streamers engaged in a handful of years ago, that that's probably done with. Um, are things pretty much the same as you as you're having discussions now uh, as things are wrapping up? Are, is there um, is there any perceived difference that you see in the way that vendors are taking on work, what they can charge for it, and how quickly is are things are you being pressured more, it, 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 so to speak, in what you see as the new set of work that's coming in, or is it pretty much okay? We're just getting back to our normal. It's just going to take some time. Um, it's an extremely competitive landscape at the moment. And I think there are a handful of factors that are going into it. One is that it is, you know, their studios are, are visual effects studios are coming out of what is really a difficult time, um, and have availability and are hungry for work. So naturally you have a, a supply demand imbalance that's, that's going to be competitive and drive prices down. I do think that <clears throat> productions know this and they are, taking advantage is a negative way to look at it, but playing to the market, right? So you're, they're able to, to play studios against each other to get a cost, uh, a cost down. And I think that that, at least for me is it, may, it clouds the landscape a little bit and makes it a little harder to see. Um, and I think that we'll have more visibility into that probably in the next six months, uh, what that really looks like. But I suspect that I suspect that, that budgets are down um, and, and studios are going to have to find more efficient ways to do things, uh, be, you know, just reacting to that, even, even when the supply demand balance comes, you know, closer. Uh, but that's always been the thing, right? Like that's always, that's always happened. Uh, the, the cost of this stuff should go down. I mean, that's how technology works. Uh, you know, whether it, you know, in this case, it, it's probably driven by the strikes. It's it's driven by maybe a, a, a I don't even think it's that big, but a, maybe a bursting of a bubble. Um, but I, but yeah, we'll have to we'll have to compete uh, and do more with less. Um, looking ahead, as you 
look at the work that you have been doing, the work that you think you'll be getting onto in 2024, and whether it's whether it's kind of the same types of productions or some of these new things like uh, location-based uh, projects. Um, are there any specific jobs within the visual effects production arena that you see will be more in demand in the coming year to two years? Are there any growth areas that you think, you know, this is, these are new way. I mean, we've got, there, there's, uh, and it, we could talk all day about things like, uh, you know, generative AI, and there's this push towards open USD and pipelines and stuff. These are new, relatively new, um, they're not new technologies, but their their expansion and use within the industry is, is, is explosive right now and should continue that way. Where do you see some opportunities for people as far as when they look at where they can fit into the visual effects workflow and pipeline uh, in the coming year and two years? I think that you, I think that we'll see a, a bigger push to the return of proprietary development. There was, when visual effects were in the infancy, uh, you would have studios that that built their own tools uh, because there weren't really a, a slew of off the shelf tools that you were able to use, right? And I think as the years have, have gone on and, and the industry has matured uh, in this cycle, in this generation, uh, off the shelf tools became very common. Uh, and you can build studios off off the shelf tools, and they were great. And you, of course, build tools around those off the shelf tools. Uh, but I do think that we're seeing a renaissance in the technology. I mean, I'm sure I'm not the uh, first person on VFX Day to mention this, but you know, AI is of course coming in, and regenerative AI is coming in. And I think that that studios that are able to build tools with AI. Mm -hmm. um, and build proprietary technologies will will stand out in ways that the last cycle, the last generation um, sort of went away. So to answer your question, I think that the the jobs that are going to be in demand uh, for studios in the next the next generation, the next phase of this, and I really do think that we're entering into the next phase of this, will be coders, will be will be computer science people. Um, which of course is going to be difficult because then we have to start competing with technology companies that are well, way better funded than we'll ever be. Um, but I, but I think that's real. And then, you know, the second to that, I think real time, you know, unreal game engine, I don't know if it'll always be unreal, but you know, real time uh, artists that can cross over between gaming and uh, visual effects will, will certainly be in demand in the next, you know, foreseeable years. This the, the 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 I certainly hear of so many studios that everybody seems to be using Unreal Engine for something. They're testing, yeah. they're doing some part of it. It seems like that is a that one of the things that is limiting their use is just they they have to train their own people because there's just not a, there's not enough people that know that is is that is that feel accurate? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. For sure. And there's crossover to virtual production and you know, these things that are emerging in, in the film world. So, yeah. Right. Um, in the, in the capture, future, you know, all of these things that, that are performance capture that use these real time technologies. Right. Right. Um, in, in a few minutes we have before we will see if we've got any questions. So here's the big ambiguous question that could mean anything, but kind of like what's next? You know, we're getting together on this day. Um, the visual effects industry is as important as it is in all of, you know, entertainment content creation. Um, you know, it, it's always been this kind of, it's, it's, it's always been the necessary evil within, within kind of the big studios that are throwing money at, at this work. And it's always been tumultuous and it's always difficult. Um, what's next? Where, where's the ray, where are the rays of sunshine? Where are the, um, you know, we're you. I know that you, you know you're running a big business. You have to watch every dollar that you spend, and every to, to make sure you've got a dollar, at least a dollar and a penny that comes in to pay it. You know, where where are the rays of sunshine? What what makes you optimistic, and consequently can make the folks that are joining us today feel that they've made a good decision to be a part of this industry? Sure. 
I think that this is probably the most exciting time in visual, aside from like the business stuff and like how much content the studios are making. This helps when I do this, by the way. Um, uh, aside from, you know, the, the volume that studio is making and all the noise that that's happening around us. If you look at the actual visual effects industry itself, I, I think that this is probably the most exciting time to be in it since the start of it. I think that we're sitting on, on what will be a fundamental shift in how work gets done. Uh, and I think that'll provide a lot of opportunities. I think it'll, I think costs will come down, but I think it'll democratize how this work gets done and the volume will go up. So overall you'll have, you'll see growth in this industry. Um, and I think it's going to be on the back of, of more content, maybe smaller budget stuff made locally for different markets, for different, you know, specialties or, or different interests. I think you'll see that because those costs will come down. So you'll see just more stuff, Right. Kind of like how there's like a magazine for everything. I think there'll be a show for everybody. Um, and maybe it's not, you know, a hundred million dollar budget show. Maybe it's a million dollar budget show, whatever. But these things will need will need visual effects. And I think that we will be using a new set of tools to, to do it. And I think it'll be driven by AI. And I think it'll be driven by real time. And I think that we're going to, it'll be driven by being able to compute on the cloud. You, you won't need your, you know, an enormous render farm to do this stuff. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's something to, to be optimistic about it is, it is an exciting time, uh, developmentally. So you're one, you're one of the folks that looks at using AI as an, uh, as an example, uh, you're not seeing the doom and gloom with regards to AI coming in and obliterating the job force and the need for creative talent. Sounds like you're seeing kind of the, the opposite that the, that this is a time that we're on the cusp of some really explosive growth because these tools will allow just a, a much larger volume of content to, to be custom created, so to speak, by folks who may have never been able to get that work before. Yeah, that is what I'm saying. And I'm not saying that, that there isn't a potential for doom and gloom for AI, but it's not gonna be exclusive to the visual effects industry. So the the doom and gloom that is the potential of AI is gonna rock the, the entire world. And the solutions that we need to to have a healthy society, I guess, uh, will need to be will need to be sorted on a much larger scale on a much larger level than what what is happening in visual effects. Got it. Um, I'm gonna uh, uh, call out, shout out to Hugo or, or Haley. I, I can't see. Are there any questions that have come in that we might want to get to in the last few minutes? Am I back? Yeah. Yes. You're back. <laughs> um, there are there's actually quite a lot of comments in the chat that I've been struggling to keep up with, but I have um, a couple of questions on my of my own. Um, so, David, you've been in the industry for twenty years or so, and um, it's really quite encouraging to hear you say that um, you still have a sort of positive outlook after everything that's happened this year. What we had a talk earlier about the sort of key moments in in VFX uh, history. I was wondering if there are some key moments for you, just to kind of get a bit personal um, for a moment, and um, why you love VFX. Sure, I think a, a key moment for me, and, and I think this is kind of similar to the themes that we were talking about today, is I was I was able to start Ingenuity because of a revolution in desktop computing, right? Like the, the stuff that we're talking about, the democratization of tools and, and being able to, to build studios in the cloud and, and do all of these things is, is, is very similar to how, how Ingenuity was built. It was on a literally a desktop computer using combustion and After Effects and Avid at the time had the Avid Mojo, I believe it was called, which is, you know, the Firewire plugin way to, to capture video. And it enabled me to build a studio. Um, and I think that we're, we're seeing that now. And I think that's why I'm, I'm positive about, about it, because I have experienced this directly, the, the upside of being able to use, use these tools without a severe amount of funding to get into it. And this was back in 2004. So this was like really at the start of, of this stuff. Um, and you know, similar but different. I the the company was started doing music videos, and 
and it it had a, a bit of a moment like what we're seeing now with uh with these streamers and the content that's being made in that budgets came out of those things back in 2003 you know it was like the height of napster and all of these things that were revolutionizing the music industry so while you know it's music videos and obviously different it it shrunk these budgets it made everybody scrappier it made everybody try to find new solutions to to do things and that's what you know, I was sort of at this intersection when when I could provide a solution that was still of the same quality that was more expensive to produce even a handful of years prior. And the music industry is still here, you know, certainly they're, you know, it's in a different configuration, but it's still just as influential, if not more than it ever has been. So that's why I'm, I'm positive about this. I, I think we're going to see a moment similar to that. Great. Love that. Um, and maybe a last question. Um, you're now president of Ghost VFX as well as Ingenuity. What is next in terms of those two businesses? That's a great question. Thank you. I'm glad I got to talk. <laughs> Ingenuity and Ghost have actually very similar backgrounds. Ghost, Ghost coming out of Copenhagen and Ingenuity coming out of Los Angeles. Uh, both companies were started doing short form, like I mentioned, uh, Ghost doing commercials more than music videos, but Ingenuity doing music videos and, and commercials, short form stuff, really uh, scrappy companies trying to find uh, solutions that were about putting pixels on the screen. Uh, those types of projects are really about just get good looking things on the screen. Um, so the, the companies themselves are very similar. Uh, both companies will will continue to operate separately as studios. Uh, so the the future is is building both companies with very similar and complementary skill sets, but being able to provide a, a big studio solution to our production partners. So together we have we are a large studio, but your experience going to either Ghost or Ingenuity uh, will continue to be as it was prior. Fantastic. Well. Thank you so much, Dan and David. We really appreciate your time and your support for World VFX Day. Um, don't know if you have anything else you want to sign off with. Otherwise, we can let you get on with your lovely sunny days over in LA. <laughs> Getting killed over here. Um, thank you guys for putting this together. Uh, the visual effects community is, is a really strong one. Um, and it doesn't always get, I mean, as, as everyone here knows, it doesn't always get the light that it deserves. Um, and I think that we have an outsized influence on really the the end result of a of a product or project that we don't get the the spotlight. And it's not that we need the spotlight for credit or all these things, but I think that there's a a, a lot of work that we can do together to build the respect that um, really this industry and all these all of our artists need um, and should have. That's at least complementary to uh, the respect that other trades trades get. So I think doing things like this are extremely important. I'm really appreciative that you guys did this. Yeah. Oh, thank you it, so much. It's uh, I know it's been a, 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 a Herculean effort to get this all everything wrangled to get this uh, inaugural event done. It's it's sorely needed. It's very much appreciated as, as David was saying. And uh, I just also want to wish, you know, thank everybody for joining us here and wish everyone a happy, healthy and fruitful 2024. <laughs> Take care. Thank you so much. See you Thanks, soon. everybody. Bye.
All, all right. Hey, gang. Hey, everyone. Is this, is this, is this the world? This Hello. is the happy World okay. VFX Day. Um, Excellent. This is uh, this is going to be our group, unless we're able to figure out how to get Phil Tippy to show up. But welcome to the Minds of Mandalore um, uh, panel discussion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, we, we've got here is we've got people from ILM and uh, Tippet Studio, and kind of the focus of this. It's a short short discussion, but it's going to be about um, kind of how these two teams kind of work together to do um, to kind of use practical like set construction and miniature photography in kind of in concert with um, uh, digital set extension, digital production and the like. So, um, so I want to just kind of turn it over to, uh, to you guys. Maybe we can start out by talking about kind of right. like the design of, of this. How did it kind of get started? Great. Uh, I'm Simo at uh, visual effects supervisor at Tippett studio and First off, I just got to say that, you know, Favreau and, you know, those guys in Mandalorian are just so awesome because they're, they appreciate the physical reality. And, um, you know, from stop motion to that we've done for them in the past to um, set building and but also embracing the new technology like Unreal. And um, it all started for for us at Tippett. Um, when they reached out to us um, because Favreau had seen Mad God and really loved the richness and the feeling of that, uh, the backgrounds in that, and wanted that same kind of vibe for the minds of man. Um, and so then it went over to the ILM model shop um, and they mocked up something and then it came to us and the direction was to dress it photograph it so they could use it um, to scan and create a, an environment that we could location scout, essentially. Um, mm -hmm. And that was incredible. Um, the location scout was all with like, you know, the VR headsets and stuff. And so scaled us down and we were walking through this mine that uh, was about, you know, four feet by two feet and you know in reality but yeah. just super expansive once we got in there so that's the gist of everything that that happened mm -hmm. and uh cool cool um mark or cam you want to add anything to yeah um when we got the uh the set it was essentially like a foam cut out set and it had all the geometry that we needed to work with and it was actually made sectional so that it could explode and we could work on it individually uh i sat down with phil and we kind of uh figured out a little game plan for it where whereas i would do a lot of the initial um like you can see from the photos, we just started texturizing it. And I did a lot of kit bash with a lot of uh, bits and pieces that I had here, old model kits and whatnot. And, you know, the way that they used to do back in the day in the ILM model shop. And the idea was to give it this feeling of this, you know, this underbelly of the city where it, had, you know, sewage and everything had come and kind of gone through here and um, it had been forgotten and derelict. So it was just like a lot of texturizing, a lot of putting pipes and everything in there. And then, um, you know, we made our, we printed out a little Mando about, you know, this big, the right scale so that we could uh, take a look at it. And then uh, once I got it to a point where I felt like it was a, a good starting point, I handed it over to Phil. And in one of the photos, you can see Phil is starting in on it. And he he kind of mad godified it. He uh, went in and did stuff that um, uh, kind of just took it from like, oh, it's just a sewer to like, this is like a very weird alien environment, you know. Um, you know, you can see here in some of the photos we had like this, it was like a ground plane with like rust and and oil and everything going up the center of it and a lot of detritus and then uh what we wanted to do was give it a sense of like these my it was these mines down there and there's beskar 
that was scattered about. I know that it's considered incredibly rare. This is like a sample of like what raw Beskar looks like. You know, we propose this and it's essentially mica and Phil took a bunch of it and scrunched it up and, and kind of embedded it into the walls, rust and everything like that. And he kind of finalized the look on it. We had two setups we actually had to do. It was this one, and then there was also another one, which was like a little catacomb, which has a rotisserie or whatever. We'll, we'll get to that later. But um, yeah, that was our process on it. It was just kind of like, I kind of like set it up and then Phil just knocks the ball out of the park for finalization. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and we tried to tell a story with this. I mean, you know, these were working mines at one point. And so we tried to have mine equipment and corrosion was a big deal. I mean, if I could describe the aesthetic of Mad God, which I got to work on for 12 years uh, shooting it, it's, you know, we used rust and shellac. Those are like the two things. And we told Favreau that. And um, the shellac, you can see, is it, it gives you all that like rich specular detail. And that is huge, especially in a dark scene. And so there was a lot of shellac uh, thrown in here. And the beauty of, uh, of the mines is that it's dark and damp and, and, and uninviting. And so we, we are able to like cheat. And for example, all this stuff hanging here is just trash bags, black trash bags hit with a heat gun. So it just looks like stuff that had wrapped around pipes or whatever for insulation is just like dripping down and then hitting that with shellac. And then if you light it in a certain way, you get all of those specular pings and it really you know transforms the space quite a bit. Ooh, yeah, I inexpensively, oh, sorry. So that text select note, I just remember sticking out as something that John Favreau really enjoyed about uh, the space that you guys had created. And down the line, when we were kind of working on the digital part of it, um, absorbing all these all this amazing work that you guys had done, we kind of lacked some of that. And we actually brought Phil in to take a look at it. And that was one of his notes was, you know, I would often, and I think, wasn't it, it's like some sort of ground up bug resin. I can't remember. He had some specific work that was created from. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And beetle, I think it's beetle, beetle, yeah, something like that stuff. <laughs> and then once we kind of uh, dressed some more of that uh, specular detail, and it really kind of started the same. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's so, so cool when that happens because that informs sound design and everything. It's like when we were doing that uh, virtual scout walking through the mines and we would look up and see the digital pipes that you guys did uh, which in the, the the layout and everything looked totally awesome what you guys were doing and then we would look up and be like wouldn't it be cool for just some there's just some drips of water going down so the sound design there's oh, there's water the drips everywhere and all that and then if you're having water drips in the foreground if you you know shoot any of that then obviously you need wetness everywhere and yeah. i think that's one of the th first things that we we looked at and said yeah it, let's slather this place with with you know wet stuff and mm -hmm. uh seeing the end result that you guys did in the digital realm was just like yeah man that's that's what it that's what it needed to be wet and uninviting yeah. so Cameron maybe talk a little bit about that like how did you kind of turn this into a digital set what was that like we took the you know the incredible model work that we've just seen it's fun I haven't seen those photos and it's been a while um <laughs> and then scanned them in and used them as you know as the rough uh, outline of the space as well as kind of sifted for parts there was a lot of uh you know some of the details that Mark and Simo were talking about um especially when we get later into the crone area, um, little totems and gears and bits of organic material. It, it really has this, this fun blend of, of the sort of industrial mechanical along with some odd kind of uh, more organic pieces that gives it this creepy vibe. Yeah, and Corey, yeah, if you can show the behind the scenes, behind the scenes. Yeah, okay. this stuff. Yeah, stuff, when you when you model oh, wait, build no, like no, this, sorry, yeah. sorry, go back to the lighting setup oh, because yeah, I think yeah. that's an important thing because everybody sees the the beauty images, but you 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 don't usually see how you know ugly it is from the outside, you know. <laughs> but this this is informs what it is. So um, it's foam, you know, and 
look what you can do with foam. Uh, and you can see there's holes cut in the side where I just bashed some holes in the side just to get lights in there because we're just trying to sell a feeling from a, a single angle. And um, because of all the, you know, the, the specular stuff or the wet stuff in there, I just put punch holes and put lights in there. And, you know, it's kind of akin to the way, you know, computer graphics lighting is because there's lights coming from nowhere, but they're just as important as, as practical lights because they create a feeling, you know? And the thing that's great about working on small sets is you can just bust a hole in it, you know? And it's yeah. it's fast and quick. And you can see the amount of, you know, lights that were used on this set just to get like all the subtle rims and everything there. And I think you that's get a lot of texture for free when you do something also uh, at this scale, because it's like you could mix coffee grinds and sand and all this stuff together into like a slurry and just like paint it on. And it, and you can, you can completely get that surface, like just looking fantastic in a very, very short period of time. Whereas, you know, if you were going to build a model and then texture it and whatnot, you know, uh, it could take months and months to get it feeling just right. Whereas, you know, with something like this, we can get it looking fantastic in a couple of days. I totally agree. I mean, there's all these little details, as you're, as you're saying, from the physical standpoint that you just can't get immediately when you, if you're just going to start modeling inside the computer and to have all of this as the ground that we built on, you know, it's interesting to think that it's ultimately was going to be a digital set, but it all started from a physical practical model. And all these cool details really would have been very difficult to, to get, I think, if we hadn't started in that way. And then having the lighting uh, studies that you're talking about, Simo, is just really cool, too. It gives it a, a vibe right away that you're starting from. Um, you know, Ben John really loved the Mad God uh, aesthetic, so it's pretty great. So we, yeah. you know, I was just asking about when you're building the physical set, did you draw any of this, like in terms of these materials or this stuff for any of the physical pieces, maybe the surface that they were walking on, or was it all projection and digital? I think that's a camera. Is that to me? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Uh, well, and we had artwork from Doug Chang and his team and that um, defined some of the spaces. Um, and then, uh, you know, this kind of gave it the, the vibe um, that, I remember early on when the episode was kind of being uh, shown, you know, our production designer, Andrew Jones and Doug Chang, John Favreau, they kind of had this idea of like a, um, almost like a Dungeons and Dragons map where each space that you're moving through in the mines is a, a different type of area. And, and this was its own look and feel. And, and it was great to have, you know, a whole different team providing a different type of, of aesthetic from what the, the mines itself, you know, the, the physical buildings uh, were. I yeah. gave it this very creepy uh, feel. Uh, they're very unique from where you started up above and where you eventually get to down below. Um, so yeah, yeah, we had a, a bunch of artwork and uh, Simo was alluding to, you know, the, the VR scouts were amazing to be able to move the lights around and move the camera around and see all the details. And what if we put the camera here, we put the camera here. Yeah, and back to what you were saying about the um, the physical informing the digital. It's like a lot of times with physical stuff, and you see it right here. It's it's happy accidents, and right. like you know, this process here of of dissolving foam using acetate and just this blue foam. You can't, you know, you can loosely control what it's doing, but the the chemical is going to do what it does you know right. and then so it's it's a little bit like like informed jazz to where you do that and some things that you would never expect uh to happen happen and they i call them happy accidents they happen in the digital world they happen in the physical world they just inform you like sometimes we'll see a daily and it will be messed up a render error or something but it'll inform a, a certain look or something. Oh, that's interesting, you know. And I feel like AI is doing that as well. So there is some wonderful things of just chaos that uh, inform form imagery. Yeah, the way that the materials blend together kind of has this this like you said the happy accidents that you couldn't really model purposefully. You know, you, it, if the way that a shellac interacts with a foam, it with interacts with the way that it's sort of melting in parts and not melting in others. It's very cool. It blends just to really fun 
uh, textural detail to everything. I would not recommend it to anyone spraying <laughs> <laughs> acetone like this, but you know, Phil's an yeah. old hand at it. <laughs> yeah, hardcore. So this that that was um, the beginning of the um, the layer. Uh, the Crohn's layer. Uh, yeah, the Crohn's layer at the bottom of the mines where there's that robot spider thing, if you remember. Um, and Mando is confined into a rotisserie and Mark was tasked with designing that. Mm. This was a fun piece to do because it was, uh, you know, Doug came to me and he said it needed to feel like it was cobbled together from found parts or whatever it is. And I literally did this. Anybody who knows their Star Wars uh, vehicles and whatnot will see bits and pieces from uh, model kits and tanks and stuff like that that I use to, you know, there's like a generator with a little engine and it's got, you know, uh, and then it's just got a spinning thing. I digitally modeled the, um, it's supposed to be like a, a door, a doorway or something that's been repurposed for the base. And then I digitally modeled that and the rotisserie itself, but the rest of it is mostly, uh, like a model build, just whatever I could find that looked interesting went into it, you know? Um, and it, it really helped doing it that way because then, I was able to just add, you know, with wires and stuff like that, like add a real sense of scale pretty quickly. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun to make. Yeah, this one was rad because it was like, Mark, here, you do the Thanksgiving turkey, just throw that shit in the <laughs> middle, you know, and then uh, Phil and I dress the the outside and, you know, originally i think it was like a like a witch character so phil had this idea he's like oh i want to do these kind of salt runes and everything and um you know so we did all that and then we're like oh totems with spikes oh we're gonna put mando heads you know helmets on the spikes and make it really hardcore and so it was it, it, the, the freedom that that the the showrunners and filmmakers give us is just super inspiring it's like old school way of doing things it's like you trust the people that are doing the craft and then you get it and you can make changes and everybody's happy because it's a collaborative medium and uh, so this was a really fun little little set to to light and dress it's really fun too because it's such a moodily lit space that there's you kind of find all the little details as you as you watch it you know it's not a a brightly lit scene where you can see all the stuff immediately you kind of as you go through the scene there's you, know, you can see some of those totems those spiked pieces with helmets on them and from the mando you know, bits of mando armor um meshed into the ground and all the weird kind of oozy organic details yeah and these these were the kind of the the lighting setup for it just to try to capture that same exact kind of mood where it's kind of abstract because there's just so much stuff happening uh but you have your central little hearth of you know the mando rotisserie mm -hmm. and uh what was cool is like this is total phil style with these um these like uh tentacly weird things and it was you know we 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 did a gamble on that one and you know favreau was like ah oh, that's cool like you know so it, it's always good to just like throw in some some random organic material uh, you know to complement the harshness of uh, the metal rotisserie and all that and the spikes yeah it gives it like this almost intestinal this sense of unease when you're in this space the bowels yes. <laughs> yeah. yeah totally yeah those are the the feeder hoses for uh gas and stuff like that i always try to you know make the form follow function you know make, try to make it make sense Excellent. Exactly. Yeah. I think we're getting close to the end of our session. So I guess any kind of wrap up thoughts, like how, things that you would maybe you you do different if you're doing this exact thing again, or things that you discovered along the way, they're like, definitely have to do this again, because it's worked like. Well, for me personally, I don't think there's a way to do it different. I think this was different from the get go because it's it's you know a lot of stuff is purely CG now, and the fact that these filmmakers and and showrunners uh, you know were confident enough in in the history and legacy of the craft to understand its value was 
awesome. And, and, and it's true. It worked. And it's like, you know, from the, the doing the practical stuff to working with the digital artists that just made it spectacular. It was just like, you know, hand in hand and complemented each other wonderfully. Totally agree. It's just a really fun uh, collaboration between the digital and the practical. You, know, you just wouldn't get the same level of detail, the same uh, type of aesthetic. I think if you just did it, you know, fully digitally, um, really fun. That's what it's about, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's always great when you can get your hands dirty and get away from the computer. Uh, yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Well, great job. Cool. Um, thanks for for uh, taking the time and um, and uh, look forward to whatever comes next. Oh, okay. oh, cool. Sure. Sure. I mean, so, in terms uh, of like scale. For the character, yeah, the I think it was one thirty fifth, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's like one scale and the the he the, the mind man does it, all right. Yeah, this guy here, he looks like he's he's maybe the size of like a. I think he was about this big, so that would kind of it, that was kind of like a tricky scale. We just kind of like eyeballed them. Um, mm -hmm. Or... The, the the this one here i think is 124th or 135th something like that okay, yeah and uh you know shot this one with a 24 millimeter lens but also did some um uh played around with that crazy we have this crazy 14 millimeter lens that's like that you, you, I know you've seen it before. It looks like a gun, like a barrel. It's insane. And you can stop it way down and get into tight areas. Um, and uh, I th think we got, we shot some of the shots that we sent over to ILM with that. Mark? <laughs> well, for me, it's, uh, I think it's, it's always been a just get in there and do it. I mean, the way that I started uh, initially was I would just buy, go to hobby shops and, and buy like their cheapest tanks and stuff like that so that they weren't that precious. And then I get them home and I just like start tearing them apart and building robots and stuff uh, out of them. Uh, you know, it's it's really about like just getting over the hump of thinking that you need to make something perfect the first time just get your hands dirty um you know and it can just start with something where you build a character and you make a little base for it and then just play around with the different medium like different clays and uh and whatnot um it's really it's really about not being so precious about it when you start. I mean, when you look at a lot of this stuff here, when we were building it, um, it was just like mixing stuff up and slopping it on. If it doesn't look right the first time, then you try something else and slop it on. You do a few tests beforehand, and then you just kind of go at it, you know? And then, you know, at a certain point, I would just kind of let it go and let Phil and Simo kind of hit on, on top of it. And then, you know, that because at the end of the day, you know, they say like for most artists, um, a piece is finished when it doesn't feel like they did it. You know, <laughs> it's like it gets to mm -hmm. the point where you 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 start losing your what, what they call is you start losing your hand in it like it doesn't look like you, you know, you came up with it. And that that's very satisfying to work with someone like Phil and Simo. It's like I'll get it to a certain point, and then they'll hit it with something, 
And then I'll come back and go, oh, that's really interesting. And it'll form something else that I do on top of it. And everything kind of builds from there, you know? So not only get in, getting in there and getting your own hands dirty, but get, get your hands dirty with other people, you know, seek out people mm -hmm. who do this kind of stuff and just dive in. Cool. Thank you so much for answering the questions. Um, much appreciated. Hale, you no had problem. another one, didn't you? Yeah, this one was quite interesting because it's being used more and more um, from AJ Maud. Are you using photogrammetry, uh, photogrammetry rather, to bring the sets into the digital world? Absolutely. Yeah, we yeah. use photogrammetry a lot. And there's a lot of new tools that are constantly being developed, you know, uh, for doing this kind of thing. Um, but yes, so having the physical model, we've done it on other pieces in, in uh, past seasons, um, being able to to photograph and, you know, you know capture that the geometry of a space as in incredibly invaluable awesome. yeah it's 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 great um i remember back on teenage mutant ninja turtles it was i don't even know like 10 years ago 12 years ago where i used photogrammetry on um i got some books and just aged them because we needed to dress a you know their little lair because they're little kids and, you know, got some books and aged them and shot, uh, built a rig that basically shot photogrammetry of the books. And then you'd have a, a model, rough, but it's fine for, for dressing, a model with the textured, um, you know, uh, imagery on it. And I was like, holy, sh this is going to bring back like physical art department. This is rad. And it, it worked for that show. And I knew that the future was going to be like, you know, you know, no one's going to be purists anymore. It's going to be like physical, digital, whatever, whatever makes the shot. And it was that moment that I really realized the power of, of that kind of thing, merging the two together. Nice. Any more for any more before we head off? No, I think I think we're done. Thank you so much for all the questions and and thank you so much for showcasing this amazing piece of work. Thank you so much for taking the time to cool. joining today on this amazing event. Thank Thanks you. Putting... Thank you. And thank Thanks you for putting on the World VFX Day. We are our people and it's important <laughs> that we come together. <clears throat> exactly. Course. Appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay. Have a great day. Thank Cheers. you. Thanks. See you. See you soon.
Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Alan Hawkins. I'm the head of character animation on Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. And today I'm going to walk everyone through uh, some kind of character evolution stuff, uh, sort of what the process was like um, developing Spider-Punk, Hobie Brown, and also The Spot. So I've got a couple of different keynotes to uh, sort of walk you through what that what that um, evolution was like. So first up, I'm going to show you some early explorations uh, for Hobie. And, um, you know, starting off when we're <clears throat> getting going, we get biz dev and character development art from uh, from the spa side of things. And so here's some early rough sketches of uh, Hobie's design before we even have the models or anything. Um, and some other cool pose explorations. And one of the things that's really great about this, um, you know, this may look like really rough, like you, you you can see how the color fill on his arm is outside of the edges of his line work uh, or things like that that appear messy. And on another movie, that might seem like something you'd be like, oh yeah, we would just make that actually line up. But for Spider-Verse, um, that's intentional. You know, we always want that kind of extra um, sort of, uh, custom and um, handmade feeling of things. And obviously with punk being uh, sort of anarchist uh, in nature, like, you know, not conforming to uh, coloring in the lines, things like that. So that's all intentional. And that all has to do with like the goal of who the character is going to be. Um, and there's another great pose on the right. Like this was very informative for us to figure out how we were going to pose him uh, compared to other spider people. Um, and then, so here's a little more of a finalized design, something like this eventually gets turned into a turntable. Once we have the model, we'll match this pose and do a 360 before it goes into rigging and whatnot. But this is sort of our beauty pose for him where we li uh, landed. And you can see that there's a lot of line work that is off of the silhouette and that kind of thing. And that's all stuff that we used special tools to help develop, um, because that was all intentional. Um, so next I'll show you one of our early explorations. So this is. Uh, a quick animatic test from um, the film. You might recognize it from the Meet Hobie Brown sequence where he's talking about who he is. Um, and uh, this was before we had uh, an actual rig. So in order to get testing the look of the character um, in backend departments, we kind of do these really slap together um, hodgepodges of characters early on before we have the actual rigs and models and whatnot. So this is a Miles that we've kind of modified and stuck a vest on and gave him spikes and that kind of thing. But the real point here is to try to figure out how to handle the cutout look, like the sort of zine art style um, for all the back end departments to get going on. So we do this temporary stuff and this is what they come back with. This was a really cool um, final-ish version of that test where we were trying all the different cutout things. And what we're wondering here is like, how much is too much? Like, how are we going to make him fit into the world with other characters? How is this going to fit against Miles? That kind of thing. Um, but this is pretty cool. And this was all done before we had the actual rig. Later, much later, we revisited it. Oops, that was not supposed to have audio. All right, so we revisited the test with uh, the final rig many, many months later. Uh, and you can see uh, how it kind of evolved from that other version. Um, and then this was rerun one more time uh, for everybody to use the final version of the tools that they had developed a long time ago, but with the actual rig and the actual uh, model. Um, and so kind of going back in time a little bit, going to talk about posing a little. This was some inspiration that we were using um, to try to make him feel more different than other spider people. Like with Hobie, we didn't want to have um, your typical Spider-Man poses that everyone can imagine with the like um, legs out and feet together and all that kind of stuff. We wanted to feel different. And this was some pretty cool, crazy push stuff that was really inspirational. And so we took that and started doing some pose tests and we got a handful of really cool, informative things out of it. And what you're seeing here with the um, superhero version of the rig, that's what we call it when it doesn't have the face on there, it's just the mask, um, is actually not just 
rigging uh, pose at work. We have a lot of tools that we're using to make these really graphic, um, sharp angles and things. Um, a lot of silhouette sculpting tools and uh, a new one that we developed called the trowel, which really helps give you nice, strong, straight lines on uh, complicated multiple surface geometry. Um, so once we got these poses out there, we felt like we were really finding some cool stuff for Hobie and figuring out that we were going to make him how we were going to make him a little different from everyone else in the film. And then uh, this was one of our first performance tests. This is obviously Miles uh, with some slapped together funky geometry hair. But the goal here was to kind of see how this Hobie world and design would play against other characters. So obviously there's Gwen and uh, we're exploring some other things here as well, like how uh, his frame rate would be, about how to do the different cutouts, if we want to have layers. There was a lot of thought that went into that and we did it a lot of uh, a lot of ways that didn't quite work, frankly. That's part of the learning process is like figuring out how to do something um, in the coolest possible way. And when the goal is so hard to put your finger on what gives it that right feeling, it, it took a lot of iterations to figure it out. Um, and some of the things that can make it look a little cheap, we learned, is if things look too cut out and slapped on top of each other, like if your arm feels separate from your body or things like that, it kind of felt a little like... Um, I don't know, not not quite expensive enough, frankly. Uh, so this was what the um, the final test ended up being. Um, I think we learned that there was a little too much going on with this. The frame rate stuff wasn't quite working. It was a cool starting place, but I think you learn obviously a lot more from mistakes than you do from successes. And this was very informative for us um, for when we came back to him later on. And we did this very early in the process. And he kind of went on the shelf for a long time before we came back to him when um, he showed up in the film. So uh, during that time, we got his actual character design, which is this, as we know, um, and his model sheets. And one thing that evolved a lot with him is, you know, when you think punk rock is often kind of larger than life, uh, obnoxious in your face kind of personality stuff sometimes. And uh, when Daniel Kaluuya came in to do the voicing, that changed all of it because he was so cool and controlled. And I think it really made for an awesome uh, balance because he was aggressive and assertive in a certain way, but like very controlled in other ways. Um, and it just really upped his cool factor. And I think it made him more unique as a result. So this is our first uh, performance test that we felt like really nailed um, who he is. I believe this was animated by Eric DeCarolis. Um, and, uh, you know, as you can see, there's a lot less going on with the cut out big shapes in the background. Um, and uh, that we have the subtle cut out line work around his silhouette from time to time. And then we're doing a lot less with breaking apart different limbs. You can see here, like his arm is a different layer than the rest of his body, which we were exploring. Ultimately, we didn't do too much of that. There's a formula that we figured out later, which actually had to do more with offsetting his jacket and his guitar from his body. So it wasn't like individual limbs. It was kind of like large, chunkier shapes within his silhouette being offset with different frame rates. So like maybe his body would be on um, threes and his jacket would be on fours or things like that. So you got this kind of chaotic um, offsetting and layering to it. Um, and then... I believe, yeah, there's the lit version of it, which is pretty cool too. All the different render styles that they developed for him, which were really awesome. Um, and then uh, I can't show you the actual rendered versions of these shots from the film, uh, but I'll show you what some of the performance uh, final versions are. So these are our animation play blasts. And I love this scene because Hobie, he kind of has an agenda. He knows what he wants. He's trying to tell Miles things without being too direct because I think he knows that if he just tells him what to do, he's not going to listen to him. Uh, and he recognizes that in Miles. Um, but he has, you know, some wisdom to impart on him. And I think this dynamic that they have was really awesome performance, especially the way Hobie kind of plays chicken with him. He gets up in his way and blocks him. And then Miles just walks right through him and stuff. I mean, I, I really love how this ended up. But you can see the application of all those other rules that we talked about and the performance there, too. Uh, and then I can show you some 
performance stuff that's a little more action oriented. So here is uh, one of the best uh, action scenes with him, in my opinion. Uh, this was animated by someone named Reese Suke, and uh, his posing is so graphic and dynamic in this. Like these are really aggressive. It has all those rules that we were uh, trying to set up in those earlier pose tests um, at play here, and uh, it just really stands out compared to other Spider People moves. He's super dynamic and really, really happy with how it turned out. Um, and then. Yeah, here's some stills for the for those extreme poses. Really awesome, great clean silhouettes, nice strong lines. Very cool. And then the one time in the movie that he smiles, which is very enjoyable. So uh, next I'm going to hop over to Spot to show you guys. This should be end. Hopefully we can see the spot now. So kind of the similar process that I'm going to walk you through. Um, a lot of things that we learned about uh, spot from things that didn't work. Lots of things that we learned from things that did. Uh, this is one of the earliest tests. It was done by Peter Nash, one of my old mentors. Um, and this is, again, not spots model or rig. As you can tell, this is a... Peter B. Parker from the first movie who was modified. And the whole point here is to figure out, you know, style of motion, how many, you know, this is obviously very gag oriented, as you'll see, it gets very comedic. And that was a big part of his character, especially in the first part of the film. Um, but, uh, you know, this is the kind of like early exploration stuff that's really fun. There's there's no right answers yet at this point in the process. Like it's just it's almost kind of intimidating because we have no no rules or parameters yet. We're just kind of exploring wildly, but it's always really fun. And we learn a lot from it about like the rules of the, um, or what will become rules for the spots and things like that. So next test, uh, I believe is animated by uh, Siki Ori Thorhansen. And this one, I think we're getting to figure out things a little bit more. The timing is a little closer to what you would consider Spider-Verse animation style. Although I would say it's still fairly broad I, you know in the movie we were more restrained with spot ultimately but obviously very funny and lots of infinite variety of gags that we can use the spots for um and it's just like i don't know a lot of fun to watch and do and come up with different things uh and then the next one this is a performance test i can't play the audio for it but it's a line from a movie um, and obviously now we have uh, Spot's rig. Um, we've got uh, his face on there, and I'll talk about that a little bit. So early on, um, there was an idea that his face spot would be really expressive. It would be all kinds of things. It can make any shape. It could change his head silhouette. Um, and while it's really cool and fun and I'll show you another test in a second with like a bunch of different poses, which are all really amazing. It complicated who he was, I think. And it actually took away from his character a little bit too much because what's cool about him as a villain is that his identity was kind of stolen from him as a result of the accident or whatever the choices he made. And he's kind of barely a person. That's what makes him sort of ostracized. It's like, you know, he's kind of a freak and he doesn't even have the ability to show anger or sadness or whatever, like, which uh, is kind of tragic, but I think it makes him a lot more complicated. So ultimately we decided to keep his face spot simple. And I think there are a few minimal times where it like gets tiny or maybe looks a little angry or things like that. But Really, we wanted to limit him and make sure that it all came across in his performance, um, which I think was a great acting opportunity um, and challenge. But this stuff is obviously super cool and really well executed and animated. You can see how sometimes it gets a little like venomy or that kind of thing. And we didn't want to confuse what his nature was. So really boiling it down to just the spots, I think, was the best choice. Um, and then here was an early pass at uh, a character one sheet pose, the kind of thing that might be used for marketing or that kind of stuff. And it, in my opinion, it didn't quite land yet. Like this guy sort of looks like he's trying to be a superhero or something. It's the way his posture works. 
it feels, I don't know, a little kind of out of the box or too simple. And so we wanted to explore ways to make him more complicated um, and more of a rich character. And uh, that led us down a pretty interesting path. So Humberto Rosa is my number two uh, animation supervisor with me on the film. And he came up with a pitch for Spot, which is to have him be inspired by Egon Schiele. Um, and Egon Schiele's self-portraits, as you can see, are very uh, uncomfortable and kind of gnarly. If you look at the posing and some of the ones in the middle, you know, his hand posing is very specific um, and kind of gnarly and and uh, it's very interesting. And I think it really ended up suiting Spot uh, well because he's kind of socially awkward. He's He's got internal um, struggles and he's unhappy and all kinds of stuff. So here were some um, test sketches that he did for Spot as well. And we did some performance passes um, with his little outfit and also without to see how that would play. And I think they were really successful. Like when you have no face, the body and the hands become the most expressive thing. And, you know, in terms of what people audiences look at and what we as human communicators look at, it's usually eyes, mouth, hands in that order. Uh, everything else is kind of subconscious. And so, um, having, putting that much emphasis into his finger posing, I think really made him more rich and robust, um, and also making him feel a little uncomfortable in his own body with the way he's kind of like scrunched up and closed off was a really great choice too. Um, and so next I'll show you what kind of the evolution of his spot powers are. So here is sort of a wedge that Humberto also drew on his own about as he was powering up how we would represent that when he's traveling from dimension to dimension off camera and building up the dark energy. And we kind of settled more on uh, like C4 when we find them in um, the Mombatan sequence. But there are some elements in A that I really love the way his hands are all dark and we utilize that later um, in terms of like momentum. So I'll show you a shot in a second where he swings his arms really fast and as he does all the spots collect into his arms and hands through that momentum before he throws the, the spot out of himself, which I thought was really cool and aggressive. Um, and then this is also uh, a test that Humberto animated himself. This was an attempt to make it more interesting than just um, throwing black Frisbees around. This was to kind of pitch that the dark energy has sort of a uh, almost electrical type feeling or inky uh, streak line kind of thing. Um, but I, I love the simplicity of this. And I thought Humberto did an awesome job on it. Here's another one that he animated as well. Uh, and this is not quite the one with the charging up hand stuff that I was describing yet, but this is another example of it, um, which was really cool. Play that one more time, kind of building up his anger. There's a passive shaping that we also would do on spot to make his angles a lot more dynamic, which is not represented here. He looks a little kind of rounder, but sort of his finaling involved giving him some like really strong angles on his shoulders and face. Um, and then one of the last tests that Humberto did was this one. And there were, this one was really cool. I think we got a little too loosey-goosey with the walk stuff. Uh, he had a few too many to drink that day. But what I like about it is that it is uh, kind of erratic and hard to track. You're not quite sure what this guy is going to do if you were walking towards him on the street. You'd probably steer clear um, just because of the strangeness of it. But um and you can see some of the body posing stuff that I was describing about making stronger angles uh, in his shoulders and head and that kind of thing, which I think made him more interesting than just a regular human anatomy looking guy. Um, and then uh, this is actually jumping back in time a little bit. This is a test um, for when Spot would be all the way powered up. We referred to him as Biss. Um, and this, I believe, was animated by Nick Kondo. And this is pretty much all 2D. There's some CG elements in here and stuff. But this was one of the coolest early uh, power-up tests that we had done. And then uh, here is an example of um, our animation play blasts for uh, later stuff in the film when Spot is completely powered up. And you can see how much of it was decided in animation before it got to the effects departments, which they did amazing stuff amplifying what we had done 
and putting so many complicated layers on top of uh, the performance that I think really elevated it in awesome ways. But we did try to define a lot of the um, like burst frames is what we call it when you have um, you know a, a flash of a really fleshed out uh, illustration within the scene. Um, I might be able to let this one boop on its own. Yeah, here we go. Um, so I believe this one was animated by, animated by one of uh, our team named uh, Nadeep. He did some really awesome stuff with Spot. I believe he also did the one where he says uh, uh, our future as he's finally becoming completely overpowered by the uh, dark energy. But really awesome stuff in here. I'm really happy with how uh, he evolved as a character. He's so, you know, his personality changed as he got more powerful. At the beginning of the film, he is bumbling. Uh, he's insecure. Um, he wants to impress Spider-Man, but as he kind of comes into his own power, he, we started animating him more stoically, more controlled. He moves less, which I think is a lot more scary and intimidating because he knows how powerful he is and he's really focused on it. Um, I believe this one was animated by uh, somebody named Eleonora. She did a great job on this one. Um, and then I'll move ahead to one more little sequence of shots, which is here. Okay, so uh, I won't play the whole chunk on these. I'll just go right to the looped clips. This is one of my favorite scenes, and this is the one that I was talking about where the spots collect in his hands as he swings his arms. And what I love about this scene so much is that he is, as he's approaching Camry, he seems fixated on Spider-Man. He's not really paying attention. He's even gesturing with his hands and stuff. And then in this surprise twist, he knows that uh, the other spider people are attacking him and he switches so aggressively to get them out of there. And I just love like how broad that move is and how, um, and the idea to have like his hands collect all the dark energy through that like really powerful momentum swing of his arms, I thought was super cool. And it's, you know, quick blink and you miss it thing, but I think that's the stuff that makes him so awesome. Uh, so that's one of my favorites. Um, here we can see, uh, another example of that electricity stuff that Humberto had tested. We use it um, very sparingly. This was here because he's screaming at uh, Miles. He says, just a joke to you. And so that seemed like a good appropriate moment for it. Um, and these are the final versions, which I'm not allowed to play, but you can watch them on your own. Uh, and I believe... <laughs> No, one more set. Okay, I get to show you these good. Uh, these are also some of my favorite bits in the film. Uh, so here is the sort of an example of that controlled performance that I was talking about earlier. And what I love about it is that like he is being very specific with his motions, but you get these like bursts of chaos popping out of him. Um, and we did that with using multiple rigs um, layered on top of each other. We have these tools that can create like stamped geometry, um, like sort of break-offs of poses um, that we call the pose stamp tool. Um, and then a lot of like um, 2D sketchy stuff that we threw on top of it. Some of it gets passed down to the downstream department. Some of it does not. It's just there for creative indications. Um, and I love the scene so much. If I, if I had a chance to change anything about it, the readability of the hand turning from white to dark, I feel like could be stronger. If I had a chance at this shot again, I'd probably just have his hand in place the whole time. So all you saw was the stuff changing. And that way it's not complicated with the extra motion. But that's the way it goes sometimes. It's still an awesome scene. Um, and then same stuff going on here, like really controlled in his motion, but still very chaotic. Uh, and then I love the sound in these two. I wish I could play it with it, but like he's just so calm as he's threatening them. He disappears kind of crazy. Seems almost as if he's not doing it himself, but I guess that would make him seem even more intimidating. Um, and I believe, I believe that's everything. 
Yes, that's it. Oh, cool, man. So um, <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that. It's nice to share the kind of behind the scenes stuff. Well, that, that was amazing, Alan. Uh, thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. Um, that was just absolutely amazing. Um, I just have to say, you know, um, I do apologize, but we won't be able to like take questions not live here. But if you could stick around on the chat, you can stop sharing your screen as well if you want to. Um, sure. So yeah, so so basically, uh, just wanted to let you know that there's there's quite a few sh there's quite a few shots um, on the um, on the chat. So maybe maybe have a look there and and check. Uh, sorry, I, I wasn't turning on. My sure, video. I'll pop in and answer whatever I yeah, can. Yeah, there's a couple of questions regarding renders and regarding how you've achieved the shader, the the drawing shader, and there's there's quite a quite a, some technical questions here as well, and which are really interesting uh, regarding how you've pulled that off. And and I think they're too complicated to answer because we we're running out of time. We we have one last talk today, and um, mm. we're already behind, and they have to kind of go. So, but yeah, if you could stick around and answer a few. And I really appreciate, like, I, I absolutely love your movie and I, I I love the movie you guys made. And, and it's just absolutely, I already love the first one. And I think the second one, you've even out, outdid all of yourselves uh, because it's even better than the, so I can't wait to see the third one. Uh, it's absolutely tremendous work and some of the most creative work I've seen in, in, in my lifetime. It's it's just outstanding. So congratulations to you and to your you entire so team. And everyone here is just like putting our hearts and hearts and hearts on the chat as well. So everyone really enjoyed your talk. So thank you so much for Thanks. taking the time to show us all this amazing stuff. My pleasure. I love it too. I'm very proud of it and I'm always happy to talk about it. So thanks yeah, everybody. You know, thank you so much. Um, cool. So yeah, if you could stick around and answer some questions, it would be lovely. So, and then we sure. go to the last talk. So thank you so much, Alan. I'll, I'll see you then later. All right. Thanks. Bye. 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 Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the final live talk of the day. Thank you, everyone, for, for um, joining us today for the first ever World VFX Day. It's been so amazing. Hugo and I are just blown away by all of your comments and well wishes and everything. So thank you. 
Um, so yes, welcome to our final live talk on Return to Normal, which is obviously a bit of an ambiguous uh, title or contentious title, but um, there's still a lot that we, that's left to do. But we want to focus on some questions that focus on, as it says, um, what's next for our industry. So we'll start with some introductions and I'll just kind of go from whoever's on my uh, top uh, eye line. So we'll go with uh, Laurence first. Yeah, hello, I'm Laurence Herman. I'm the founder and VFX supervisor at The Yard. The Yard is a French VFX company uh, based in Paris. And we have also a, a new facility in Montpellier in south of France. Claire? Hi, I'm Claire Cheatham. Um, I work at Coffee and TV as their uh, executive VFX producer for the film and TV division. Um, and I'm based in London, England. David? Hi, uh, I'm David Lebensfeld. Uh, I'm the founder of Ingenuity Studios and uh, president of Ingenuity and Ghost VFX. In sunny LA. In sunny LA. <laughs> um, Celine? I am Celine Colomb. I'm a VFX producer for UFX Studios, and I'm based in uh, Brussels in Belgium. Charles. Hi, Ali. Hey, hi. I'm Charles. I'm the founder and CEO of Select VFX, the most trusted VFX partner in from the uh, fast-growing India. Hi, everyone. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry, I'm Sophie. <laughs> I've got the name. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm last. Hi, I'm Sophie. I'm the founder of Pixel Talent. We are a specialist recruitment and headhunting agency for the VFX animation industry. I am based in the UK, but my team is global. Perfect. Right, we'll get straight into the questions. We have around nine questions. We'll see how many we can get through in the next 20-ish um, minutes. Um, so first up, what changes have you seen since the strikes were declared over, if any? Uh, let's head to Charles first. Okay, thanks for the opportunity, Haley and uh, you go, uh, You guys have done a fabulous job on a very special day. So it's a big hats off to all of you guys. So let me in fact start with your question. In fact, uh, we all know about the fact and the impact which we add during the um, massive strike, right, in terms of job losses, in terms of the studios being closed, and again, the salary cut, and um, in fact, um, there are rate reductions in, in a partner like us, and uh, most importantly, what, what we all suffered is that um, there are very, very uh, limited projects around the world where there are limited outsourcing, where, you know, 100 of studios um, hopping on to a one project, right, so, so, we all had a tough time, of course. It's not about big studio or, or medium studio or a large studio. Everyone had an impact, right? So now um, it is now we are online and then we are back and ready to, to do our BAU. So I'm seeing um, leaders like us, we have a lot of um, clarity to move forward in terms of investment and expansion. This is very important for all the studios across the geography, right? And, and what, what, we, what we hear uh, from some of our value clients is that um, there are uh, uh, post-production um, right, work which has been started because some of the um, production have resumed. It is a good sign and positivity, which is for both from an employer standpoint and from employee standpoint. So we are seeing in terms of all the um, uh, new hope, which is uh, coming together, for the for the greater 2024 20, which we all are geared up right in terms of hiring in terms of upskilling in terms of cross skilling in terms of how we can um right down um, right motivate ourselves and and to wait for uh, amazing 2024 20, so that's that's a few inputs from my side i'm sure that there are experts in this room to add more yeah that sounds great thank you and um, anyone else want to jump in there laurence well uh, actually um the thing is, um, all all the projects are on hold, and and all the shooting are are coming back uh, around uh, early January twenty four. But uh, it seems that uh, we we will have the I mean the next turnover uh, for all the all the projects um, around next summer. So I feel that uh, we will need to uh, go through a gap for uh, Q one and Q two. 
and and uh, we need to uh, to manage everything to to go smoothly through through this gap um yeah the only thing is we all feel that we're gonna have a, a massive amount of projects for the second part of the 24 like mostly like right after the covid uh, but uh, the only challenge for me is to uh, to keep uh, our world team uh, i would say alive and and keep everyone uh, in in the company because when we will need to start again we will need to to start again really fast and and really really hard so yeah actually my my challenge is to to keep everybody and and thanks to the project we we are currently working on uh, we have enough work for for our uh, world team which is around uh, 100 people um so yeah uh, the for me the the biggest challenge is to keep uh, everybody is yeah, here yeah thank you for that anyone else have anything to add before we go to the next question uh yeah, uh, just to add i'm oh, sorry david to interrupt no, go ahead okay i'm yeah. sorry because um i'm sure that it is it is very uh important aspect from a lot of um uh, companies and a lot of studios across this uh geography even though there is a lot of impact has been done and then we have big lessons learned for me personally so it's to stay calm and um and um and we all know the uh, importance of persistence and importance of patience so that's the one thing um which actually uh, made us alive and uh, waiting for the uh, way forward in uh, 2024 yeah. oh, thank you I was just going to say the the only piece that has come back quickly um which is a, a part of our business is the the broadcast uh stuff so there, you know, feature films do take a while to get off the ground. Big series take a, lot, a while to get off the ground. Uh, the stuff that was put on hold prior to the strikes and, and broadcasts have, have come back pretty pretty quickly. Didn't help anything that the you know the strikes got resolved right before the holidays. I think if that didn't happen that way, we'd be seeing it a little differently. But I suspect in the new year is when things will start to get unlocked. Yeah. Yeah, I've, I've also seen a lot of the conversations that we were having and kind of had been put on hold or we've been pushed. All of those conversations are starting again, which is a good sign. Scripts, are, more scripts are coming through for breakdowns and stuff. So things are moving, but yeah, it won't be an immediate thing. And, and, and last thing is the, I mean, all the shooting are not going to start again uh, in, in January or February because of the, the, the actor's schedule. I mean, uh, actors can can split so we're gonna need to wait for the actor schedule and and uh, and wait for for their presence uh, on set mm. yeah that makes sense um so i know everyone's sort of expecting the influx of work to come eventually um are you preparing for that now or are you expecting it to be similar to COVID and you're going to use those same methods or how is it different this time? Um, who would like to answer that one? Uh, I can start if you want. Uh, as I said, the, 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 our strategy is ready to, to keep our 100 people uh, uh, on site or, or uh, hybrid because we, we use the hybrid um, um, position. <laughs> Sorry. But the only thing is, the other thing is, we already have uh, double the number of seats in our company, uh, meaning that we have 200 seats and we are able to ramp up uh, for the for the next uh, uh, massive amount of project. But uh, the, the, the next challenge would be to uh, to find the talents. And even if there is a lot of talents, actually, uh, without any project, um, mm, well, we we need to we need to recruit them and to find them. the The thing is, I feel that many uh, European talents are coming back from uh, Montreal or uh, Vancouver, and uh, they are coming back to Europe, France, and um, yeah, our strategy is really to give them a new opportunity uh, to to be in region uh, in South of France, for example, or in Paris. So I think being agile and flexible is the key uh, to recruit the the next bunch of talents in uh, for the for the next couple of months yeah thank you um i might move on to the next question um because it's related but um are you recruiting right now in which and in which areas and let's go to claire first with that one 
Um, yeah, we are. Um, we've been implementing plans. Um, we're going to be scaling up significantly for 2024, um, which we've begun. Uh, we have both the film and TV side as well as the commercial side. Um, so within London, we're looking for compers, 3D artists. Um, compers can be nuke flame artists. Um, we're looking for producers, pipeline um, guys. And then we're opening up new offices in both LA and New York, and we're going to be looking for colorists, EPs, and VFX supervisors there as well. So uh, we've already begun talking with people and hunting. That sounds very positive. Yeah. Actually, on, on our side, uh, we, we were like pretty busy all the time, actually, because the, the really interesting things as well, I think it's open some opportunities as well um, to 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 have a, another market let's say so we have as well the yeah working on different kind of project uh more artistic or with like a, another um, another perspective so i think that on our side we we still been busy and for sure we already see that 2024 is going to get bigger uh i think that Everyone here realized that sometimes the demand now is gonna be big compared to every artist we can can be available now. So I think it's as well a bit um, nice actually to 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 see as well. Sometimes we are opening a bit more on the um, the 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 students part as well to get more involved and prepare like a kind of a new generation of artists because we definitely see that now it's going to get bigger and bigger especially with all this development of uh, of tools and technology so i think that this kick can be actually positive as well uh to everyone now and yeah we can't wait to start 2024 actually <laughs> that's yeah. really it's really positive to hear that i think Certainly with our clients, what we're seeing is they're starting to think more about um, leadership positions that might bring work to the studio, like visual effects supervisors, EPs, business development specialists. Uh, I think our expectation is that the sort of real upturn in terms of recruitment might not happen until further into next year towards the summer. Um, so there's still, you know, going to be this sort of potential gap for a lot of artists, but um, other areas as well, I think, in terms of technology, real-time technologies, machine learning, AI, there's definitely a lot of companies starting to look for those types of positions too. Great. Um, yeah. I was just going to say, we're also, <clears throat> as as work returns, it's looking like, you know, a bit of a slow ramp up and then probably madness in the back half of the of next year. Uh, we are We are certainly going to be starting to recruit we are prioritizing bringing people back that were at the studio of course um you know it's it has been a difficult time and we've had to say you know temporarily goodbye to folks that we love um so there is there for us it'll be a priority to to bring people back but certainly always on the lookout for as i'm sure everyone else on the call is uh fantastic talent that you know you can you can wrap your hands around Nice. And yeah, uh, for... just to add, uh, Charles here again. Uh, really. So, so uh, what what we have done in uh, select, in fact, uh, with all God's grace, uh, we haven't even laid off any of the employees, right? Um, even though there is a slowdown of work. So, what we did um, uh, uh, here inside our our studio, where we did a lot of upskilling in terms of uh, technology, in terms of cross skilling, right? Where where we want, in fact, um, prepare the uh, current team on on how we can. Um, contribute more in terms of having more complexity to be uh, done in um, uh, less time because we all know that okay when when the, when the tap opens right so um, 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 that we and uh, of course uh, leaders of uh, water right so that we are um, preparing our current team and in parallel um, um, like uh, David said right on um, uh, what we found is very interestingly uh, during this uh, tough time there are there are good people where um, many studios have to uh, let go where um, where we found it's a right uh, opportunity to in fact start the uh, hiring upper hug right um, instead of wait for the strike to happen and then hire so we were just um uh, silently doing a uh, talent hunt um, because there are a lot of um, 
people who are laid off does have a lot of talent. So um, it's a uh, great opportunity for us to, in fact, expand slowly, right? Because uh, what we all know for sure in terms of Q2 and Q3, 2024, right? There will be an ample amount of work where we have to um, prepare now, right? Uh, whether in terms of adding more internship and to add more experience legs. So uh, from select, uh, we have a standpoint and then we are uh, up ahead in terms of planning for the future. Good. Sounds good. Thank you, Charles. Um, so we kind of touched this on this already, but is it the general consensus um, from at least this this panel um, that client work or new client work will start coming in again around spring, summertime next year or anything different that you're discovering with client conversations? Uh, let's go with uh, Laurence. Well, yeah, from all the, the discussion I got um, uh, during my last trip in, in Los Angeles is um, the the new project and uh, will come back around yeah, spring, summer 24. Uh, but what I also heard is all the, the studios wants to um, reduce the number of projects and wants to... Uh, yeah, to, to do less project to prepare them well and 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 maybe maybe to do better better projects for some of them. But the thing is definitely that they, they wanna they wanna reduce the, the cost and reduce the number of projects. So for sure we're gonna have a, a, a massive amount of project, but uh, I don't think it's gonna be like after the COVID. Okay. I don't think I don't think the timing is going to be like after the COVID. I think a lot of studios are saying and planning to have reduced the amount of projects, but the reality is, is these guys still compete with each other. Like they're and they're still going to, I think, go back to to how they compete with each other, and it's going to be based on on getting as many eyeballs as they possibly can, which is as much content and quality content for sure, but as much content and quality content as they can as they can afford. And I think that the era of maybe cheap money and and you know low interest rates and all these things that allowed for uh, for this hyper growth that we've seen is you know not the environment that we have currently. But I but I still think there'll be a race to get stuff on their platforms. Mm -hmm. There, the onus will be on them to figure out how to monetize it. <laughs> Any more? Yeah, I agree. I think it is going to start with, you know, the first um, quarter of the year being quieter um, and then expecting things to pick up. And when it does pick up, I think it'll pick up very quickly. Okay, thank you. Uh, uh, sorry, as I was saying on our side, like it's really like uh, every time, like it's pretty, pretty intense actually because the uh, UFX studio has the chance as well to be, to be part of um, of a U Media group who is uh, working as well in executive production and uh, fundraising, so we have as well this uh, this power every time when we have uh, artists on some worldwide big project to as well can have the possibility to keep working on the European projects, let's say, uh, which is kind of a great market as well. And that's as well the interesting things on our side is we can bring the the, the quality as well in this kind of project and also be every time uh, busy basically. And the big part every time is hand beginning of the year and then again in spring. So because we are jungling with these two markets, it never stops. I can tell you that I can't wait Christmas break. <laughs> <laughs> yep. um, coffee, and coffee and TV have been quite fortunate in the same manner that um, we had scheduled in a lot of uh, UK based and European work. So um, because of that, um, we haven't been as affected as badly. And also we have the commercial side of the company again, which has uh, continued moving. Great. Anyone else? Yeah, so from... Uh... Select uh, standpoint, of course, you know the trade. So in India, we have a lot of studios and a lot of clients um, does have a lot of vendors uh, being at um, Select. Of course, we are, in fact, actively supporting a lot of 
projects internationally, right? So even then, throughout the uh, Christmas and New Year, we are super busy. And then um, uh, that's the main reason, in fact, we are adding uh, people in terms of slow and steady for the upcoming uh, year. And what we, what we hear uh, from our uh, clients in um, LA and, and, and back in UK, as well as in Europe, um, um, there is a lot of uh, work have been resumed and new uh, projects have been kicked up. Um, I think it's, it's, it's a good sign in, uh, in terms of volume. Right, and uh, we are in fact uh, hoping for the best. Great. Um, on to the next question. I'm going to direct this one to Sophie as our recruitment expert on the panel. Um, <laughs> this question has come up a lot today. Uh, so, when obviously there's hopefully going to be a real influx of um, opportunities coming through, um, how can candidates best prepare for those opportunities? Yeah, I think, um, you know, there's there's different stages, I guess, to the recruitment process as the application and um, the interview process. I think in terms of the application process, if you're an artist, you know, it's a it's a given that your reel should be as up to date as possible and showcase your your best work. And there's there's lots of advice out there about how to put together a good reel. So it's not something I'm going to go into detail on now. Um, but I think something that's important is that you cater your work to the studio that you're applying to and, and think about the things that they're going to be looking for in your reel and, and definitely try and get advice on that for sure. Get people, if you can, from that studio to look at your reel and review it and give feedback. Um, and not that you want to create hundreds of reels, um, but definitely if you're applying to somewhere that's more focused on a sort of generalist skill set versus a specialist skill set, it's important to, you know, cater your, your reel in that way. Um, and, and the same with your, your CV, really, I think, think about the role or roles that you're applying to and, and really look at the job description and what they're looking for and make sure that what you're um, presenting in that is catered towards what they're looking for in, in terms of your experience. Um, because in really busy periods when recruiters and, and hiring managers are receiving hundreds of applications, they might only have a minute or two to look at your CV. So they're looking for kind of hooks in, in your experience or in your CV um, that are going to make them want to progress you to interview. So yeah, just be clear and concise in your CV too. I think that's important. Um, and and really, you know, break down what you've done in each role and what the key achievements are um, that are going to be things they look out for to, to take you through to the next process. Um, stage of the process and um, as well as making sure that your your CV is up to date uh, it's really important to make sure that your LinkedIn profile is up to date it's still the most sort of prominent platform that recruiters um, and studios use so uh, making the most of your your profile um, is really important Ros from the Pixel team but put together a series of uh, posts recently uh, which kind of clarify what recruiters see and companies see in the, in the back end of LinkedIn so how they actually find you so um, it's worth taking a look at those because um, making sure that you're marked as open to work for example or there's real clarity around what your title is makes it easier for um, recruiters to find you and um, in terms of the uh, recruitment process or, or the interview process I think it's it's really important to prepare well for the interview process um, if you're working with a recruiter either inside a studio or with an agency like us make sure that you use them as much as you can in terms of understanding as much as you can about the role and the studio but also the people that you're meeting with and what their drivers are for bringing that position so that you can kind of help to cater your answers towards that um and uh and and also um think of, uh, you know find out from them what the format for the interview is going to be different studios and companies uh interview in, in in different ways so they might have technical interviews or they might be focused on your qualities or behaviors or, or competency based um, and it's important to try and think about, you know, what, what your answers are going to be around that and even try and, you know, have mock interviews um, with, with friends or, or with recruiters themselves. So, um, and I guess, yeah, my last thing is <laughs> thinking about um, 
the questions I think it's it's just as important to be assessing the studio um it, it just as they're assessing you so making sure that you have have done your research on the company follow their leaders find out what they're talking about in terms of the kind of mission culture values and approach of the studio um and and ask questions that kind of show your interest in knowledge in that and I suppose and also um, ask questions that fill in any gap of the gaps around that so that you can you know make an, an assessment yourself as to whether this is going to be the right fit for you um, as a company. Hopefully Thank that's you. <laughs> um, we've got five minutes left so that, just... was, that was tremendous advice that was really good. Yeah. It's very good, very succinct <laughs> and compacted into that. So well done, Sophie. <laughs> it's been like the um, idea of researching uh, the facility beforehand and making yes. sure it's somewhere that you're going to thrive in and, you know, you've chosen well. <laughs> exactly. Um, okay, I've got two questions that I really want to ask because um, we've had a lot of questions about this and I did give you all the heads up. So I'm going to open the floor and say, what do you think of the recent VFX union developments? Anybody want to take that question? So obviously, point of contention, there's a lot happening. It's fit, fit, probably fair to say that it's still quite new for our industry. There's lots going on and developing. It is quite new. And I don't know, I don't know, personally, I know enough about it to be able to speak intelligently about it. Um, I do think that it is an uphill battle because of how globalized this industry is. Um, so getting everybody aligned in different markets and different labor laws and with different intentions and different set of problems is going to be tough. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't really have an opinion too, but uh, trying to bring, uh, I mean, all the VFX people to discuss about the future of our industry is a good point. Um, I think there's nothing should be put under the carpet, uh, I could say. So yeah, every time, um, People are discussing is, I think it's a, it's a definitely a good point, but um, well, can't say more about that. It's um, it's a, a large discussion. I also think, with, uh, you know, this isn't pro union or anti union, but with with the ability to work really in any studio remotely for the most part, if you're unhappy with the position that you're in, you do have options. Um, and I think that, you know, again, this isn't any way about the union. You should promote, you should, there, there are good people out there. There are good studios to work with and there are good projects to work on. And you, you can, you can make a move. Yeah, there is a lot of yeah. opportunity. So if, if you want to move, you can move. I agree. It's when you're in somewhere, it's, it's, it's a very brave move to move, but it's one of those that after you do, you will look back and go, you know, I should have done it earlier. And it is just going with your gut and, you know, looking for those companies that are actually nurturing talent and not abusing it. Yep. Good advice there. It's also going to, it's also going to force VFX studios to have to compete with studios that treat their people well, mm -hmm. which is, which is ultimately obviously it good. Naturally. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I think it kind of shows the um, importance of making, you know, employee care and welfare, like a key part of any company strategy. Yeah. yeah. Well, we, we need, we need to put the people at the center of the, the project. I mean, of the center of our company, because mm -hmm. uh, without any people or any artists, I mean, we can do nothing. So <laughs> We, we we need to treat them well and and, and to um, bring a good mindset values. I, for us, it's really crucial. We do prefer to our to our someone with less experience but with the right mindset mm -hmm. because we know that we will be able to grow together. Uh, but if you don't have the the right mindset or if your mindset doesn't fit with your company, it's it, it could be a nightmare for everybody. So. Finding the right people with the right mindset is crucial for us. Yeah, I completely agree. And, you know, I think it is focusing on the artists, looking after the artists. And do you know what? Your client is just naturally looked after at that point. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Um, I want to just ask one last question before we wrap. Um, just a very basic question, but why do you love VFX? Why are you still doing it? Let's go to... Celine first. 
Uh, well, actually, I really love the fact that every project are the same and completely different. And the the greatest thing is you need to be an expert on your topic of the project. Uh, I mean, you can ask thousands of questions just for a shot, like, okay, uh, how this spaceship should look like. So you're going to do thousands of research about the, the, the actual one to match to the reality and then you're gonna uh you're gonna think about okay but now when it's moving how all the environment's gonna move and you start to go in physics and then you're gonna work on a character an animal and you're gonna think about how it's gonna move i mean like it's so huge and you need to have such a good eye to basically take attention of every kind of things around you to just have this uh, best visual effects, which we know is the visual effects we can't really catch um, because yeah, it's so close to to the reality, and that's where we start to to talk with uh, yeah artists and and yeah you then it's it can open to funny conversation like after you can just talk for hours about only one things that people don't really get it, but you can yeah. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Claire? Um, it's the chance to work with hugely talented people. Um, and like um, you said, it's, it, you know, no project is ever the same. So you're never going to get bored. Um, I personally like a challenge and visual effects always brings challenges. Um, so, yes, yeah, because it's ever evolving and it's a job that you're just constantly learning in. Yeah. Charles? Yeah, it, it is actually a crazy and fun, to be honest, right? So crazy in terms of there are works pouring in from uh, future films, episodic and uh, commercials where we have to, in fact, have a separate stream of artists um, to, in fact, uh, focus and to cater towards the needs. And and the and the real fun part is, um, you know, right, um, as others mentioned, we get access to, in fact, directly, closely work with onset VFX supervisors EPs, producers, where there's a lot of knowledge and a lot of improvisation. So it is it is a fun and crazy for me. And um, I, of course, we, we want to do that always. Yeah, thank you. Lawrence? Well, um, I still have the passion. And, and as a VFX supervisor, I, I love to be a part of the entire process of filmmaking, uh, being on set, being on prep before, before being on set. Uh, trying to find solutions with all the involved departments, uh, discussing with the director, discussing with uh, all the crew. I mean, this is a teamwork to achieve the, the best result for the movie, for the project. So yeah, being being part of this entire process is really, uh, is really a tremendous thing. And uh, yeah, I do love this. And I hope to do this for uh, many years. Amazing. Sophie? Uh, the people, like the amazing, amazing talent that exists in this industry that could have done anything, but they chose to do this. And the huge makeup of skill sets, like super technical people, super creative people, amazing project managers, it's, um, all of that and the passion. Like, you know, people work in this industry because they're super passionate about it. And that's great. Exactly. And last but not least, David? Uh, the answer I'm going to give a hope doesn't make it sound like I'm on mushrooms or something, but like I, it, there's storytelling is so central to humankind, right? Like we've been doing it forever since the dawn of humanity, cave drawings, all this stuff, right? And what visual effects does is is aid in storytelling and is part of the storytelling process and part of something that will forever be central uh, to to humans now from the past and well into the future. And visual effects sits really at the core at the intersection of storytelling and technology, um, both of which I love. And I think it might be the only job that allows that has that maybe architecture arguably but that's why i love it and that's why i think i'll always love it it's just you know technology is is exciting it moves fast it provides opportunity it, it keeps you sharp you know staying on top of it that's cool and then 
where it meets storytelling is is visual effects. So that's that's why I love it. Yeah, perfect. Thank you all so, so much. We are we have gone over time, so I appreciate you staying on late for us. Um, but I hope you enjoyed this chat. And Hugo, are you coming back into the chat now? Yes, um, I am. Yeah to say thank you so much for joining us we have the after party on the world vfx day youtube channel as well um but yes thank you to our amazing panel for giving up your time today thank, thank you, so you very much thank you so much thank everyone you so much Bye, guys. thank you bye-bye bye cool bye so yeah i guess um Haley, let's just say goodbye to the chat and tell yeah. everyone to move to the other to the other to the other channel so just for everyone to know, uh, the giveaway links are all on the description of this video. So you can still sign up to the giveaways until midnight and we'll then announce the winners uh, later on tomorrow or the day after in social media. But all the links are on the chat. And, um, and as soon as this stream is over, it will raid the other stream. So all of the people watching will be moved automatically to the other stream, uh, to the video on the World VFX YouTube channel. Um, so, but I just wanted to like say thank you to everyone that was here. We were here live for 11 hours and a half. Uh, it was a fantastic stream. We had lovely time. Everyone was very, very cordial and very nice to us. We had a lot of lovely messages and thank you so much, Haley, for for putting this together. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I couldn't have done it without you, Hugo. It's been <laughs> amazing. And shout out to Ian Fails as well for, some support <laughs> early on, but um, yeah, thank you to everyone. I've really been blown away by everyone's support and passion for this day and um, long may it continue. And please do give us your feedback um, so we can make it uh, better for you for next time. But I really hope you enjoyed this because I certainly have, I've really yeah. loved every minute. Me too, me too. I really, really enjoyed it. I've never done anything like this because I maximum I've streamed was five hours and it was by myself. This is, yeah, it was an amazing feeling and it was great to share this with all of you. Uh, so yeah, it's it's great. I'm sure we'll have more streams like this in the future for sure. At least I yeah. really enjoyed it so much that I will definitely do it again. So, uh, but yeah, thank, thank you so you. much. Uh, it's time to say goodbye then. And I'll stop the stream while I'm saying goodbye. And once the stream is over, then it will just automatically go to the other stream. So continue there chatting. There'll be a, a chat room there as well for you to watch and to talk. And goodbye, everyone. Bye. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. <laughs>